Good afternoon. I'm Treyon White Sr., Ward A Council Member Chair for the Committee on Recreation, Libraries, and Youth Affairs. Today is Thursday, February the 23rd. We are meeting remotely using the Zoom platform. The time is now 12.02 p.m. And I'm calling to order this performance oversight hearing on the Department of Parks and Recreation, also referred to as DPR. The mission of DPR is to provide equitable access to gold standard recreation programs, services, and facilities across all eight wards. The DPR vision is to be America's gold standard for parks and recreation agencies and be the place that DC residents can go to have fun <clears throat> and, and, have, and enjoy themselves in the district. Over the past few years, as a chairman of the Committee on Recreation, Libraries, and Youth Affairs, I visited many of the parks and recreation centers on the DPR. Some of them were where I played as a child. I have broken ground on new construction, witnessed state-of-the-art renovations, and observed some of our shortcomings in the district. I look forward to a robust testimonies from our public witnesses here today and a transparent discussion uh, with our director, Director Lena Hunter here today. We are joined today by Ward 4 Councilman Virginia Lewis George. Let me see if any other members are present. Okay. Um, before I call the first panel of witnesses, Councilman Lewis George, do you have an opening statement? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, thank you, Chairman Trayon White um, and your staff, and thank you to the dozens of community members who took their time uh, out of their day to talk about DC's need for recreation. I want to start by sharing that we love our recreation centers and pools in Ward 4, and we love the people that keep these centers running day in and day out, and who provide great programming for our kids, our seniors, and our community as a whole. I want to thank DPR for participating in my Community Access Resource and Education Days, better known as CARE Days, for partnering with our office um, and ARP for the Ward 4 Senior Jubilee, and many of the DPR all-night programs and movie nights. However, um, while those are all great, I have been incredibly disappointed that last August, DPR decided to cut hours, remove staff, and take away programs at rec centers across our ward, including Fort Stevens Recreation Center and Petworth, Petworth Recreation Center uh, in Ward 4. DPR said these changes were necessary due to staffing vacancies in the agency. Since then, I have heard from hundreds of families describing the negative impact these cuts have had on our community. Staff with decades of experience who develop strong community ties and powerful connections with the young people they, were, they serve were relocated to other facilities where they cannot have the same impact. Rec centers open were closed during daytime hours when young adults, young children, families, and nannies can come and use the playgrounds, access the bathrooms, use the indoor facilities, and benefit from programming. Programs that made a tremendous impact on our community and served an incredibly diverse set of kids are now gone because the staff that facilitated all of them were reassigned. I'm talking about Tiny Tots classes, after school enrichment, senior art classes, teen club, family game night, holiday celebrations, after school homework, supervision and support, helping our kids apply to college, providing ESL classes to immigrant families and so much more. We have truly taken a hit as a result of the relocation of these staff members and the removal of these programs. And we have reduced safety at our rec centers because the people who used to be there, who know the community inside and out and can quickly and peacefully de-escalate safety issues that emerge are no longer there to do that. And this has made our rec centers less welcoming and less safe for all. We all know that the district is experiencing a surge in crime and gun violence, uh, especially among our young people. This is not the time to be cutting back on opportunities for recreation and positive activities for youth. Yet that's what, exactly what we have done for the past six months, despite having a DC budget that is bigger than ever before. Our communities need more recreation in this moment, not less. DPR promised to reevaluate re these staffing decisions come spring. And now that we're on the verge of spring, I will be asking DPR their plans to reverse these cuts and restore programs and staff at our rec centers across Ward 4. I will be also asking DCPR leadership about other issues that come up frequently at our rec centers, repairs and maintenance, like the need for better communications with families involved in DPR programs, the Chevy Chase Dance Program, 
fixes needed at Lafayette Pointer, programming needs at Riggs LaSalle and Lamont, weekend access and swim lessons at Roosevelt Pool, and the need for senior programming across the board and more youth programming and more numbers and more slots for youth programming across the ward. I will also be diving into our roving leaders program and, and ways in which we are growing that program to meet the need um, of this moment and going through some of the renovations that DPR has coming up in our war to make sure that we are on track uh, to make these changes for our community. So I'm bouncing between several hearings today, but I'm looking forward to hearing from public witnesses on all they have to share. Uh, and thank you, Chairman White, for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. And we will be discussing some of those points today, I'm pretty sure, in this hearing in great length. Jump back. Uh, we will have a uh, public discussion first from our public witnesses. Um, as I call our first panel of public witnesses that we promoted from the audience to the panelists, we have a tight schedule with over 111 witnesses. That's a lot of witnesses for a typical hearing. So that shows you that there is great interest in ensuring that we have quality uh, programming and services in the DPR department of our government. So we look forward to hearing from you guys. Uh, all public witnesses appearing on their own will have three minutes. If you are elected representative, you will have five minutes. We will call uh, first witnesses, uh, Commissioner Anthony Dale, Commissioner Santiago Lacatos, Commissioner Elizabeth Miller, Commissioner Kishan Puta, Commissioner Reverend Wendy Hamilton, ANC 8D Chair. That's five. Dale. So Dale, if you're here, you can get started. I don't see him on the screen yet. Okay. We will come back to him if he arrive. We'll move to Santiago Lacatos. And see one BO4. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, Chairperson White, uh, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is Santiago Lactos. I'm an ANC commissioner representing Sing Member District 1B04 in the East Street Corridor. Um, in my testimony today, I'm going to focus very narrowly on one specific area of um, DPR's work, which is obtaining administrative land transfers um, from the National Park Service. Um, that being said, before I get into that, I want to echo um, some of the words from Councilmember Lewis George and what I assume is also the words of other commissioners to come, but the critical need for investment in our parks and recreation staff and facilities to truly support um, our communities across the district. Um, so as a part of the district's collective goal of achieving statehood, um, there's a need to maximize local control of federally controlled park space in the district that we would expect to regain under statehood. There's currently dozens on dozens of local parks, traffic circles, uh, medians owned by NPS, as well as you know, hundreds of small pieces of grass throughout you know, streets across the district um, that are in fact owned by the National Park Service and outside of the input of district residents um, and the community at large. Uh, DPR as the district government's lead agency for parks and green space has yet to take a really sufficiently aggressive or ambitious a position on obtaining this land from the federal government through administrative land transfers. Um, the ready to play plan, um, which is DPR's, uh, one of DPR's long range plan features only two mentions of land transfers with little further detail uh, on any large scale plans. Um, this isn't just a matter of principles around autonomy and statehood but a practical question of maintenance and development of parks and recreational facilities. Um, NPS doesn't have the funding, personnel, or really desire uh, to manage federal land for local needs. 
Um, I've, I've heard MPS officials say verbatim that, you know, we don't do playgrounds or we don't do dog parks, um, which are two types of park facilities in high demand across the district. And that's not meant to disparage NPS employees who work hard every day, but they just don't have the funding or personnel to tackle a task better meant for the district government, which is elected by residents who use those park facilities. Um, that being said, there is a solution to sort of get us partway there before statehood, um, which is large scale administrative transfers of jurisdiction. And I know that's a bureaucratic mouthful, but in essence, um, administrative transfers of jurisdiction allow NPS to transfer jurisdiction and control of land to the DC government, but not full ownership, um, which would technically require an act of Congress. Um, these administrative transfers could target um, not just local NPS um, parks and green space, but also public space more broadly, as I mentioned, sort of medians, um, triangle corners, intersections um, that exist across the district. And rather than taking a piecemeal approach for every federally controlled park or tract of land, as I feel like the district has done so far, DPR should identify all MPS neighborhood land, excluding monumental parks, other key sites, and this could be like a community discussion, um, and seek an administra administrative uh, transfer of all of those sites, um, albeit with obviously some exceptions. Uh, that eventual transfer would require funding, support for maintenance and other capacities, but we shouldn't take a one-by-one -one approach to getting control of parkland that we use every day um, as residents of the District of Columbia. Um, and this issue uh, is of particular concern to my neighbors and constituents, given MPS's control over Meridian Hill Malcolm X Park, which is the largest peak of piece of park space available to Ward 1 residents. Uh, it's been neglected in maintenance, upgrades, and overall community planning. Um, MPS also controls several parklets and triangle medians throughout nc one b which could become neighborhood amenities like playgrounds uh, for families. But under the current circumstances of federal control, it's absolutely impossible. Um, I'm also aware of the urgency of this task, given the political environment we exist in today. The current administration, which has ostensibly endorsed statehood, and the leaders of the Department of Interior are more likely to be sympathetic to the concerns of district residents, but we cannot predict what a future administration's position would look like. Um, the concerns and recommendations I've laid out are a whole of government approach. It starts with action from DPR, but also includes this committee, the council as a whole, the mayor, Delia Norton, and I would encourage this committee to start the process now by asking DPR to give more details on their plans for administrative transfers of jurisdiction for MPS and whether they will commit to a larger scale request for uh, administrative land transfers. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to testify today, and I'm available to answer any questions. Got it. Thank you so much. Next, Commissioner Middle. Hi, Council Member White. I submitted lengthy testimony earlier. I'm sure you will read it when you go to bed tonight, but I'm gonna paraphrase, <laughs> I'm gonna paraphrase it into three things. I wanna to talk to you about pickleball. I wanna to talk to you about the Jellif Recreation Center. And I wanna to talk to you about a kind of sports multiplex. I think you know what I'm gonna say about pickleball, which is that it's exploding in the city and we need more courts. There was actually a very interesting article in the Post today about a man who's going into prisons and teaching prisoners to play pickleball. And I noticed in the pictures that their pickleball courts were way better than any courts we have in the District of Columbia. So I think we really need to take some time to, um, to assess the needs and to put some, some energy and, and financial power behind expanding pickleball. Um, our ANC did pass a resolution. We asked for a series of things, but a big ask was sort of a wholesale, holistic pickleball study um, that kind of takes into account, you know, kind of where we are, where we want to be and engage stakeholders. So that's one question I would have for Director Hunter is, is there an ability to undertake a sort of wholesale, holistic approach to pickleball, what it looks like and come out with short term and long term goals? Uh, the second thing is the Jellif Recreation Center. Thanks to you and your colleagues and Mayor Bowser, we have a good, healthy budget. We had our first community meeting. We are really excited to get moving. Um, our community would very much like to be involved in this process. And I kind of look at it a little bit like baking a cake. Um, you know, our community would like to be involved in finding the right recipe, the artisanal ingredients, you know, working to really get to, to where we put that cake in the oven. We don't want to be told, you know, here's your lemon cake and now we're putting it in the oven. And I, I think there is a tiny bit of a disconnect between, you know, true partnership and involvement and, and a little bit of, of um, 
you know, lip talk to that. So we're, we're really committed to being partners and we would, we would really like to, um, from a process point of view, be involved before being presented with a plan. So I think I would, a second question I'd like to have you ask Director Hunter is just this, you know, can they really involve not just in our recreation center, but those in Ward 8 and Ward 4 and, and everywhere across the city into a true kind of partnership? And one idea I had suggested previously is that almost like what DCPS does with these SIT teams to do something like that for recreation centers. So that would be a follow up question. Is there some type of a model we can build to that? And then lastly, Council Member White, I am at some point picking you up in my station wagon and taking you out to the St. James. Have you been there? In Springfield, Virginia? Yes, the, um, the, the big, um, I don't even know what type of yeah, facility like is it. It has pool, it has correct. everything in there. I've it's been a, there. Have you it's been amazing. there? It's amazing. It's a, we like, do. they call it a 50,000 square foot, like, performance it's, club. It's, it's amazing. amazing. And I yeah. really think with all of the empty space in our city, I would love to see something like that come here. A true effort, you know, from you and from the director and from the mayor to build this sort of, you know, a performance club with swimming and golf and cross and baseball. And I think it's just such a way to keep our, our young people um, engaged and active. And I think that's a way that we grow athletes and that's a way that we, you know, have a real, um, you know, place in, in this country and in, in building and growing performance athletes. So I think a third, my last question, Director Hunter would be, is there some way we can build and invest in some sort of a large scale facility like that? It also has a spa and a restaurant, which I think is fantastic. So anyway, I went way over what I wanted to do, but that's the sort of the overview of what I wanted to talk to you about. And you can read it in my testimony. Thank you. We have your testimony. And after seeing that amazing facility, I did call Director Hunter and he's visited, I believe, um, it's like two years ago. Oh, um, good. He, trying to figure out how to uh, do something like that in the district. So, well, please, I, I want to be your partner in that. And if it turns out right. to be a public private partnership or something, I'd really like to be involved in, in anything that you need from, from me as a partner. And All I, right. So let's plan and take that trip. I know my assistant, Yukia Wilson is watching. So <laughs> yeah, we got a trip. We got a plan. We can go back out there. All right. Next we have Commissioner Puta. Hello. Yes, I knew you were here somewhere. <laughs> Good to see you. Um, hope you're doing well. Uh, I'm on uh, with my son for school vacation this week. Uh, I know you've got a little one as well. But I, I actually, that reminds me, I want to give a shout out to Councilmember White uh, that uh, the Department of Parks and Rec actually has programming over uh, school breaks and I think that's very cool uh, that they do that. A lot of my constituents really appreciate that, and I do want to give credit where credit's due for that. Um, a couple things uh, to add on uh, went to my colleague Elizabeth Miller on Jellif. Uh, uh, I agree. Uh, we're, we're appreciative for the investment um, for the first public meeting that was held in the fall, but we got to uh, we got to get things going uh, with. Uh, with the community engagement. Um, what we've asked, our main two things that we've been asking is um, give us some options, but also give us prices, uh, price estimates, so that we can, we, we, we're not just, you know, uh, theor theoretically saying what we want, what we want to know, is it possible within the budget? So we, we really want a few options to be presented with uh, prices, uh, with price estimates. And we want that soon. That last uh, community meeting was, I believe, in October, and now it's February. So I, I would, uh, if you could please ask them when the next meeting will be. I think it's coming soon. They say soon, but uh, we do want price estimates. Um, uh, we got Ellington Field to talk about, but two other small things to, to fit in real quick. <clears throat> and those are um, the pool at Jellet. Uh, it closes early every summer, even though they've got summer camp. Uh, and uh, well, ne nearby is another pool. It's about like eight blocks away, Volta Pool. Uh, that one stays open later than Jellif, even though they do not have summer camp. And those kids are out in the hot August sun every summer at the end of August without, without a way to swim nearby. And so uh, at Jellif. And so I would ask, 
them to uh, DPR to please try to not close PLF early this year. It's been going the last two years and we've uh, made this request every year. I hope they will listen to us this time and I hope you can ask them and hold them to that. The other thing, uh, the other small thing is on pools, uh, Wilson Athletic, uh, uh, Wilson Aquatic, uh, really appreciate they got the hot tub open for this winter uh, uh, therapeutic pool. Um, but a lot of times it's not open because of the staffing. And so we know staffing is tight. Councilmember George mentioned as well. Please just prioritize staffing, 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 staffing. And if you can't, if you can't keep something open as expected, please let everyone know ahead of time because too many people have been showing up uh, for swim classes that have been canceled or hot tubbing that's been canceled or the kids' pool been closed because the as a staffing, many times we've heard that at Wilson. So the last thing I wanted to talk to you about, uh, sir, was uh, Duke Ellington Field. Um, no longer with Duke Ellington High School, as you know, uh, back in 2020, uh, Hardy Middle School, uh, school without walls, and Duke Ellington High School, they were promised that they would get a field. Uh, a DPR promised them that they would renovate that field make it usable for them. It is uh, still not renovated. It's, it's in worse condition than it was then. And um, we did just uh, hear from uh, a, a constituent of mine uh, had asked, uh, he's a hardy parent and he got fed up and he asked DPR, when is this thing gonna be done? Uh, it should have been done a year ago. Uh, <clears throat> and the reply came from DPR uh, that, uh, the contract will be March, uh, the construction will start the summer, and then it'll finish by the end of the year. Couple things on that. I would ask that construction be, uh, be expedited because that the track there is extremely popular. People are gonna miss it very much if it's out of commission. So at the very least, if they can keep the track open as much as possible and make the construction you know, finished by the end of the summer. It shouldn't take that long, it's just a field. Uh, it's not a building, really. They can do the, there are two little buildings there. They can do the buildings after the field or separately, but allow, keep the track open as much as possible. Last I'll say is, um, yeah, my constituent, I'll speak for him today. Uh, he uh, wrote that he's a parent and a coach uh, of soccer. And he lives, uh, he says his seventh grade daughter really wanted to use the field last year, but he could, if he couldn't, they could. Uh, they really want to be able to practice for soccer there. And uh, it's, as you know, in this part, in that part of city and citywide, fields are very, fields are very much at a premium. A new high school is opening uh, within a mile as well, and so uh, we need to get this project going. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Now we have. Our ANC AED Chair, Reverend Willie, Wendy Hamilton. Good afternoon, Chairman White. Good afternoon, committee members. Councilmember George, if you're still on here, hello to you as well and to my fellow commissioners. I am Reverend Wendy Hamilton. I, as uh, Chairman White mentioned, am the newly elected uh, ANC Commissioner for 8D06, which is far southwest Bellevue neighborhood of Washington, D.C., and was recently elected chair. And I'm very excited to represent the residents of the great Ward 8. I'm here today to express my public concern for a specific area within our commission 8D, that being Fort Grebel Playground Recreation Center and Park. This facility is located off of Martin Luther King Avenue Southwest here in 8D. And I took some time yesterday just to go take a walk around and look at what I had been watching um, for the previous few years, the deterioration of that particular location. So I took pictures and I sent 60 photos to DPR specialist Christopher Dyer yesterday of those conditions in Fort Grebel Park. In those pictures were examples of multiple damaged surfaces, various broken equipment, animal feces, puddled water, 
an overgrown, unusable garden space, tattered soccer nets, old ball field bases, scattered debris, downed tree limbs, and several unempty trash cans. All of this on top of the absence of lights, which have not worked in four years. These conditions present a very depressing and dangerous situation for the residents of our community. This fact was made especially prevalent on yesterday when I watched the young children from Big Mama's Daycare on Martin Luther King Avenue run happily into this playground, innocently oblivious to the dangers that lay ahead of them with the shape of the park. This could turn into a serious liability should one of them be injured or harmed while playing there. They deserve better and we deserve better. Ward 8 community resident Haywood Turnipseed, who is the founder and coach of Ward 8 Little League, also sent me a letter yesterday as well, talking about how beneficial it would be for the young people in his league to be able to play ball on the beautiful Fort Grebel Diamond. The lifelong benefits of organized community sports cannot be realized on dilapidated fields that have no lights. We can do better and we can be better. At your budget forum last Thursday, Chairman White, you'll recall my mentioning that we had received information as an ANC that $2 million had previously been approved for a Fort Grebel renovation project that, according to DGS, was supposed to have begun in August of 2022 with a completion date of December 2022. And yet no work has been started. And we're headed into March of 2023. In a brief conversation with Director Hunter at a recent ANC public safety meeting, he mentioned a need for an additional $1.4 million being discovered, and that being the issue that was delaying the entire project altogether, which is very unfortunate. Every day that project lies dormant in our community. It denies our residents a very valuable resource and our children a safe place to play and to grow. Whatever the case may be today, I'm simply trying to bring attention to the ongoing concerns that we have about our community recreational space that has been neglected for far too long. My hope is that our voices are heard and tangible steps taken, including fully funding the amount that is needed to get the Fort Grebel renovation project underway and at the bare minimum, get the lights turned back on. Chairman White, I respect that in your role, you are responsible for overseeing all of the parks and recs in the city. But as the council member for Ward 8, we would also hope that you take a special interest in ensuring that the parks in your backyard are second to none. And I have to say that I didn't write this part, but to hear uh, my fellow commissioners talking about hot tubs and pickle ball courts and, and upgrades and monies being uh, given to them, God bless you. Um, I, I, I'm happy that those needs are being met, but I would humbly ask that before we decide to spend another dime on something new, let us please care for what's in existence now. Thank you, and I yield my time. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Um, where are we? So I'll jump back real quick. Let me say this, uh, Commissioner Hamilton. Um, after doing a walkthrough, I guess, and you heard this at the committee, I mean, at my budget hearing, um, I did hear, it was myself, about six residents and Commissioner Dope at the time about what the needs were for gravel. We put that money in the budget in collaboration with some of our other council members and Mayor Bowser. Um, but to my understanding that the price of construction increased tremendously in the last four years. Um, then I was told that DGS had the money to uh, finish the project. And it's still, to your point, it's still not done. So I, I take that constructive criticism. I absolutely do. And I look forward to uh, working with DPR and DGS to getting this finished. I also spoke to Kiamonte Construction, who 
uh, is responsible for finishing the project. He's supposed to give me an updated report uh, this week. Today is Thursday, so hopefully I get it by tomorrow. Um, and I was hoping to report it out with if my, if I can't make it one of my staff at your meeting tonight. So we'll follow up with that as well. So it's not being ignored. I tell you that. I appreciate um, that, and I did want to add that uh, the ANC liaison Gore uh, is going to come out and do a walkthrough with me tomorrow at noon. I did notify your office, and he's going to come out. We're going to walk through Fort Greville again on tomorrow at noon. Got it. Um, I want to jump back to Miller. See here. Elizabeth Miller, she's right there. Okay. How long do you think uh, this pickleball, because we're getting a lot of emails about pickleball. I'll tell you that. We was, that was a topic in one of our committee meetings. Um, how long will you take, do you think it take for this pickleball, pickleball study to be finished, in your opinion? Well, I mean, I hope not long. I think um, three to six months would be realistic. We put in our, um, you know, I think we need to identify locations, preferred designs, engage stakeholders, you know, make sure there's enough time to do it right. I think when planning something long term and DPR, to their credit, is doing everything they can do for short term. I really do think they're, you know, adjusting tennis courts when they can and gymnasiums and all of that. Um, but I think taking a holistic long term approach would would go a really long way, too. So I would hope three to six months, but I'm not an expert. And could pickleball be accomplished on tennis courts? Um, I know we have a lot of underutilized tennis courts throughout the district. I'm going to say a lot, but we have a number of them. Um, what's your thoughts on that? Well, I don't want to jump into a big old mess here, and you probably don't either, but there is sort of a little friction between pickleball and tennis players that's played out in the media. Okay, and I'm not I familiar do, with that at all. So Yeah, you, I do think there are... There are there are not enough tennis courts either, but yes, I think you can, you can certainly retrofit a tennis court or use it for both purposes, but there has been a little acrimony in, in that idea. Um, but we've looked in Georgetown and kind of identified places that we think could potentially work too. And I just think there needs to be a really creative, thoughtful, long-term strategic approach to this, because I think it's only getting bigger and bigger. I mean, in October, 2019, um, DC Pickleball had about 120 registered players. And the current number stands at around 600 and counting. So it's it's just, it's growing so fast um, that I think this Band-Aid approach to it needs to be extended into a more holistic long-term approach. Now, is this a league of some sort? How are people communicating? How are these numbers calculated? There is a, um, you'll love this. There's a person called Scott Parker, and he's a pickleball ambassador for U.S. Pickleball. And he's kind of the go-to expert. He's really thoughtful, and he's working very closely with, I'm so sorry, I'm forgetting to get the person's name at DPR, but they have someone who's who's kind of running the short-term Band-Aid approach. And everyone speaks very highly of him, and he's definitely doing his best to try and get courts going. So I, I just think there you know, needs to be even some policy that every recreation center that is built from here on out needs to make sure that there are pickleball facilities. A lot of, um, I actually have toured a bunch of um, recreation centers recently, and there are definitely places where there's extra green space off to the side where maybe that could be retrofitted into a pickleball court. Normally when DPR uh, design recs, they normally meet with the architects and the community and they go through a whole, uh, process in which they put these different designs on the board about what the community needs and so each community is different as far as in my opinion what i've been seeing at, at the meetings about what community wants and so i don't know if every community wants a pickleball there i don't know but i just know that i've been to, i've been a four blocks down and a four blocks down wants some something different with the other rec running down the street and so each community Amen. yeah <laughs> has, and, and depending on who's there at that meeting that day so <laughs> that also yeah. Is a yeah. factor. So I'm um, pretty sure that the director Herner is listening in. Um, well, I'm sure they're hearing a lot about it. And I'm just hoping they have, I'm sure they're thinking about it too. So I'm sure you'll ask a question and I look forward to working with them. I mean, I can also go in, in my community and, and identify places and share that as well. And they are working with our park organizations. It's just that it's, you know, it's hard to find a place to play pickleball. I like it too, selfishly. All right. I, I did want to, Thank Commissioner Puta, who's on vacation with his family, for joining in and continue to, to ring the bell 
um, about uh, issues in this community. I did hear his concerns about the price estimate and when is the next meeting. So we'll be sending a formal request with that and also about the Ellington field on um, the pool and Jeff closing early. I'm gonna have another num a number of notes. Um, we'll jump to Santiago Lacatos. Yes. As regards to your uh, suggestions for a large scale uh, administrative transfer of jurisdictions, um, approximately how much land have you identified to transfer and are there any particular wards that these are concentrated in? I have not put together a specific list. Okay. There's the list exists on the district's website that on open data, there's a map. Um, though I would say the largest tracts of land are um, Fort Circle Park, um, Rock Creek Park, um, some of the parks that border the sort of like large green spaces that border the Anacostia. I'm not necessarily proposing any specific, you know, this do this park, do that park. I think that the district should look at all MPS controlled land outside of the monumental core and like discuss with the community and make this sort of like a process being like, I think that, you know, this, I'll give an example from, uh, you know, in my uh, ANC, the intersection of Vermont Avenue and T Street. There's a couple, there's a, a triangle that is around the size of what could be a playground. Um, there's a lot of families that live right around there. They're, you know, but that's, it's basically right now, it's a concrete block with a tree because yeah, MPS controls it and it doesn't make, you know, if I were, if I, I would also, I mean, I would advocate, I mentioned Meridian Hill Park as well, but they're, they're, these exist across the district. And I've had com conversations with other commissioners who've had these challenges because MPS just doesn't have the money or the staff. And especially in the areas that are, part of national capital parks east so the areas outside of the rock creek park and the oh sorry councilman i think you're on mute and i, I didn't mean to talk over you i, th I think you're still on mute yep <laughs> i see got it um i did get a reverend hamilton i did get a, a note uh from uh, Kia Monte Construction. Uh, let me try to read uh, what it says so it did come in. It says that uh, the, the funding has been pulled back after we designed it for a year because it wasn't enough funding. Uh, we did nice, we designed a nice building and needed five million. The first design one needed 10 million. Um, after the cuts, we tried to accommodate for the five million. Um, uh, we've been only paid for the design and pricing efforts, and the work has been canceled for now by DGS. Um, my guess is that it will be put out again soon, um, but that's all the information we have. And so, <laughs> I will, I, I, and also I am in contact since our meeting with DGS about a number of things, uh, including this uh, a Fort Gravel um, campus, but also a number of other things. So I'll follow with that as well. So I did want to report that out. I'm not sure how long I'll be in this hearing, but so you can report out to your meeting. And I've asked him to send you a formal email too. So if you if you don't get it by this evening, let me know. Thank you for sharing that. That's incredibly unfortunate and disappointing to hear. Um, and, and until I can even process all of that, you know, to be able to report it out, one thing DGS did say is perhaps we can get at least some of the cosmetic things taken care of until we get to the major portion of the renovation of the of the garden and of the of the recreation center itself. So can we just can we get the lights on? That doesn't cost anything. OK, just to turn the lights on so we can use the baseball field. It doesn't cost anything to come pick up the tattered. Uh, soccer nets. It doesn't cost anything to 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 resurface the the playground and and get the broken swings replaced. And I mean, it may cost something, but it doesn't cost millions of dollars. So at, at this particular juncture, something is better than nothing. And this is the fourth year we're being told we're not getting anything, and it's just not acceptable. And and I'm going to need other folks to to plead our case as well. You see what we're dealing with over here. 
east of the river, folks. And um, we, we, you know, we can't do this alone. So we're asking for collective support. If you'll raise your voices on our behalf as well, we would appreciate it uh, just so that they can understand that it, it's not fair nor equitable and um, we need them to do the right thing. And thank you for sharing that information with me, Chairman White. And I'll just uh, look for that email and I'll let you know if I don't get it, okay? Got it. Thanks. Oh, I know we're in a crunch for time with this lengthy hearing, so I'll begin to speed up. Thank you guys for your advocacy. Five down, 101 to go. All right. Commissioner, Commissioner Reed May. Commissioner Jeremy Joseph. Commissioner uh, Sabrina Rose, also with Empower DC. Commissioner Alexander Pedro. Okay, I'm not seeing Reed May. So I'll start with Jeremy Joseph. You, you can get you can get started. Just open in testimony. Uh, <clears throat> terrific. Thank you, uh, Council Member and Chairman White, for your time. Uh, so uh, I'm an advisory neighborhood commissioner, uh, uh, but I'm testifying in my personal capacity. Uh, I would, I want to. I, I think what I'm hearing already in 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 the conversations uh, is maintenance versus capital construction, and those two issues um, being separate and, and and each causing challenges um, for, for 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 DPR as they have to um, rely on DGS to do certain work. Um, my uh, focus is primarily on construction uh, and 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 projects, um, and but I'll, but I think there's a, there's just a key problem with maintenance of the existing facilities. Um, my child plays soccer over at Parkview, um, which is uh, sort of east of the park. And uh, I echo uh, what the, the previous commissioner said about the quality of the facilities and, and how things are run down with puddles and, and everything she spoke to. So the, the maintenance of the facilities, I think, is a, is a key aspect. And, and I, I really echo what she said, which was um, spending the money on maintaining what we have before we build new. There's a huge amount of wisdom to that, uh, and de and decrepit uh, facilities um, do not encourage kids to get out and play. That being said, um, first I want to say thank you. Uh, in the in in the FY22 budget, uh, the council put money in in the budget for. Um, Two projects at the Palisades Park in in the Palisades out in out in in the western part of the city. One was to refurbish a skate park that had been um, uh, that the, where the concrete was uh, uh, pocked due to somebody putting salt on there, and and the salt uh, eroded the concrete, and so mo much of it is unusable. Nonetheless, that skate park is still one of the highly most highly used amenities in in our in our neighborhood and and, and at Palisades Park, and the kids are on it all the time. Uh, this is there, there was money uh, budgeted for it to be resurfaced. Um, this again is sort of a maintenance project, frankly, uh, and it's been it's taking a, a, a fair amount of time to get this done. Um, so I want to thank the council for budgeting the money and encourage the council to 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 spur um, D DPR and DGS to move forward expeditiously with refurbishing it so the kids can use it for the summer. Uh, also, uh, there was money appropriated for a dog park, which we're very grateful for. It, it'll help solve some of the off-leash dog issues that, that exist uh, on national park land. Uh, so thank you um, for appropriating the money for the, for the dog park, and we're very excited for that construction to begin. My additional points relate to 
field space. Uh, this has come up already. Number one, I think the most important thing to do is convert fields to turf and add field lighting essentially everywhere. Uh, of, of course, you can't convert baseball diamonds to turf, but soccer um, and, and, and and soccer fields should be converted to turf. It's much more versatile. Uh, it, it allows for year round use. You don't have to use chemicals for the grass and keep the grass growing. And, and you don't, and you, you sort of sidestep all the mud and, and, and all that stuff. The other piece is adding field lighting. Um, Turning lights on that exist, certainly important, adding lights where there aren't lights yet, and adding them in a smart way so that they don't shine into neighbors' houses, but onto the fields where the where the light is needed. We live in a city where uh, the, the 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 predominant um you know it, it gets dark early right and uh that that's that's an issue and the the community needs to be able to use these this limited field space uh you know, it's into seven, eight o'clock at night, nine o'clock at night for the older kids to practice and artificial turf and lights will allow for um, this field space to go much further. That's very important. Uh, and, and I think is a key aspect of the, um, for the ready to play draft plan that was released that wasn't featured enough. And I, I would like you to encourage uh, DPW to DPR, excuse me, to um, add more lighting. Uh, and then finally, and this goes to what the, Commissioner, one of the earlier commissioners said is co coordination between the National Park Service and uh, uh, and and the and and DCPS on allowing community groups and soccer teams and so on to use the fields and to use the public space that exists in our neighborhood, but that's sort of locked away uh, with other organizations. Uh, and 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 that being able to use the the great spaces that we do have to our fullest advantage and having a unified system where teams can book time, regardless of sort of who owns the space. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. We're moving to Sabrina Rose, ANC 5DO2. Yes, uh, good, afternoon. good afternoon, Chair White. Um, I'm Sabrina Rose, and I'm serving as the, it got minus 10, okay, thank you. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, I'm just going to cut straight to the chase. Um, our community has um, almost no tree cover and suffers uh, urban heat island effect with temperatures that can get as much as 20 degrees hotter than other parts of the district. We have poor air quality from the industrial lands and the engineering, the National Engineering Products, which is the chemical plant that's housed here in Ivy City. Um, also the traffic on New York Avenue. That all of these, all of these are causing the poor air quality. We need we need Cremel to serve as a central park with ample green space. The Cremel School is a historic landmark and the heart of our community. It should be treated as such. All of this talk about racial equity and environmental justice, and yet we continue to struggle for the smallest, most basic need, green space and indoor and outdoor recreation amenities, recreational amenities for our community. More funded, Chair White, more funding is needed so that Cremel can be completed in its entirety by 2025. The original completion schedule was supposed to be 2024. Therefore, we have time for your advocacy. Um, we insist there is more money allocated in the budget for Cremel so the residents of Ivy City, DPR, and DGS can plan the design within a sufficient budget and a completed project. With a community center where kids will be playing, will be playing, there's a continued environmental injustice threat against us. There's a lot of work to be done and we need to dismantle and rebuild. There's no balance. In our neighborhood the, with polluting industries and that's dominating our air, water, and soil, we are just in the beginning stages of keeping our community from being neglected and ignored. Um, let me see, where was I? Okay, I understand the dynamics of the responsibilities we have in our wards, districts, neighborhoods, etc. But this is for the residents of the district. 
We all should work together to identify what's wrong and work to fix it. If one community is lacking, the residents of the community is lacking, meaning the residents and the community is lacking here in the district. We all have the power to make change and without being afraid of using our power, change will come. Chair, Chair White, we ask that you help our community with your continued advocacy and ensuring that more money is put in the budget for Cremel. Also, I would like to add that um, the trailer that's, that was sitting on site uh, has been there since 2013. That was placed there by the Union Station. Union, uh, if you remember, Union Station wanted to use that lot for an overflow for the tour buses. It uh, was on fire. And so half of it is burnt down. And um, that should have been removed a long time ago. So we have a half burnt trailer on the site of Cremel. <laughs> and a lot of these things I, I let um, Tommy Jones know and um, that, need, that needs to be removed because um, we don't know exactly how the fire started, but there was some electricity on in that trailer, but we don't we don't know. I asked and and they said it was it was undetermined. Thank you. Um, Alexander Pedro. Don't see him. Briefly, um, I want to ask Mr. Joseph, um, do you know how much it costs to refurbish the skate park or have an idea? Sure, I understand the money has already been appropriated. I don't have a number from from DGS. Um, the number, the total number that was appropriated was, I understood, $765,000. And that was to cover both the refurbishment of the skate park and the um, uh, dog park and, and to create a dog park. Uh, I understood that a hundred and something thousand dollars was appropriated last year. Uh, and the project didn't go forward because DGS or DP, excuse me, DPR wanted to uh, handle the projects together because they are, they, are, they are basically in the same exact area. But this is a good example of maintenance versus construction. So I don't have an answer to your question, but the maintenance piece should, should felt very straightforward because it's just resurfacing of the concrete. Okay. Got it. And Ms. Rose, I got your notes here. We will be asking... Um, I did want to know where exactly this burnt trailer is sitting. I heard your testimony, but I was unaware yes. exactly it is. That's it. The, the, the trailer is, um, is sitting on the Kendall side of the, the school. And it's on the side of the school where um, it's been uh, gated off because we only mm -hmm. allow one side of the one side of the site where the basketball course and the playground is, the the trail is right where the murals are on the Kendall Street side. Got it. And I know you are requesting additional money for funding. Um, yeah. do you have any specifics on that? And I can't make no promises. I just want to make sure we are documented during this hearing. Um, when we get back to my staff and the other members of this committee. Yes, um, 20 million will be sufficient for a completed project. Uh, the school's been closed for 40 years, so we know that it's going to take a lot of work, and uh, most of the funding has already been allocated. So, um, in order for the project to be completed, we're looking at another 20 million in the budget. An additional 20 million? An additional. Wow. Okay. I'm just saying. 
hey, go big or go home, you know? That's it. All right, thank you guys. We can try to push forward with the other public witnesses before we get to our government witness. Uh, if we can elevate uh, Brenda Ingram, Bess? Yes. She's already here. Yes, I see her. Camille, I see the t-shirt. I see you represented. Got it. Uh, Ann Willis. And Paul, yes. she's here too. Tung Engie. Friends of Cromwell. Tish Cockrell. Uh, president of Friends of Regulus Alrec. And Absalom Jordan, Friends of Auction Run Park. Ready? Yep, go right ahead. Good afternoon. My name is Brenda Ingram. I'm a longtime resident of Ivory City, a member of Empowerment DC, and friends of Cromwell. I graduated from Cromwell in 1969, and yes, I am an alumni. And I will continue to fight for Cromwell being a community center with recreation on the full two acres. Cromwell was the heart of Ivory City and we are thankful to be getting it back. So we love the fact that DPR engaging with me and my community, including our thoughts and ideas keeping us updated on progress and changes. We also want to help direct what kind of um, programming we will have for our grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and the children of our community. I frequently meet with the alumni of Cromwell and we enjoy the events and Power DC sponsors. We will also assist with the design and any meetings with DPR and DGS to encourage that the project goes as the residents plan. Chairperson White, our ask is that you support Cromwell's renovation project by asking for more funding being included in the budget. We appreciate the 20 million, but we know we will need more funding for this project to be completed. Thanks for allowing me to testify. Thank you. Um... Who's next? Okay. And is it Ann Willis? Yes. Okay. Are you okay? You're here too? Yes. Okay, go right ahead. Sorry. Good afternoon, Council Member White and staff. My name is Ann Willis. I am an alumni of Cremail, a member of Friends of Cremail in Empire DC. I'm a native of DC and live in Ivy City practically all my life. I'm raising my family here. It was great being able to work, walk on the Cremel site with the soft opening we had spring of 21. This school, the Alexander Cremel School that I went to has been closed since 1977. This Memorial Day will be the second year anniversary of the opening, and we plan to have a celebration. Hope you will join us. The reason I'm here testifying is to ask you for your continued support of this DPR site and that we need more funding for the project. The school has been closed since the 70s, and it's, a, it's historic. Our children, families, and community deserve 
a state-of-the-art community center in our neighborhood and a therapeutic pool that will be great for therapy for the seniors. I'm a senior, so I, would, I appreciate that myself. We would appreciate your continued advocacy in reaching out to Mayor Bowser for additional funding. The funding would need to be included in this budget season for it to be used with the upcoming renovations. We hope you will work with us and thank you for allowing me to testify. Thank you. Um, Ryan Lehman? Lehan? Uh, he's not in here, but he's supposed to be testifying. Okay, oh. once you get there, if you can let us know, uh, yes. we gotta move along. We got a long night ahead. Thank huh. you. All right. Ms. Cockrell? Hello. Council Member Tran White, thank you uh, for having me today. And um, I am Tisha Cockrell. I'm the president of the Friends of Riggs LaSalle Recreation Center. And we work uh, together with uh, DC Parks and Recs and the site director, Shirley DeSettles. Um, so we're here today for our previous testimonies and budget hearings and our previous recreation center walk through with Council Member Lewis George, who we were glad to see uh, speak this earlier today um, in a plea to receive funds to assist with our site maintenance as well as new item requests. So um, I uh, turned in testimony and I have some outdoor recreation center issues and some indoor recreation center issues. Um, the first being a new environmental, uh, environmentally friendly turf field that replaces the current field. Uh, it seems to be listed in DPR's fiscal year 25 ready to play budget but we would like more clarity on that. Uh, repair for the netting for the goal on the fence for the field. When uh, the children kick balls, uh, they roll out of the hole in the netting in the field into the street. I understand there's a ticket since um, I wrote uh, this uh, written testimony. There's a ticket that's been placed for that. Um, there uh, needs to be addressing of the field lighting. Uh, again, there's a ticket now has been since uh, submitted or uh, the outdoor fitness equipment on the grassy area, we've discussed that, but we have no status known. Um, we would like uh, some issues with, the, I think there was some issues with replacement doors or something with the doors on the field. Um, I think that that's been completed. Uh, there's some ongoing issues with the splash park outside, the outdoor splash park. They seem to be uh, clogged or sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. The um, DGS, I guess, comes out to fix and then um, they have issues again. We need a sunshade for uh, the new playground. Um, we need clarity on whether or not we'll be able to receive that. I was listening to another uh, testimony saying that it gets really hot in the summertime, it really does, and there's no shade out there at all. Um, we wanted to bring back a garden that was between the school, the old, the, the school there that would, that's uh, LaSalle Elementary and the old playground on the backside. Um, that's the outdoor recreation issues. The indoor recreation issues, we spoke before about uh, replacing the, uh, the exterior interest door on the Nicholson Street side. I think they uh, have just completed that. The push bar was broken. Um, the roof, we did get a million dollars from the mayor's budget from our last um, testimony in regards to the leaking roof that had been leaking since 2008, but we've gotten no... Uh, information on whether or not that work has been started, much less completed. I don't think it's been started at all. Um, and then um, the gym basketball rim had been stuck and wouldn't come down, which was prohibiting full court play. Um, I believe there's a ticket now um, put in for that. Uh, the HVAC system was to be replaced with a new system. I think it's in progress, but we need clarity on how that's going. Um, and then there's some other issues here. We would like to install new windows and shades instead of the aluminum blinds that they have now. Uh, there's a, a ticket in to repaint the building's interior. Um, we've been waiting on that. And uh, they wanted to add a mural to the lobby, uh, replace windows in the multi-purpose room, replace the door to the gym, um, new fitness equipment for the weight room. I think there's a ticket uh, on for that. 
purchase a multi-purpose uh, projector with a drop-down screen, um, new ping pong tables, and allotment for community children for summer camp, the Little Explorers age three to five. And we've got some good things that have happened at the REC. Uh, we're grateful for um, some of the assistance we've gotten in regards to some lighting in the parking and, and cameras um, and camera replacement and repair for some incidents we've recently incurred. But we want to be sure that the attention is paid to our detailed list provided here. Uh, regarding why we need to receive funds to enhance further projects, address needed repairs, maintenance, and upgrades. We've mentioned before that our center has been subjected to deferred maintenance and neglect for several years, and other recreation centers across the city have access to modern technology and aesthetics. We are requesting the same, and uh, we appreciate the attention to our requests and resources. Thank you so much. Thank you. Brother Absalom Jordan, um, friends of Auction Running, long time water commissioner. You're muted, Brother Jordan. You're still muted. I know you're saying something powerful and good, but we still can't hear you. Try to hit the space bar button. Hold the space bar if you at, at your computer. Hold it down. We don't have the ability to unmute you. We can mute you, but not unmute you. Oh, man. I think that's it now. There you go. Yeah, I can hear you now. He, yeah, yes, sir. I want to thank you, Chairman White, for and the other members of the committee for giving us an opportunity to be uh, to appear before you today. As you know, I'm no longer commissioner, but thank you for recognizing that I did serve as a commissioner for some years. I want to. Uh, I represent Friends of Ox Run, Chairman White, who uh, is a friends organization uh, that has uh, that has an agreement with the Department of Parks and Recreation. Uh, friends, I mean the Ox Run Park is the largest park within the inventory of the Park Department. The Department of Parks and Recreation, and we're excited about the uh, the the opportunities are, that are being given to us to have an impact on Oxen Run. I don't know, you don't live too far away from Livingston Road, Chairman White, and I hope that you've had a chance to see that the cherry blossom trees that we had planted there some years ago are in full bloom there, and we're just excited. The cherry blossom trees hearken the oncoming of spring, and so we're excited about the things that are going to be happening in Oxen Run Park this year based on activities of the Friends of Oxen Run and the Well and the other organizations that are doing things in the park. Uh, I want to note, Chairman White, that we've received a tremendous amount of support from the Department of Parks and Recreation and specifically the chair, I mean the director of the Department of Parks and Recreation. We couldn't have come as far as we have without his support in, in terms of the things that we uh, we have been striving to do. Uh, we've been having learning activities in the park. We, we've we had the City Nature Challenge. We've had cleanups in the park. Uh, this past fall, we had the a Green Fair in the park, and we're working with your office now to have Oxen Run Day, a celebration for Oxen Run in August of this year. So we're excited about the things that we're doing, but rest assured that we are, are most appreciative of the support that we've received from the director and the staff at the Department of Parks and Recreation. The Chairman White, there are a couple of things that I would want to note, and that is uh, there's supposed to be a restroom that's going to be established at Livingston Road and Atlantic Street. There's also supposed to be an outdoor gym. Those things haven't moved anyway, anywhere, I mean, and we're wondering when that's going to happen. I hear people talk about other funds for other things. These funds were, are supposed to have already been committed and obligated for these activities. Uh, but uh, we, we, we've been looking for years if we really want to make the park a place that you can go to. And if people talk about having other activities in the park for dogs, we don't have a place where people can go and, 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 and relieve themselves. And so there were funds supposed to be in the uh, budget for a facility at Livingston Road in Atlantic and one down at the Mother's Peace Garden. And we'd like to find out why that hasn't happened. The other thing is 
uh, that uh, we want to uh, want to commend the Department of Parks and Recreation for the commitment they've made for bringing Camp Riverview back on stream. Uh, we think that there can be more that needs to be done, and we'll talk about it at the budget hearing. But we want to thank them. That is a, a gem. Uh, kids in, in Ward 8 have had an opportunity to go and experience time away from the city at Camp Riverview. And but we also want to see it open for adults and other people to have a chance, seniors and other people to go and have a chance to, to be that. The one concern I want to share with you, Chairman White, is this. Uh, Brent Sisko told us after the hearing last year that he would be uh, working with our community and the Friends of Oxen Run in terms of the development for the expansion of the Southeast Tennis and Learning Center. We have never heard from him again since then, and we're quite concerned about that. We're tired of agencies putting uh, plans in motion without ever coming to the community to talk about those plans and asking us to ratify them when they bring them before the community. I would note that you said earlier in the hearing that normally what happens is that they meet with the community and they have the architects there uh, with preliminary plans and what have you, but they discuss with the community to find out what we'd like to see happening with respect to that, and that is not happening. So if the director can have Mr. Cisco uh, working with us, commit himself and actually working with us uh, to deal with this expansion, uh, then we would appreciate. The final thing, uh, Chairman White, is uh, you live on Atlantic Street on the south side of South Capitol Street, on the east side, I mean, the South Capitol Street. And, and there's been funds that have been provided to Bald Eagle and, and uh, Fort Grebel. They've been renovated within the last five or six years, both of them. We haven't had that kind of commitment to the kids and families who live on the southern side of South Capitol, I mean, on the eastern side of South Capitol Street. Uh, it was mentioned earlier about fairness and equity, and I think that we we want to uh, fight for getting fairness and equity for those of us who live in, in the same part of the uh, ANC 8D that you do. And so we had hoped that uh, we can get something in uh, our area that will serve the children and the residents of uh, at least that area of 8D that has been unserved at this point. Thank you again for the opportunity to appear here, Chairman White. Now I look to see you at the budget hearings. Yep, thank you, Mr. Jordan. Um, it's still it's still Ab. <laughs> All right, Mr. Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Ryan Lehman, are you here? If so, you can be elevated to speak. Line hand. Am I saying it right? I see you on the screen, but I'm not seeing your face or not seeing you on mute. Okay, there go, Ryan. Hey, how are you doing? Councilman? Long time no see, man. Welcome. Uh, well, thank you for uh, giving the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm actually out at the Arboretum right now with my family. I'm uh, just enjoying the weather. Uh, so apologies uh, if I had done something a little bit uh, that didn't allow me to, I guess, be seen on uh, the panel as a panelist. Um, but I just wanted to echo um, what uh, Commissioner Rhodes uh, and Ms. Brenda and Ms. Ann had said, um, that we, we really need to increase the funding for the Alexander Cromwell School renovations. Um, 20 million after meeting with DPR seems to, to barely cut it, um, given that it is a historic building. Um, this is going to be a more costly project. Um, so we'd love to see an additional 20 or 30 million added um, would love to see a, a super rec center, um, as, as a previous panelist had suggested the district needed. Uh, the Cromwell School would be an amazing site. Um, and we, uh, I think we have since the 1940s uh, with our civic association in Ivy City, a request for um, a pool. Um, that was been something I'm hearing from nearly everyone in the community. Um, and it, after meeting with DPR, it seems like that was something completely uh, skipped over or ignored as something that wouldn't be feasible with the budget that is allotted. Um, so we'd love to see this increased uh, so that we're not not barely making the Cromwell School uh, usable. We, um, we really do need to, to see this uh, made right as it's been closed since the 1970s. Um, it's, it's something that, that really needs to be uh, 
taken care of and providing. Um, I will say that the when I had spoken at the um, as a temporary library, um, the trailer that was on the criminal school site, um, that was something that uh, I thought would be a perfect place for a temporary library. Um, again, it's now been burnt down. Um, don't know what caused that. Um, we need lights turned on at the criminal school site. Um, there are lights that are there, but they do not get turned on. Um, some people are not feeling comfortable now going through there. Since there's been canopy provided, it makes it extra dark. Um, we also have glass that's all over the, the play space. Um, so the people from the daycare have stopped bringing the children there um, because there's glass all over the place. Um, and kids at that age are not going to be able to avoid that. Um, so we really, really need just the bare minimum. Also in this small little section of grass that we have in front of the basketball courts, um, it seems like there are a bunch of dog poops that are piling up right in front of the, the criminal school recreation sign. Um, I've gone over there and put uh, dog poop bags to, to hopefully have people clean up after themselves rather than just kind of pile it up. Um, but that is, that's not really happening. Um, the site that we, we, really care about is, is seemingly being disregarded by DPR. It's not even being locked up at night anymore. Um, so I think this glass is coming from people that are, are hanging out there overnight. Um, but it is, it is that now I, I know the, the daycare doesn't feel comfortable even bringing the kids there anymore because the amount of glass is piling up on the small area for the, the children. Got it. Thanks, Ryan. I know you're busy. Um, and thank you for adding value to the continued conversation about the Conwell School. Um, next, we have Commissioner May 5D08. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson White. I uh, appreciate you. Give me the opportunity to testify today. Uh, I am Reed May. I'm the advisory neighborhood commissioner for single member district 5D08, which represents the eastern edge of Trinidad and the northern portion of Carver Langston. And so I came to testify today on behalf of residents here in 5D. And so to begin, I'm, I'm going to echo several things that I think have already been shared um, also by, by others here today, but also by our Ward 5 council member, Zachary Parker. Uh, the first of those is that uh, I think it's extremely important to residents uh, here in Ward 5 uh, and throughout the city that uh, DPR facilities, particularly recreation centers, are available to members of the community uh, on evenings and weekends. And this is, I think, particularly important for district youth. Uh, an example that I think is worth citing is that the Trinidad Rec Center is currently only open from 12 to 8 p.m. on weekdays, 9 to 1 on Saturdays, and is closed on Sundays. And as we've heard, Frequently in recent months, we know that district youth are facing a lot of challenges, social emotional challenges, uh, challenges related to the isolation of the pandemic, and that more of them are victims of or involved in, in violent crime. And we know it's critical that the, the district make a, a greater investment uh, in youth programming and support services. I think that effort begins with ensuring recreation centers are accessible more frequently. And so as a baseline, I wanna advocate for the Department of Parks and Recreation to open its facilities from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. on weekdays, 9 to 5 on Saturdays, and 12 to 5 on Sundays. And again, that echoes the request made by Council Member Parker. And I think it's important for the council to ensure that DPR has adequate funding uh, to staff their recreation facilities during those hours. Additionally, I'd also like to affirm what many other members of the community have been speaking about regarding prioritizing the completion of the Cremel School Recreation Center in Ivy City. That project, as, as others have noted, has previously been funded, but there are concerns about whether that funding is adequate to complete the project. Uh, and so I'm asking the council to prioritize supplemental funding as required to ensure that the project is completed on schedule. Uh, as you know, uh, Chairperson White, the Crumall School will fill a critical resource gap in Ivy City where youth have long lived without the playgrounds and amenities that are featured in many other parts of the city and where residents have been, have been yearning uh, for investment for many years. And then finally, I also would like to affirm the Department of Parks and Recreation's decision to classify Carver Langston as a neighborhood to study for potential park expansion within their recently released uh, draft ready to play Parks and Recreation Master Plan. Uh, in my conversations with DPR, they've shared with me that their goal is to target two priority neighborhoods annually for assessment beginning in FY 2024. 
Uh, and I'm strongly recommending that DPR prioritize Carver Langston as one of these initial neighborhoods uh, and that the council provide adequate funding for that assessment uh, and others as well. Uh, as you may know, uh, Chairperson White, most of Carver Langston is outside of the Department of Parks and Recreation's target half mile walk shed for a playground space. Uh, meanwhile, the portions of the neighborhood which are located within a half mile of a playground, and those would be the, the uh, westernmost edges, they are still separated from the nearest playgrounds by two minor arterial road roadways Excuse me, that are difficult to cross on foot. And so it's not uncommon for us in Carver Langston to see children uh, playing with their friends on roadways or in any vacant green space they can find. Uh, and moreover, through extensive neighborhood outreach, I've spoken with more than two dozen families with young children who live here in Carver Langston and who've cited the lack of community and playground space as a factor that may inhibit their ability to raise children in the neighborhood that they call home. So with these challenges in mind, residents here in Carver Langston have identified a prospective site at the corner of 19th and L Street Northeast uh, that is actually a, it's a, an empty lot that is currently owned by the district government, uh, but sits vacant outside of one tree in the southeastern corner. The lot currently is characterized by illegally parked cars, uh, some illegal dumping and, and frequent litter. But given the ideal location in the heart of Carver Langston, we think this city owned property uh, could serve as a, uh, a repurposed playground space. And so we're, we're encouraging the Department of Parks and Recreation to assess that possibility and for the council to provide adequate funding and support for that purpose. Uh, and that is why I came to testify today. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, for the sake of time, we'll move forward. I did want to note, uh, Mr. Ab, um, you talked about the investment into Fort Gravel and Ball Eagle, which I say has been minimum, um, which we can do more if we can get the money out the door. Um, if and the only one I know east of South Capitol Street that's close by is Furby Hope, and that's a brand new wreck that's also facing some challenges with Kip School, which we had a number of meetings there just one right two weeks ago. What I'm not sure which other ones are you referring to? What, what I'm saying is that you know that's in a different community, kids yes. from my community can't go there. Okay, let's be honest about it. There's a there, there's that tension that 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 exists between these various communities yeah. and and so we don't have anything uh it would be great if we had something at henley school it would be great if something could be put down in pr harris uh uh you know on the ground floor there but i'm just saying for the kids in my part and you know mostly what exists on third and fourth street in livingston road and what have you are apartments most of those apartments so they're uh, large numbers of people who live in those, that area, but we really don't have anything. And if we're looking at the distance that our children would have to walk to a facility, it, it's it's just unacceptable to ask them to walk there for Chairman White. Thank you. And I do know that PR Hers used to be a recreation center. I used to attend that recreation center. In fact, I saw Greg that used to run the rec at Furby Hope last week. And so we're looking to that as we are pushing DPR to do some community uh asset uh, uh um inventory to figure out where we are with our recs because communities have changed so much and so we can uh have a comprehensive conversation about where we are uh sufficient and insufficient throughout the community and I totally agree with the uh public safety barriers not just in this community but in a lot of other communities um, and also the use of space in these communities um Mr. May, I did want to ask you, and I did reach out to uh, Councilmember Parker. You mentioned some rec hours. I thought I heard you say 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. during the week, but I was unable to catch the weekend to, to recommendations to DPR. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so the weekend recommendations, we were we were hoping for at least 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. on Saturdays and and 12 to 5 p.m. on Sundays. I would say if it's if it's possible for weekend hours to be even longer, that would be advantageous, but I, I also understand that, uh, that the staffing challenges are real. We just, we want to see those hours go up as much as possible. Yep. Yeah. Uh. Chairman, wait, if I could though, please get us our restrooms. Uh, that will really assist us in getting people in the park. Uh, you know, as it stands right now, 
there's no place for them to go, you know, to relieve themselves. Yeah. And and so uh, at the budget meeting last week, I brought it up and I sent a message to DGS. I'm asking them for a formal response um, from DPR. And well, I think we sent a number of questions to DGS. I'm not sure if we sent anything to DPR yet. My staff is here. Can't confirm that. But that money was in the budget, man, at least two years ago. So yes, sir. I, that right. don't take that don't take long to get get that. Like it's just ridiculous about the the <laughs> the spirit of apathy and just not being diligent about getting us what we need in our community, man. So thank you. Uh, thank you, you have my full attention. We will be sounding that alarm. Um, and and please join us at our next community conversation, at, which I think is on the 15th. Okay. So it'll be going out to the public. Thank you all for testifying today. We look forward to working with you all um, and hearing from you. Um, and if you have anything in addition, please email to my office at ryA at dccouncil.gov. Uh, we are taking notes. We want to make sure we are uh, accurate um, with what some of these responses is so we can get some um, answers and, and accountability from not just this committee, but also from the executive branch. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. All right. Next we have Okay. Kevin Larios. Samira Woods, and please correct me once you come on. Adrian Miller, and these are DPR teens. Eric Curry, DPR radio participant. Nasheed Smith, DPR student athlete. I don't know if all you all are together in one room. I did see a note about Kennedy Rick. Brandy Forte. Okay, I see you. If the youth can come on, elevate Brandy Forte. Um, if you are presenting, I don't what I don't know if you all are in one room. Oh, Jasmine. Hell yeah. Uh, okay. If you could just cut the screen on, and if you are youth who are who is speaking, if you can tell us your name, that'd be helpful so we can check off who is speaking and who has not been called. It's always great that we hear from youth and young adults um, in our city. It's very important that we listen to you. If you can unmute yourself and cut the screen on, we can get started. If you are having any technical difficulties, please let me know so we can know how to move forward. <sighs> Mr. Yeldale, if you can elevate Brandy Forte, I think she has a number of the youth with her as well. Who, who is on the Jasmine Hill page at Kennedy Rec? I can see you on the screen, but you haven't come yeah. on yet. We're trying to stall. Oh, there we go. Jasmine. Go right ahead, Jasmine Yell, Jasmine Hill. Am I saying the right page? You can state your name and begin the opening statement. Good afternoon, Council Member Trayon White and the rest of the council. It is with great pleasure that I get to speak with you today. 
My name is Shania Dyson. I am currently a senior at McKinley Technology High School. I am here to speak on behalf of the Department of Parks and Recreation Roving Leader Program at Kennedy Recreation Center. And encountering the Roving Leader Program at the school with my Roving Leader, Miss Rita, she referred me to talented leaders in the community, a SYP program under the Roving Leader Program. In the summer of 2022, I attended the TLC lead by Miss Jasmine, who I tell everyone is my godmother. While participating in TLC, Ms. Jasmine taught us about life skills, how to communicate effectively, and took us on trips in the outside, took us on trips in and outside of DC. She gave us different viewpoints on life, college, and jobs, as well as how to handle our personal relationships. I currently come to Kennedy at least three times a week to participate in TLC and internship after school. They give me something positive to do when it seems like everyone my age gets a kick out of doing wrong. This summer, instead of being in the SYP, pro SYP program, I will be a junior roving leader, where I will hopefully get to work alongside Miss Jasmine or the mobile team. I don't know where I would be without the roving leader program of Miss Jasmine. Thanks so much. Uh, we can, is there another youth there? I see we see a young man there at Dingwood. If there's another youth there where you are, you can let them on screen. No, there's not. Okay. And um you can cut your screen on to the young man at Deanwood. How you doing? Good in you sir. Good afternoon, Council Member White. Director Hunter, community leaders, DPR staff, family and friends, and Ms. Sophia, our citywide program coordinator of Supreme Teams. My name is Kevin Lorios Molina. I am currently a senior at D. McKinney Technology High School. I'm a member of Supreme Teams at Riggs Side Recreation Center, where Ms. Sonia Sotana is my lead facilitator. I started participating at Riggs when I was 14 years old in the Summer Youth Employment Program. During the summer of 2019, and immediately following summer, I became of the youth, a member of the Youth Advisory Committee with Ms. Sophia and continued as an in-school Supreme Teens intern at Riggs LaSalle. Supreme Teens is a youth development program and the curriculum provides a comprehensive, high quality youth development program that will aid, aid teens in developing the necessary skills to ensure higher personal achievement. It's where youth from all eight wards participate every week at a site of their choice. This program is all about the focus on the youth. Getting youth to come out and learn is very difficult, in which this program gets youth to come out to learn, have fun, meet new people, make money, and develop life skills. This program means a lot to me in many ways. This program allowed me to have a lot of connection with the staff, such as Mr. Lou Hall and Ms. Sophia, who have created events such as financial literacy and mental health awareness seminars. Also allow me to be a role model to other youth. With, be, with me being in this program since I was 14, I have seen the number of teens continue to increase in the program. The program is all about the youth interest and what we can accomplish in life. It also helped me stay away from trouble, in which it helps many from staying off the streets and getting their life set and choosing the right path. There are plenty of things I would love to see in this program. One, of course, is more transportation, such as coach buses. More youth would have the opportunity to go to events and trips if DPR increased its fleet offerings. Having coach buses would allow more teams to go out of town. For example, more trips for exploration experience, out of state and overnight trips. Another thing I can say is larger venues for the event. Currently, our recreation centers are at capacity when we do events and cannot hold the amount of teams that are enrolled in the program. We had events with five or more classes, but if we had larger venues, we could have more classes and conferences. A large teen center would be an ideal place. In this program, there have been many in-person events. One event that was held recently was the College Prep and Career Readiness Fair. DPR had over 40 vendors from colleges, trade schools, career professionals, military personnel, and entrepreneurs. This allowed me to interact with different people with different business backgrounds. It assured me that there is more out there that I can do with my life as I'm starting this next chapter. I was able to meet college professionals from North Carolina Central and Norfolk State University. This caught my attention and captivated my interest. 
these professionals took time to speak to me about the enrollment process and what it would look like for me in Central or Norfolk State. I may have never been able to speak to them if it wasn't for the program. I have been accepted to both North Carolina Central, Norfolk State, and among other HBCUs college acceptance. Overall, the Supreme Teams have inspired me and impacted my life. I want to thank Lou Hall and especially Miss Sophia for all the advice, lessons, and skills they have given me. The opportunity this program has given me throughout my four years is too much to describe. I have built a lot of confidence and become more of a leader, not only in the program, but outside of the program as well. I have built a strong connection with the program to where I can call them my other family. We work together, and as we always say, there is no I in team. I am thankful for this program, especially with this being my last year. This year alone has been a lot. With me dealing with losing friends due to gun violence, shutting people out and not being okay mentally and emotionally. I learned it is okay not to be okay. Without this program, who knows where I would be right now. I am thankful for all the support and love from this program. This program is what made me the person I am today, which is a leader and the future of DPR. Thank you, Mr. Kevin. Um, we have Ms. Jessica Smith, who's joined by Eric, um, Tiana, um, and whoever else. I don't know all the list of people who are with you. Um, so go right ahead, uh, Jessica Smith. Hi, um, Eric and Tiana are on a different device, but they are part. That's what I meant. But okay, good afternoon, everyone, and um, Council Member Trayon White. Uh, my name is Jessica Smith. I am 17 and a three-year vet at DPR's Dean of Radio Broadcast Journalism Program, um, which is a mass media program that focuses on networking, radio broadcast operations, and the journalistic arts. I'll start by saying this, that this program is pertinent to the mission of stability and efficacy with DC's youth. This program has given me a sense of belonging and ideas for paths that I'm willing to take in the future, which I have learned, unfortunately, is a privilege that many people in the city do not have. Um, I started this program at 14, the first summer of a pandemic, fresh out of neurosurgery, which left me with a non-dominant hand to write with. And the biggest journalistic practice that I've always applied um, in this program is written preparation. So the initial part of my journey at Deanwood was very discouraging. So before I started, I had already mentally given up. That was until I was made aware that an individual whose faith and voice that I'd never heard or seen in person checked on me and expressed his concerns for my recovery process. That man was Paxton Baker, and who is one of, if not the biggest advocate and sponsor for our program. The language of what I had just shared may be interpreted as insignificant, but it was one of the exact things that made me keep going with this program. Because of the pandemic, well, 2020, we were limited to online interviews. And for me was one of the first liberating was with Congress, um, Ele Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton. Um, I was surprised that a group of kids from a DPR program had the accessibility of some to someone of her stature. Not only that, but this was one of the times I had pushed myself in my journalistic abilities, which paid off when she openly expressed how impressed she was with my work, especially regarding my age at the time. This was an event that legitimized the skills of my peers and I. I'm known to my group to have questions that are more head on, but I've never directly addressed controversy. I was able to exercise this in the summer of 21 when we interviewed Washington Commanders President Jason Wright. Another example is from 20, in the 2022 summer, um, I've gotten multiple calls from family members, friends that I was on the radio due to our partnership with WPGC this summer. I conclude by saying that what I have told you is not a story or mode of self and community validation, but evidence of our director, Solly Williams and Lou Halls who have labored to, so that not only can we do our best, but know our best which the lack thereof has been a generational poison to our community. And I respectfully say that if the leaders of this district fail to uphold programs like Dean World Radio Broadcast, the potency of the future that we promise ourselves will cease to exist. Thank you. Thank you for that amazing testimony. Um, we're coming to you, Ms. Forte, trying to 
cover the youth that are in these in the waiting area that we've called. Um, I don't see her name. It says DPR team at Dean Whoop. Does she have the yellow jacket on? Uh, is that Tiana? No, my name is Nevea Burroughs. Nevea Burroughs. Okay, go right ahead. Hi, my name is Nevea Burroughs. I am 16 years old and I have been participating in DTPR activities for 10 years, for over 10 years. Not only have I been involved in co ed soccer, T ball, basketball, and kickball and rugby, but I have also been a part of Young Ladies on the Rise, Supreme Team Club, DPR Elite Stars Cheer, Dance at Raymond Rec. Pom Pom at Raymond Rec and also the captain of Rosedale Dance Team. I have attended most of the different sports clinics across the city, including the volleyball clinic, life skills clinic involving learning how to do hair, acrylic nails and lashes, and also the chair clinic. Without these programs, there will be more kids and teens committing crimes, and there will also be an increase in gun violence. I have lost friends because of this, and they weren't able to get help and the resources they needed to get through life. But DPR has helped me and can help more people like me. I really enjoy getting to know girls that are interested in the same things I'm interested in. I think we should continue to expand the girls youth program because it gives girls like me a safe environment to keep and have a variety of conversations and interactions. I have been able to listen and learn about other life experiences. I have met a lot of amazing people like Mario Bowser and the Washington Wizards cheerleaders. And I am grateful that I have learned so much from the DPR staff. The girls sports program has opened my eyes to so many different things. Not only did I learn about, I learned a lot about myself along the way, but I have learned the importance of positive social skills and motivational skills. The most rewarding experience was when I became captain of the DPR D Star Share team in 2022. Now I am an entrepreneur and a CEO of my own businesses. I want to give my special thanks to Coach Q and also my special thanks to Coach Kiana for guiding me through hard times with my dad not being present in the past and supporting me when it comes to school and my businesses and tough decisions. I really appreciate all the activities that were put into place and I look forward to being supportive and I look forward to being supporters of the DPR Parks and Recreation Young Women's Sports and Activities. Thank you so much. Um, and guys, please stand by um, for question. questions during this panel. Don't go too far. We're going to move to Mr. Eric Carey. Good morning. Oh, well, good afternoon, uh, Council Member White, and good afternoon to uh, all the panelists. I'm Eric Curry III, and I am representing Deanwood Radio Broadcast today. Uh, I just wanna speak on my time at Deanwood Radio Broadcast. Uh, before I joined the program, I had my own, I started my own podcast during the summer of 2020. And I didn't realize that I wanted to go into media as a profession. I didn't think you could go into media as a profession. I'm a student at Duke Ellington School of the Arts. I thought, and I'm in the theater department at Duke Ellington School of the Arts and all I know is acting and theater. Thanks to the leadership of Sally Williams, uh, Mr. Lou Hall, uh, Julia Irving from the mayor's office, uh, I was able and I'm blessed to be able to have interviewed the likes of Kim McDuffie to interview Mayor Bowser herself. I've interviewed Wisdom Martin. I've interviewed Paxton Baker. We've got to, I've also, like Jessica, my family and friends have called me because my voice has been on WPGC 95.5 doing uh, ad drops and on NPR with WMU and their Lift Every Voice segment. Uh, programs like Dean will have also prepared, propelled me with my communication skills at school, in public, with my podcast. Also, I'm going into my freshman year in college next semester. And I feel like that I'm well prepared because of my time at Dean Wood to enter as a media journalist uh, major and to even go into the profession going to the profession on a very high level because of the teachings of Sally Williams. I feel like more students and more youth deserve to be a part of programs like a Dean Wood radio broadcast because of how much it changed my life and how it has opened my eyes to the future, 
to my future and the future of the city and the future of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Tiana? Hello, yes, I'm here. Um, can you see me? Oh, I can see you. can hear you, yep. Okay. Okay, good morning, Council Member White and everyone else. I am Tiana Addison from the Deanwood Radio Broadcaster Program. At first, I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak on my DPR experiences. I've been in this program since I was 14 years old. My mom wasn't very fond of me going to this program. Mm, excuse me, uh, going to this program because of the location. But if it wasn't for Mr. Sali calling my mom and reassuring her that I'm in a safe hands and we are family oriented, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be in this program. I probably would have, excuse me, I probably would have never gotten the opportunities that I've gotten already. During my time at this program, I was able to meet, connect, and interview with many wonderful, influential people, such as Joe Clare, Tracy Wilkins, Kelly Williams, Donnie Simpson, and many more people. Donnie Simpson became my mentor because of this program. He even checks up on me here and there to make sure I'm doing okay. So as you can see, I've built amazing relationships with fellow students and interviewees. Before this program, I didn't know what my career path was until I found my voice here and my passion, which is, of course, radio broadcasting. I currently attend the illustrious North Carolina Central University, majoring in mass communication with a concentration in broadcasting because of the program and Mr. Salu. Thank you. Thank you so much and congratulations. Um, I see DPR Tina Deanwood, if you can open it up and state your name and begin your opening statement. Uh, how y'all doing? My name is Nashi Smith, 22 years old. Uh, I've been a boxer at Headbangers Boxing Gym, which is at Bald Eagle Recreation Center for, I wanna say about 10 years now. Uh, I'm a five-time national champion. I just won a Golden Glove national title this year and also the USA national championship this year. Currently went ranked number one in the country at 189. Also ranked number one in the country at 176 for the Golden Gloves as well. Uh, and DPR has been a, a big part in my life. Um, for me, it really, uh, really, it really saved me for real, for real, because um, I'm able to uh, hang, on, hang on my belt right here as well. Uh, but um, it really saved me because I have friends that have been in the streets. I have friends that has passed away incarcerated and things like that. And a lot of the times they want me to make moves with them, but just me being so dedicated and my coaches, uh, DPR workers like Barry Hunter, uh, Patrice Harris, also volunteers like Juice Gatlin, uh, Jan uh, Coach Jamie. He, um, they all pretty much just make sure that I uh, stay on the correct path. And for me, DPR has made me and allowed me to be where I am today. Uh, my only uh, things that I would like to see change is that I feel like we need more funding. Uh, some of our equipment isn't working properly. We have kids in there that are in the gym daily after school, whenever they in in like winter breaks, spring break, things like that. They come in the morning. Sometimes they do two a days in the gym and they really are dedicated to the sport, but they don't really have the funding to actually showcase their talent. Uh, for example, I have a kid in there the other day. He actually won the Silver Glove Locals, won the Silver Glove Regionals, and was ready to go to the Silver Glove Nationals and actually get one of his first national titles. But he didn't have the funding in order to go, so he had to miss out on that trip. So that is pretty much uh, most of my changes and things like that. Other than that, DPR has been great to me, and I still think it's going to be great to other kids that's wanting to come in the gym as well. She, thank you for that. I did want to make a comment before I go on. Uh, first, right. congratulations to you and the other teens who have reached remarkable heights um, in this short period of time. Uh, you. And you may not remember, or you may, I don't know, but I think about four years ago, you came to the D.C. City Council. I was new to the council at the time. You spoke. I remember you had on purple. 
Yes, sir. You and your dad and talked about uh, the needs and getting funding for youth and young adults to travel and for equipment. Um, and because of that hearing, there's money in the budget right now. The DPR has a grant out for youth organizations and people to apply for funding to travel. And uh, I got a message recently from the director about funds that we put in the budget going out for people needing equipment. Mm -hmm. um, so your advocacy is really going to affect a lot of people's lives. And so are those others who have come on today have been on previously, like, um, and, and does the government move so slow, but do know that we are listening and um, adjusting and pushing and tugging to ensure equity and inclusion, especially for youth and young adult services in a time when you guys need it the most. And so I did want to note that before I go to my next witness. And I want to thank you for that. And I'll come back uh, with more questions in about four minutes. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Brandy Forte. Uh, go right ahead. Good afternoon, Council Member Trayon White, the Committee on Recreation, Libraries, and Youth Affairs, and to those who are present virtually. My name is Brandy Forte, and I'm the Executive Director and founder of Amala Lives Nonprofit, as well as the CEO of Amala Lives Institute. Through both of my companies, we have been servicing the District of Columbia youth, adults, communities, and families for 13 years. Amala is an Arabic word for hope, and it is thus the principle that we serve each and every individual. It is with great respect and honor that I testify today about our amazing partnership with DPR. To provide context, we signed a partnership agreement in 2020, literally two weeks before the COVID-19 pandemic was shut the world down. Through the partnerships division, working firsthand with former director Jerome Johnson and current director of partnerships and development, Tanya Myers. Together, Amala Lives and DPR will figure out ways to not let our vision of becoming a one-stop shop in Kenilworth Parkside community for the youth and adults. We would ride the wave of uncertainty for about a year due to COVID. And in 2021, DPR and Amala would create a framework that launched our culinary arts program in its state-of-the-art commercial kitchen at Kenilworth Recreation Center. DPR afforded us the opportunity to train in the commercial kitchen for programming purposes. That was a game changer for us. The Kenilworth Recreation Center is clean, the staff have great customer service, and the community that we had served for 10 years didn't have to be bused all the way to our headquarters in Navy Yard. In 2022, in partnership with DPR, we train and certify 98 DC residents. It is our goal in 2023 to double that number. Our students have a haven where they can receive hands-on cooking, prep cooking, and experience to take their careers to the next level. But I will tell you why we truly love our partnership with DPR. In 2022, in 2020, we lost our building at 4500 Coral Street Northeast due to the current revitalization and construction by DC Housing of Kenilworth Courts. Our displaced students would leave 60 youth that we served annually all alone. There were so many sleepless nights for me as an ED who was passionate about serving. This is when we came to DPR and discussed bringing aftercare programming and summer youth programming, specializing in tutoring, music, art therapy, and culinary arts to Kenilworth Recreation Center, they thought it was a fabulous idea. And as of last fall, our aftercare and summer programs have a hump. And even greater, in September, Amala Liz received the DC DPR Outstanding Programmatic Partner Award. In conclusion, we are thankful to Director Delano Hunter, Tanya Myers, and the Kenilworth Recreation Center staff for believing in us. God did. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I don't know what youth are still here. Um, so I'm going to jump back real quick. If all you all can cut your screens on, um, that'll give me an indication of who's here. Okay. I see Miss Jessica Smith here. And I believe you said you were working with Dean Wood uh, with the Media, media Arts Program. 
That's correct. Okay. Let me get this. Um, and, and I heard, I hear a lot about the program through, as I call him, Boosie Vegas, uh, Mr. Mr. Williams, or the Lou Hall, um, and, and just the number of youth who have been encouraged to do more than just you know, and not no shade to rappers, right? Because I think a lot of our young people have a lot of gifts and talents, but there's so much in the media arts and entertainment industry that we don't tap into, um. And that I'm pushing uh, our district cable television, also the Arts Humanities Commission, to put more resources and funding into giving you all opportunity um, to explore your talents and gifts. And so I, I did want to ask you um, uh, when did you enroll into the program and how long is the program and how did you find out about it? So I actually. Um was randomized into the Marion Berry Summer Youth Employment System. Oh, and wow. So that was my very first time signing up. Um, I signed up as soon as I was eligible. And Dean Wood, fortunately, was my work site. And since 2020, um, I have been working with them. Um, the So the winter of 2021 was our first time with the school year internship program. So in some ways that did elongate our time to, um, I guess, participate and do our works throughout the rest of the year. So it lasts from the summer for, for the limit that um, the Marion Berry Summer Youth Employment has given us and has been extended sometimes due to the, I guess, the efficacy of our leaders, Solly Williams and Lou Hall, and the work that we have done as Dean Wood students. But Thank we're you. in school year internship right now. And what grade are you in? I'm an 11th grader at Jackson Reed. You probably remember me from your um your the presentation. Panel. Yes, yeah. I remember. Yeah. Okay. Great. Good seeing you again. Um I do I see Mr. Curry here. Um yes. I heard you say you're going into media arts as a profession. What what What's your goals and aspirations in media arts, if you can be more specific? I want to own a production company. Well, I want to start my own production company uh, because I feel like there's not enough Black art out there. And uh, I hear a lot of, well, I want this type of story to be told. I want this type of story to be told. And I just want to be the person who tells those stories. Uh, I feel like there's a lot of Black trauma stories that are kind of going around that is popularized especially in media and movies and TV. And I feel like there's more to Black people than trauma. There's more to uh, youth than trauma. It's more to uh, just our culture in general. So I just want to be the one to tell those stories. And that's pretty much what my huge goal is. Thank you. We're extremely proud of you. I heard you say you are also going to college. Do you, have you picked a school yet? Uh, no, I haven't picked a school yet, but uh, also thanks to Dean Wood, uh, I've received a Congressional Medal of Honor. So wow. it has uh, given me the opportunity to go to school for pretty much free. That's amazing. And I, and I'm, and I saw uh, Mr. Williams at the uh, DCIAA Championship. Yes. Which I noticed him along with some other students using the talents we have in DC to not only record the games, to do interviews, do pictures. He he was he was commentating, you know, during that time, but he talked about the number of youth and young adults uh, that are going to school, mm -hmm. um, expanding their education. And in fact, later on, you know, the, the goal is to increase the earning potential to create or be um a producer, a genius in this field, and I just like the work that we're doing um, there. I want to skip around a little bit. Um, Miss Tiana, is she still here? Because one of the reoccurring things that I keep hearing is, is that youth want to participate in certain programs, but there's a fear or concern for public safety. Um, and I know that. Um, uh, hold on, okay, no problem. Uh, I know. I know that that has been an ongoing theme as I go to schools and speak to youth. Also, we have a youth hearing this Saturday. 
is it 25th? I think it's this Saturday. Um, at 12 o'clock noon at the rise, and I hope you are able to attend. We want to get those voices heard on public record um, to influence the budget, to put more resources and activities and, and programming uh, into youth and young adult services in the district. Um, but I do know we have to do more to expand in different places because it is a public safety issue. And also transportation has also come up and hours. I want to ask uh, the, the panel, um, what are, what do you think are some of the barriers to uh, young people like yourself getting into some of the programs that you've gotten into? And if you are interested in answering that, you can raise your hand or just um, come on screen. Uh, okay, Jessica, and I see we have another youth at Deanwood that didn't speak yet, but we're, we're going to come to you too. Um, yeah. I was just saying one of the barriers that prevents people from, well, youth from participating in programs as such is the lack of community around it. I think that over time, DC has lost its ability um, as individuals to encourage youth. And I don't think it's either out of fear or, you know, sort of doubt in the district. And I think people, members of our community aren't in, investing. So back then, my mom will always say there was one person in her neighborhood that sent her in a certain direction or, you know, it, I think I think the advertisement from, I guess, the everyday person is what would work. I also believe that, again, the, the violence that's happening around our city is a major factor. Either people are heavily youth are heavily invested in it or think that's what their limitations are. And I don't know what it is, but I feel like the leaders of our CD need to find a way to push forward that, um, that image that this is something that they are capable of doing. Thank you for that insight. We are taking notes. Is Nevea Barrow still here? Um. I see she's making her way back up. Um, and I want to thank you, uh, Ms. Barrows, for speaking. Um, I thought I heard, did you say you're going to be a junior urban leader? Yes. And I, I, I became shooken up because most people don't know this about me, but I started my career in government as a junior urban leader. Um, and that was my start to getting into a structured job outside of the summer job. Um, and to come back and work as a roving leader and as a supervisor of the roving leaders and now as a council member who oversees DPR. And so I know that with God and with the right supports that nothing is impossible for our youth. But uh, like Ms. Smith said, we have to uh, have those community liaisons that's on the ground in the trenches that you love and respect and listen to to push you in those directions. Uh, how did you get into be the junior roving leader uh, job? Um, so my, the staff at Raymond Rec and also my coach, Coach Kiana, she, they have pushed me to, um, look outside the box and to trust things that were new. And also my mom, she helped me get into that so I can have other resources and other help to get money and do stuff. Yeah. And what, and what grade are you in and what school? I'm in the 10th grade and I go to Cooley High School. Okay. Okay. Thank you. For that. And, and what are some of your career goals? Um, I'm currently an entrepreneur, so okay. I hope to like expand my businesses. So um, I do lashes and I also design clothes. So. And I heard that you had got some of that experience in nails and nails through some of the DPR programs. Yes. And I think that's critical to equipping our youth and young adults who, with uh, tangible tools to make money, right? Um, a lot of times uh, they say that money is the root of all evil, but uh, the other narrative is the lack of money is the root of all evil because people are doing any and everything to make ends meet because the price of living in D.C. has gone up and up and up. And just the price of life um, for basic needs have gone up and families, especially black and brown families, are suffering in the district. And so... I'm I'm glad to hear you're an entrepreneur. Uh, that's important. Um, it's a rewardable, rewardable career to get into, but it's also high risk. High risk, high return, right? 
Um, so I'm proud of you. Any way we can be of assistance, we do have some grants for entrepreneurs in which you, if you are DC business, you do qualify. And so uh, I will leave my information in the chat and you can reach out to my office to figure out how you can apply for some of those opportunities that are out now that can help you in your business endeavors. One is called the Dream Grant and the other one is called Ward 8 Community Investment Fund, uh, which is coming out again this year. Um, I will leave it in the chat. Um, and I'm over my time, but I did want to ask you, uh, Ms. Forte, how many students have graduated from your program and what's the next steps? Yes, so um, for the past four years, we've had 415 students, district residents to graduate, certified, job place. In 2022 was 98 um, that graduated in our culinary arts program. Our goal is to double the number this year, we would like to train and certify and job place 200 um, District of Columbia residents. And um, we're super excited. We just got approved for our small business entrepreneurship certification program, where we will cultivate at least 60 aspiring entrepreneurs, help them get their business license, train them in e-commerce and all the um, different industries um, so that they can, you know, propel as business owners. And um, that is the goal. Yeah. So, you know, not, not everybody wants to go to work. We've seen that with COVID. Some people want to work for themselves. And like the young people said, you have entrepreneurs, aspiring entrepreneurs. Got it. I totally believe that. And I've been witness to some of your programs and, and, and graduations and not just youth, but adults who are getting skills and becoming employable and really transforming their lives, uh, bank accounts, <laughs> uh, children's lives and their self-esteem has been so high at those graduations because of a sense of accomplishment and getting back into the work field. So I wanna thank you for your commitment and dedication to DC. Continue to be great and fabulous as you are and continue to serve the residents of the District of Columbia. Um, thank you. You're welcome. I see we have another team from Deanwood. I don't wanna leave you out. I know we are racing against time, but we have to create the space and, and platform for you to speak. Go state your name and just go right ahead. Good afternoon. My name is Adrian Miller and I am a senior at Friendship Collegiate High School and a member of the in-school internship program at Sherwood Recreation Center. Today, I wanna to testify about the impact that the Supreme Team program has had on my life over the past two years. The Supreme Team program gives youth a place to express themselves freely and teach them the necessary skills needed to accomplish whatever goals they aspire to reach. They also engage DC youth in conversations about issues that affect them and the best method to address those issues. I originally joined this program as a member of the Youth Advisory Committee for the School Year Internship Program. Being a member of the Youth Advisory Committee was meaningful to me because Ms. Sophia, who was my employer, gave assignments in which we had to talk about ourselves in a positive light. These assignments helped me realize that I have a variety of strengths that I can and should use in order to accomplish my goals. They also told me to advocate for myself because if I didn't, there would be opportunities that I could potentially miss. During the summer for the Summer Youth Employment Program, I joined the Image Plus camp where we had to write daily self-affirmations. Doing this, I learned that my path is mine to choose whether or not I'm supported and that if I wanna see my choices be full, I have to continue to build toward my goals. The Supreme Teams program has hosted multiple events that provide information needed for whatever, path, for whatever path you choose, whether it be college or workforce. These events have personally impacted me by introducing me to a network of people that I can get a future job with. Recently, I attended an event that was held where there were colleges, trade schools, and military personnel, along with other entrepreneurial businesses. This event connected me to UPO, which is a trade school that I'm going to attend to learn about building maintenance. In January, I met with the director of the UPO program and was able to take the first step in securing my future career by introducing myself and explaining why I want to be a part of the program. Now I'll be able to join and take the training course in the trade that I am pursuing. Another event was held on February 4th about mental health awareness. And during this, you went to different sessions on how to deal with and understand your mental health or someone else's. The session that stood out to me was pain and the purpose, coping with grief and trauma. 
Dr. Andre Brown was able to use his real life situation to connect with us and gave us information that I never knew. One of the pieces of information he gave was that 50% of people between the ages of 14 and 24 can develop a mental illness, which is important to me because I would have never known to look for the signs in me or around the pe and or in the people around me. We also went on multiple trips to places like Pennsylvania where we got to snowboard, and we went to New York where we did multiple activities, including going to the One World Observatory. We rode the ferry to Liberty Island, and we climbed the Statue of Liberty. Lastly, we went to the Neil Simon Theater to see the play the Michael Jackson experience. Other trips I've been on was ice skating, where I realized I could ice skate better than I could roller skate, and going to the Washington Commanders football game at the stadium where we had box seats, which is something I've never done before. This program has done a lot in helping me prepare for my life after high school. I believe something that can be better is having bigger venues so more people can attend the events. Also, so that there are more slots available for other businesses or colleges that you want, will want to form their own network with. For example, there are you who want to go into cosmetology and barbering, but there isn't any space to get a school or business that could connect with them without pushing another group out. And it's the same for other things like design, like graphic design or a clothing business. Another thing is having more or bigger buses that allow you to go on the trips so they can see something new and not everything that they see every day. Overall, the Supreme Teams program has inspired and impacted my life in a variety of ways, and I'm glad to be a part of this program and get paid as an intern by gaining new experiences and new life lessons. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you. That was impactful. I think you covered holistically, holistically what we need to be doing to not only give the opportunity, but get you all involved and you all that have spoke so far has been excellent speakers and have given some remarkable information. Um, let me ask you this, Mr. Miller, if you can come back to the screen real quick. Do you know, if the, uh, is this program only at Sherwood Rec? Uh, do you know about other programs like this in other facilities? Yes, there's multiple recreation centers around the city where you from multiple boys get a chance to join. So I've known, uh, I've seen you, I've seen recreation centers at Emory, I've seen recreation centers uh columbia heights a lot of other ones i can't name all of them but it's a lot of record centers around the city that youth join and it's just that all of them don't get the opportunity to go on some of the trips to experience what i've experienced got it thank you man how old are you i'm um, 18 okay got it thank you, thank you. Um, there is a list here of teens. I don't know which order we're going in, but I see we've been joined by another team that Dean would. If you can state your name and go right ahead. My name. I'm a, Hello, Council Member White, Director Hunter, community leaders, DPR staff, family and friends. My name is Adriana Payton. I'm a 16-year-old dual enrollment student, currently a junior at Coolidge High School and a freshman at Trinity Washington University. I am also a varsity track and field athlete. I attend Columbia Heights Recreation Center and my facilitator is Ms. Alou, and I am a member of the in-school Supreme Teams internship program. What is Supreme Teams? Supreme Teams is a personal enrichment program through the DC Department of Parks and Recreation for teens ages 13 through 19, and from all backgrounds, social status and ethnicities. It doesn't matter who you are or where you come from, Supreme Teams welcomes teams from all eight wards. Supreme Teens offers teenagers the opportunity to gain essential life skills, experiences, and competences, such as physical and mental health, financial literacy, and college and career readiness opportunities. To ensure youth have a great success, not only as individuals, but also as a team. When I hear Supreme Teens, that's not the only thing that comes to my mind because Supreme Teens means more than a program to me. Supreme Teens means leadership, learning new things, overcoming fears, forming new relationships with such genuine people, finding the starting point to a successful future that awaits and having fun while doing it in a safe environment, no matter where we travel in the city for this program. Supreme Teens have never judged me, made me feel uncomfortable nor unsafe. They always made me feel like I was in the right place at the right time. 
When I started writing this speech, I didn't know how much this program has impacted my life. But now I realize it has drastically made me see life in such a positive light. This program has taken me out of my shell more than anyone could ever imagine. It has made me more outgoing and allowed me to see new perspectives that I didn't know I could see. I've met so many new people during our citywide events that have helped me reflect on myself and to know my worth. Before this program, I felt like a tiny ant in the world that nobody could see, hear, or notice. This program definitely had led me on the right path to become the person I have blossomed into into a successful future. I am able to advocate for myself and speak positively about my experiences. In fact, with all the support, this program should receive more funds to be available to more young people. This program can go farther than this city with all that it offers. I say this because before I joined Supreme Teams, I didn't know a program like this even existed. I was honestly surprised and now I love it here. If more people are given the opportunity to join Supreme Teams and experience what I have experienced in the past two years, I guarantee they wouldn't regret it. You all wouldn't regret, regret it because this program can change generations with enough supreme power, resources, and more money. Lastly, I want to give a special, special shout out to my lead facilitator, Ms. Olu. She has been there for me and my sister since the beginning of January, 2022. Ms. Olu means more than a facilitator to me. She means bestie, mother, teacher, and a therapist. She's literally the best facilitator and boss that anyone can ask for, hand to God. Just in general, she is blessed with a beautiful gift, soul, and skill. Just like I am blessed to be a Supreme Team. Thank you for the opportunity to allow me to speak today, and I hope my speech blesses someone else. Thank you so much. And, uh, and I can tell you're very smart and brilliant. Doing enrollment in high school and in college at the same time, uh, you set an example in raising the bar for what we expect for our youth in the city. So we appreciate you, Miss um, Payton. Um, thank you. Thank you. Go right ahead. I can. Good afternoon, Councilman White, Director Hunter, community leaders, DPR staff, family and friends. My name is Jay Curtis. I'm a War 6 resident and a junior at Richard Wright Public Charter School. I found out about the Supreme Teens program from a good friend of mine. I love this program ever since I've stepped foot in the door at Columbia Heights Recreation Center with Ms. Olu. I've been in the Supreme Teens program for the past two years. The Supreme Teens program provides a safe, supportive environment for teens to learn and grow. It is a community of like-minded individuals who share passion for learning and personal development. This program also emphasizes respect, discipline, and responsibility, which helps teens build strong character traits that are essential for success in all areas of life. It also offers a diverse range of activities and workshops that all allows teens to explore new interests and develop new skills. Skills such as public speaking and leadership training to creative writing, there is something for everyone in the Supreme Teens program. This program to me is a chance for teens to explore a variety of activities that ensure that teens can find something they are passionate about and can pursue their interests in a supportive and encouraging environment. This program has impacted my life by showing me that just because you come from humble beginners, it doesn't mean that you have to be like the rest of the people surrounding you in that situation. This program is also designed to challenge teens and push them out of their comfort zones. This to me is a crucial aspect of personal growth and the program does an excellent job of providing teens with opportunities to test their limits and their resilience. Through activities that are physical, such as ice skating, cooking, and team building exercises, Teens also learn to overcome their fears and develop the confidence to tackle any challenge. I would like to see the program foster more strong relationships between teens and mentors because of the mentors being experienced educators and professionals who are dedicated to helping to teens and need to succeed in life. They offer guidance, support, and feedback to help teens develop the skills and knowledge they need to achieve their goals. These relationships are essential for teens' personal growth and development and the Supreme Teams program excels in creating a positive and supportive mentorship network. 
The Supreme Teens program provides teens with valuable opportunities to give back to their communities. This program emphasizes the importance of community service and encourages teens to get involved in volunteer work through initiatives like food drives, enrichment workshops, and community cleanup projects. Teens learn the importance of giving back and develop a sense of responsibility towards their communities. This is an essential aspect of personal growth and helps teens become well-rounded individuals with a strong sense of social responsibility. As I have explained, this program has impacted my life. I plan to continue with the program until I graduate from high school. And I hope more teens get to experience this program and all that it has to offer. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Mr. Curtis. Anybody after you? No, sir. Okay, I see someone, Mr. Adiola. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, Council Member White, uh, Director Hanna, and DPR staff. My name is Timitayo Adiola. I am a freshman at Columbia University in New York City, and I have been with DPR since my junior year of high school in January 2021. Um, I joined with the hope of just being in a program that was just going to be um, hiring interns, but I didn't know that I was joining a family and a group of adults who actually had my best interests interests at heart. Um, being, I'm with Dean with uh, Radio Broadcast Network under Director uh, Sali, one of the best bosses ever, and I'm super, super grateful for him for, for being there with me since junior year of high school. Um, during the senior year of high school, I was able to earn my Congressional Bronze Medal through the program, which is the highest honor bestowed upon youth civilians in the United States under the age of 24. While also being, being able to earn that meant that I was able to get a letter of recommendation from Congress, which meant that I was able to tender that application while applying to the Ivy League. And I am proud to say today that I am attending an Ivy League University on a full four-year scholarship, zero debt. And I'm also proud to say that more recently, I found out that graduate school was also possible without debt. Um, I just want to say that funding for DPR would, more funding for DPR would definitely be a better thing because I am a testament to that, um, to that program. I also graduated um, a valedictorian, and I was also able to earn college credits through mentorship and being pushed by um, my boss, Ali. He's, he's not only a boss, he was like a father, um, a big brother, and, and also a best friend. He's also still there for me, even though I'm in college. And I just wanted to say that to every youth watching and to everybody watching right now, just because... I come from humble beginnings doesn't mean I have to stay, stay there. I'm a, I'm a testament that shows that you can come from anywhere and you can achieve greatness. I'm, I'm also proud to say that because of the networking opportunities that DPR has been able to bestow upon me and being able to help me enhance my resume, I am going to be one of uh, one of the few accounting interns at Deloitte, which is one of the top consulting firms in the United States. Um, once again, I just want to say thank you to DPR, and I just want to also say to every youth and everyone watching that you can always achieve greatness, and you can always be a, you, be a source of motivation to everybody else behind you, and never forget to give back to the community. Thank you, Mr. Adiola. Um, you were doing remarkable things in the fine the arts. Uh, let me ask you this. What got you on this path? Uh, first of all, you, you, academic excellence in Columbia, uh, man, you, you, you're doing it. You are uh, breaking barriers for those coming behind you. And they're uh, oftentimes, you know, it's highlighted in D.C. A lot of the negative things youth are doing. Right. But we don't highlight those like yourself who are scholars and, and coming through our programs and getting encouragement by so many people. Uh, what do you what, what got you on this path? And. Uh, what do you say to other young people to help them get on the same path you're on? Um, something that got me on the on this path was that I I had goals and I and I and I had dreams that 
I thought were unattainable, which was an example was being able to attend uh, a highly competitive school. And I, I was looking for a program that would help to me to propel me on that path. And I guess I was fortunate enough to be able to get into DPR because when I was initially introduced into DPR and Dean Wood, I actually pushed it to the side and I really, I'm really grateful that I did not. Um, and being able to connect with adults, adults are the main, are the main backbones of this. Our bosses and our um, program directors are the backbones of, of the different programs and being able to connect with adults who actually love you and want to support you is also another thing that made me get on this path because it showed that there were people who had my best interest at heart. And for to the youths who also want to get, sorry, can you repeat the se second part of the question so I can answer it properly? Yeah, I think that sometimes uh, there is a lot of peer pressure on youth, good, bad, and different, um, partly because uh, who they're around sometimes, with the community they're from, who their family members, and not a lot of times those youth who are doing well get an opportunity to engage and speak to those who are just kind of trying to find their way. And for me, I just launched a mentoring program called Heroes DC. I hear from a lot of parents that my son needs to be around somebody like Mr. Adeola, that he can see and feel and touch somebody they can relate to that's doing phenomenal things, not just an older adult. And so positive peer pressure. I was asking you, uh, what advice or thoughts could you give to a young person trying to get into that space or achieve some of the things you have? Um, number one is never say never because um, applying to, when I was applying to Columbia, I had somebody really close to me that I did not expect that told me, don't even dare applying, let alone get in or let alone go for free. Um, the first thing is, sometimes the people who are closest to you or people in your community sometimes say, don't do this because we think you can't achieve it or we think you are not suitable for it even when you think you're not eligible always apply and the reason i say that is because sometimes the person looking at your application is not only looking at your grades they're looking at your background they're looking at what got you to where you are and they're also looking at why you want if you can state your why your why should also be should always be the main thing if you have a why definitely that will that will get you to many places peer pressure i was also under a lot of peer pressure in high school but to every youth watching one thing i always want to say is know who you are before you start taking information from other people once you can define who you are and what you stand on and what what, what your passions are that's when you can know what advice is good for you and what advice you have to sometimes not listen to another thing i want to say is um always look beyond look beyond the confines of your environment, which means always look beyond the four quadrants of DC. Always look at, can I see myself in national programs? Can I see myself doing things that Black people cannot achieve? Can I see myself in um, in rooms that people from DC or Ward 7 and 8 can't even be in? Once you have that, also your mindset, once you have that mindset, trust me, you can achieve anything. And also academic excellence will get you a long, long, long way. If you are in high school right now, if you're if you're a freshman or a sophomore or junior, try as much as possible to attain the highest GPA possible because there are organizations out there who are willing to help you out just because of your academic ex excellence and your background. So those are um those are the, the those are the um advice that I'll give to um, current high schoolers or current youths in DC. And also just ask questions. Never, never feel like you know it all and never feel and never feel like never feel like you're you're too good enough for wherever you are. You are always always be open to learning and always be open to new ideas and meeting new people. And network. Your network is your net worth. That is one thing um, Mr. Sali always told me throughout high school. Sometimes it's not about what you know, it's about who you know, and it's about who can get you to where you need to be. Thank you so much. We appreciate that, um, that wisdom. And we wish that more youth and young adults who are searching can uh, take this wisdom and thrive with it. Uh, thank you. I see someone on the screen, screen for Jasmine Hale. This going, I'm not, so we're going to... Wait a minute. And uh, can you state your name? Let me make sure you are in the queue. 
uh, because we have to move on with this hearing at some point. Um, Good afternoon, Councilman. What's your name, ma'am? I'm sorry. Ruth Bullard, B U L A R. Hold on one second. Hold on one second. I got you. Uh, Ruth Bullard, DPR senior? Yes. Yes. Sir. Hold on one second. I'm trying to look at something. Got it. Go right ahead. Good afternoon. These are our golden years. The Kennedy Center is a home away from home. It's the venue where we can relax for a few hours and mix socially. Although we have daily appointments and commitments, we look forward to sharing time with each other. We are opinionated in our discussions regarding local and world events. We share our thoughts and concerns and leave our worries behind. For us, Black history is every month. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, we bring our favorite delights and before eating, a few words of thankfulness are said by a senior. A culinary program will be greatly appreciated. On February 10th, at the public playhouse, there was a production of poetry, African dancing with a jazz pianist. It was sensational and delightful, an hour of love and joy. Music heals the soul. We would like instruments for some of our youths. It would be remiss if I neglected to mention Mrs. Danielle Hunter, director of the Roving Leader Program, and Mrs. D Donna Dudley, our senior program coordinator. Kadoos to both of them. Everything begins with them. Mrs. Dudley is creative, dynamic, and thinks out of the box. Most importantly, she listens. If someone has a concern, a kind words, a hug, work wonders. Kennedy Center is fortunate to have a caring and loving leader. If something is needed immediately, she would spend her own funds on our seniors and children. On Tuesday, we hand paint by, by numbers and on Thursdays make jewelry. We will look forward to attending venues of cultural excellence. We need more programs for our youth. We need an exercise instructor, games for adults, more arts and crafts, more nutritional items for distribution to our, to our seniors and children, light weights for exercise and exercise pool. We also celebrate our birthdays. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you so much. Um, Eloise, what happened? Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Welcome. Good afternoon. Ready. Good afternoon, <clears throat> Councilman White. My name is Eloise Wahab. I am a member of Kennedy Recreation Center senior program since uh, 2013. After retiring, I desired to find a place to socialize with other retirees. Kennedy acts as a positive space for seniors to find social support. I will highlight some, I will highlight below some of the programs and services below. When I became a member, Mr. Julio Perez was the senior coordinator under the direction of Robert Robinson. While Mr. Perez was coordinator, the senior learned how to make jewelry. We went on shopping trips, including the Amish market, experience in spa day at Emory Recreation Center, and attended many holidays and social events. 
i.e. Valentine party at Fort Stevens, the mayor cookout and the mayor Christmas party. After Mr. Perez departed, Ms. Nadine Sumner became the new senior coordinator under the direction of Mr. Robinson. Ms. Nadine taught us arts and crafts, including clay, face masks, making dolls and watercoloring. Other memorable moments include decorating pumpkins, using newspaper and painting during Thanksgiving holidays and making Christmas wreath using coat hangers and garlic. Some of the many events were the senior cookouts and Christmas party hosted by the mayor and the oldest party, including seniors from Fort Stevens and the summer jam with the DJ. We also participated in health, fitness and wellness program, including exercise with an instructor from the YMCA twice a month. In 2019, the Kennedy Rec Creation Center closed due to COVID-19. After the COVID restrictions were lifted, the center could not reopen due to scheduled renovation. When the decisions was made by the department of rec to reopen Kennedy, everyone was elated. I am thankful for the current senior coordinator, Ms. Donna Dudley, under the directions of Danielle Hunter. Ms. Dudley does an outstanding job and is patient and compassion with the seniors. We currently meet three times a week. We have potluck, play games, and go on trips, i.e. market, restaurants, and plays, and senior dancing. And instructors taught us how to make body wash and perfume under the new leadership. I am very impressed with the event planning and preparation. Seniors also went to the El Blanco, a white event given by the recreation. We, they have monthly globe skating and outdoors events. They have many events for the youth at the Kennedy Rec Center. I look forward to the future of the Kennedy Recreation Center and a positive impact to the community. Thank you so much. Also, special thanks to uh, Ms. Jasmine and Ms. Dudley as well. Um, next, we will hear from Tammy Gordon, ANC 3C06. Um, Scott Parker, Washington, D.C. Pickleball. And if the screen can come back on for uh, the Jasmine Hale screen while they're coming on board, I did want to make a, a couple of notes here to Miss Ruth Ballard. Ballard. Is Miss Ballard still here? Okay. All right, I will push forward. Um, there she is. Okay, they won't tell you. Oh. Thank you for your advocacy, Ms. Ballard. Um, for you, I know you represent a, a number of people that are joined with you to, to say what you need in, in the space there. Um, we are noting those concerns. Um, I did want to know, did you, did you or can you, uh, send us something so we can document it because I wrote down some of the things you all said you needed. Um, and one of the things I heard you talk about was a culinary culinary program. Yes, yes. yes. Um, I did hear arts and crafts. I did hear lightweights, a games yeah. instructor. I took some of yeah. those notes, but if we can get something formal and right, it'd be helpful to us as we communicate that in our letter to Mayor Bowser. Okay. okay. And our committee email, I'll put in the chat, but it's R Y A at DC Council.gov. I'll put it in the chat as well.
And I also know uh, the leaders and Director Hunter, his staff are also in attendance as well. So we want to note and be accurate with some of those requests from the community that we need to maybe make adjustments to or reprogram to ensure that we are addressing the needs, especially of our seniors and our young adults here in the district. Um, I did have another question for you. Um, when, when you say games instructor, what does that entail? Well, parents, we like to play games oh, with our hands, do exercises, stress our muscles. The hands are very important to elderly. Okay. And I, and I know I heard someone, I think I heard uh, someone say you are meeting there three days a week. Yes. Will this take place during that time or is there some desire uh, different times? This is, yes, yes, yes. different All right. times. All right, just wanted to get some clarity for our notes here. Our um, schedule time is uh, 12 to three. But if we have uh, other commitments, other things to do, we come in earlier, or maybe a tent. Okay, thank you. And thank you for all those who are advocating um, today. All right. Next we have on the panel, Tammy Gordon, Scott Parker, I don't see you. Uh, Commissioner Gordon, but I see Scott Parker. Go right ahead, uh, Scott. Good afternoon, Chairman White. Uh, my name is Scott Parker, as you said. I am the Managing Director of Washington, D.C. Pickleball. It's a, a not-for-profit 501c3 organization that includes over 500 D.C. resident pickleball players uh, and whose sole purpose is to grow pickleball and to develop player skills in the district. Uh, all the directors, including myself, are unpaid volunteers. And uh, we, uh, we work with, closely with, uh, with DPR. Um, pickleball is one of those things that sort of crops up all over the place now, news articles, videos, et cetera, uh, which seems like it came out of the dark instantaneously. But in fact, it was developed in the 1960s and it's really only been in the last 10 years that it's begun to take off in, in the District of Columbia, particularly in the last uh, three to four years. Um, what's important here is just a couple of things I'll mention. One is that uh, it's, although it's a racket sport, uh, the court on which we play is about half the size of a tennis court. Uh, and therefore the game is a lot easier to learn and it's a lot easier to play than traditional tennis, uh, but there's obviously a lot of good exercise involved and it's one of the reasons why it attracts uh, so many people. Uh, secondly, uh, typically four players play doubles using solid paddles and a, what looks like a plastic ball. Um, it's become very popular among adults as a fun game, particularly in, in DC. And more recently, uh, for players of uh, all levels, meaning skill levels and, and ages. So the second thing that's important about it is that it offers a denser court space utilization. We can get more people involved in pickleball uh, in a smaller area because of the nature of, uh, of it. Um, we started in, uh, in the senior games, as they were then called, in May 2014 and repeated it in 2015. At that point, uh, there were seven of us who were experienced players, obviously playing somewhere else because there was no pickleball in DC then, uh, to volunteer to begin a program in collaboration with, with DPR. And so in September of 2015, uh, we started at three indoor facilities around the city uh, in conjunction with the Department of Parks and Recreation. Um, by the spring of 2018, we had 150 
players who had been introduced to pickleball and by the end of 100 uh, the end of 2019 there were about 150 players uh, across the across the city so a lot early growth in those years was rapid in percentage terms it was still relatively small and at that time if you think back to the pre-pandemic period uh, there weren't there wasn't really the kind of discussion about pickleball that's uh, that's occurred recently um, that changed a lot with the pandemic and it changed for one very significant reason all of the sports were locked out of the dpr facilities when the pandemic hit uh, but when we were able to go back and resume playing in june of 2020 uh, it was the first time that we really played pickleball in dc outdoors and that acted as a tremendous spur to our, our growth. Um, and so uh, working closely with uh, Andrew Quadro, who is oversees the DPR tennis and pickleball programs, pickleball has grown 65% a year over the last three years. We now have programs and open play sessions at 14 locations, and there are approximately 26 different programs at those 14 uh, locations. Not all the wards are equally covered, which is one of the things that we'd certainly like to see. Uh, and currently we have nearly a thousand players in DC. So quite a significant uptick since the 150 I mentioned who are actively playing in late 20, 2019. Um, we and DPR expect that number of players to probably grow at the same rate um certainly the recent evidence indicates that that would put us at about 2000 players in dc by the end of 2024 thank so, you so actually you uh, wrap up because you're two minutes over your time you can land a plane that'd be helpful okay i thought i had five minutes i'm sorry it was five minutes five minutes 13 seconds ah okay good for you <laughs> um the, I think that the primary thing that I wanted to convey was the fact that um, the, the the staff group in DPR that services both tennis and pickleball is two people. Uh, in order to accommodate the current growth and the projective growth, we'd really like to see that staff probably doubled, and we'd like to see somebody associated with that to uh, to take over responsibility directly for uh, for pickleball you'll hear from some of my other colleagues uh later in the in the day uh but i think that's the primary things that i wanted to get across right now thanks thank you and i know that several people have mentioned you and your expertise in this field and we look forward to uh asking a few questions um during this panel so st uh, stand by absolutely okay Is Wayne Savage here? Um, I don't see anybody from this panel elevated. Uh, Wayne Savage, Rob Whiteside. Musin Umar, my seniors keeper foundation. Sharad Wade, my seniors keeper foundation. Brittany Wade, my seniors keeper foundation. Um, Wallace Kirby, my senior keeper foundation. We can elevate those. Uh, while we while they have been elevated, uh, Wayne, if you can jump on from Dark Sky Association, let me go to you, Mr. Whiteside. Hi, right, is it my turn? Uh, Rob, uh, Wayne, I'm sorry, yeah, Wayne Savage, then you. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Mr. Savage, are you ready? Sorry, uh, thank you, Chairperson White. Uh, my name is Wayne Savage. Beginning in December 2021, I represented the DC chapter of the Sierra Club in an ongoing dialogue with DPR concerning light pollution. Are you able to cut on your screen, Mr. Savage? There we go. There we go, okay, thanks. Um, 
Beginning in December 2021, I represented the DC chapter of the Sierra Club in an ongoing dialogue with DPR concerning light pollution at city parks. Our dialogue included the DC Environmental Network, City Wildlife, and the International Dark Sky Association. We approached DPR because the agency lacked any established policy to address excessive or unnecessary outdoor light. We knew of instances, for example, of field lights and tennis court lights that remained on for hours at a time when those facilities were not in use. Our concerns were rooted in research showing that artificial light at night has a powerful impact on the environment and human health. Excessive lighting wastes taxpayers' money and contributes to climate change. The American Medical Association has warned that pervasive use of nighttime lighting disrupts our circadian sleep-wake cycle and creates potentially harmful health effects. A recent study found that neighborhoods with higher proportions of Black, Latino, and Asian residents and renter occupants are exposed to more light pollution. And some researchers have even suggested that light pollution may be a factor in health inequities. Artificial outdoor light at night also disrupts wildlife behavior, including reproduction and migration. Our interlocutors at DPR were open to a robust and productive discussion. And earlier this month, they finalized guidelines for the design and use of outdoor lighting. These include fully shielded fixtures to reduce glare, light that is no brighter than necessary, and motion sensors or dimmers to reduce or shut off lights when facilities are not in use. Nighttime lighting is essential for safety and security, of course, and DPR's new guidelines recognize these needs by incorporating light levels recommended by the Illuminating Engineering Society of North America. For their work on the new guidelines, I'd like to thank Peter Norden and Brent Sisko in DPR's Capital Projects Division and Chris Dyer, the Community Engagement Manager who facilitated our dialogue. DPR's lighting guidelines will have their greatest impact on the design of new facilities. A remaining challenge is bringing existing lights into compliance. And Sierra Club urges the DC Council to provide funding to address the necessary retrofitting. Thank you for the opportunity to address the committee. Thank you. Now, uh, Mr. Rob Whiteside. Hello. All right. Um, first of all, thank you very much for including me in the conversation today, Chairman White, Director Hunter. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to talk about um, DC Panthers Youth Water Polo. So I'm one of the five founders of the DC Panthers Water Polo uh, Program that we started officially last year. Uh, we were founded by five locally based DC Water Polo Masters players. Uh, we all come from diverse backgrounds and in pretty much every regard. Uh, our experience levels vary from high school to college to national and professional teams as well. We're a nonprofit organization uh, and we're currently uh, a staff that is really contributing on a, on a purely volunteer basis. So all of our uh, coaches, our uh, operators, our coordinators are all volunteers. And really just what binds us is, is the love of this game. I'll talk a little bit more about what is water polo for those who are uh, not as familiar? The primary mission of our program for the Panthers is really to increase aquatics involvement uh, from across the diverse communities of DC. Aquatics, as some of you may know in the US has a documented history of racism and the impacts are still felt today uh, from that systemic racism over generations. In one recent CDC study, Black children between ages of five and 19 are over five times more likely to drown in swimming pools than their white counterparts. Uh, so it is a really important situation. But also, it's just an extraordinary game um, that is not as popular across the US as, as it is in some other countries. Uh, a lot of people get exposed to it during the Olympics. Uh, otherwise, they're not seeing it on a regular basis. As an organization, uh, besides our extremely uh, valuable and indispensable partnership with DPR. We're proud to have the full backing of USA Water Polo, um, who is actually providing us a grant shortly so that all of our players can become members of USA Water Polo. Um, that is the national governing organization of the sport. 
As well, we really enjoy the support of an essential partner, Fight for Children, a locally based nonprofit organization with whom we align on using sports to improve and transform the lives of underserved youth. Uh, water, a few facts about the game. Water polo is the oldest Olympic team sport. Uh, it's played in all deep water, so you really never touch the bottom. Uh, the goals are shaped kind of like those in soccer. And the skills you use are those you find in basketball, baseball, soccer, and wrestling. Uh, it's known as one of the most demanding sports out there, though nothing like boxing, I'll admit. Uh, and it teaches really powerful lessons in teamwork, communication, grit, and resilience. And of course, teaches a lot of deep water confidence. Um, after something of a soft launch last summer, uh, our program has grown remarkably from the Dean Wood pool, which has really been our home base. Uh, we're now adding the Tacoma pool this spring, and we're going from uh, 25 total registered kids at the Dean Wood Aquatic Center uh, to 50 total across the two different pools. The participants so far have been a diverse set of kids between the ages of nine and 16, uh, diverse in race and ethnicity, and both boys and, and girls are playing. So we're really excited about moving to that next phase of uh, our program and really hopefully expanding to uh, more and more pools across DC with the help of DPR. Uh, DPR has really just been an extraordinary partner. I'll, I'll call out both uh, Tyson Smith and Marissa Gentry as just extraordinary day-to-day uh, -day partner contacts there. Uh, if there's one ask that we have of DC and DPR, it's just more promotion within the community, just to let more families, more kids know uh, about this program. Everybody who's been participating so far has really been enjoying it. So I think it's been a great success uh, just over the past nine months of activity. Got it. And thank you. Um, next, we have Mushin Uma. I don't see. He, he won't be on here. I'm going to be representing for um, our organization. Okay. Miss. Yes. Also, Wallace and Sherrod Wade, I'll be taking over for them. Okay, so go right ahead. Okay. <clears throat> Good afternoon, uh, Member White and the fellow witnesses and testifying with the panel. I'm Brittany Wade, a homeschool mom of five, an Air Force veteran, and War 7 stakeholder and program programming coordinator for my Seniors Keeper Foundation and the integrated and an integrational community-based organization that provides agriculture and STEAM-based programming from H for H2H, Apply Research Garden located on Dick Street Northeast. I'd like to start by acknowledging a few amazing DPR staffers that have provided exceptional service to the district. Ms. Alice Cooper for an amazing service coordinating volunteers for special events and programs. Ms. Courtney Williams, for the com commitment to youth development and empowering young ladies in her role as a DPR staffer. And Ms. Asia Belt for wonderful community engagement and being a pillar of consistency for DPR. DPR has a vast network and environmental partners that are providing a diverse array of services across the city, which will be this evening's Black Growers Conference at the Arboretum Rec. Um, center from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. I love to network with you that uh, I would love to ne network with you there about community and agricultural matters. With this, it's grants, with its grants, grant making authority and funding allocated under the rent for all, DPR has an opportunity to ensure district youth are exposed to a diverse array of recreational offerings, including environmental, agriculture, and STEAM-based programming, which is a great opportunity to endorse youth to the exciting adventures awaiting them throughout the city and across the DMV region. I'll be observing how, to, how the allocated funding will assist the agency in fulfilling its mission of providing adequate, adequate access to gold standard recreation program services and facilities across all wards, especially Ward 7. As a Ward 7 stakeholder, the community requests transparency into the protocol for utilizing the Marvin Gray Recreational Center, particularly the kitchen, as well as the DPR facilities. We need to have the information board replaced with a LED board to share, to share programming updates with the community Lastly, the Dick Street Garden is operable year round. We are in need of having the water turned on year round as the pipes in our community are less than five years old. 
the COVID waiver when registering for programming needs to be revised, unless, of course, the city is claiming that unvaccinated citizens cannot participate in DPR program. What is the agency's stance on these matters? And I know that was a mouthful. I just wanted to make sure I got everything in that I needed to get in. Yeah, that's you. Uh, um, and to my understanding, you are the only one that's going to be speaking for the My Keepers Foundation, correct? All right. Cool. Let me see. All right, so I'll jump back um, up. So, Mr. Parker. Yes, sir. Yeah, what what areas is is pickleball uh operated or practiced or, or the games? What areas are they in as far as recreation centers currently? Uh the centers are uh Arthur Capper, uh Sherwood, um Rosedale, Turkey Thicket, Hillcrest, Palisades, uh, Tacoma, Emory Heights, Chevy Chase Community Center, Hearst, and uh, Friendship Park. Uh, most of us know it as Turtle Park, but now called Friendship. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Oh, North Michigan Park would be another one. And how do? What's the process you go through to reserve these fields? We work with uh, Andrew Quadro um, to try to identify those that are close to pockets of existing player communities or where we want to open uh, a new uh, center. So one that I didn't mention would be an example of, of opening a new center to sort of service one that's crowded is Edgewood. Um, and Edgewood is very close to Turkey Thicket. Turkey Thicket is very crowded with the uh, players, and we were able to work with Andrew and the site supervisors in order to open uh, Edgewood. Another one in that same area uh, that we opened just this fall is, uh, is the North Michigan Park, and that was to offer uh, evening play, uh, particularly relevant, obviously, to players who uh, are still working uh, full time. So what is the need? It sounds like you all are at 13 locations. If you can clarify me what the, what the need is uh, outside of like youth uh, football, I don't know many other organizations utilizing 13 facilities. What is the now need now? Because I heard you say you went from, I guess, uh, in 2014 to pretty no operation to now includes 500 residents. Uh, break down that to me. Well, now it's uh, now it's about a thousand. My master list has eight hundred and sixty five players. I don't have full coverage at uh, another one I didn't mention, Jefferson. Um, and uh, that's another pocket of, of players down there in in uh, in in Southwest. Uh, the answer to your question, though, is that primarily we get um, just reserved hours at a number of all of these locations. And the reason for that is that we're sharing them with other uh, with other sports, most notably tennis, which is also under Andrew Quadro's sort of umbrella responsibility. Um, and uh, we're trying to spread the availability of pickleball around the city to different wards, to different locations, which is why I mentioned all the ones I just I get gave to you. But in almost all of those locations. There's a limited amount of time and or uh, courts on which we can play. So 
Turkey Thicket is probably the best example of that, where there are four dedicated pickleball courts next to six tennis courts. We don't have access to hybrid use of the tennis courts except for about two hours a week. So there are approximately 110 players who uh, try to play at, uh, at Turkey Thicket. And they typically will come in the evenings on weekends because that tends to be a, a younger uh, population of people that are typically working during the normal work week. What, what, are, what are the, uh, the, the ages and demographics of those playing? Uh, well, it, it depends on where you're asking the question, I suppose. Yep. In Northwest, it tends to be uh, an older community. Um, so most what's of your, what's us... What's your definition are, of older? Like, give me the age. About 50, seniors. Okay, seniors, okay. Seniors, right. Uh, whereas if I go to Turkey Thicket, North Michigan Park, uh, those kinds of facilities, Edge would be another, it probably drops down to the 30s. Okay. Um, and in terms of ethnicity, um, race, uh, it's all over the map. Um, it's a pretty are these, wide are, are these teams Are these teams just recruiting other people to join their team to compete against each other? And also, I guess my question, my last question is, does anything have to be is, – is do you have to set up something to compete? Is there a setup process for those who are not necessarily pickleball courts? Uh, the answer to that question is in most of the areas where we play, whether it's indoors or outdoors, we have to set up uh, portable uh, pickleball nets in order to be able to play. Um, in Around the city, there are only eight dedicated pickleball courts, four of them at Turkey Thicket, two of them at Tacoma, and uh, two of them at King Greenleaf, which I guess is the last one I didn't mention. Um, so most of the time, yes, we do have to set up portable nets in order to be able to, to play pickleball. That also means we have to have storage. Uh, we've contributed uh, storage bins with locks in order to do that uh, throughout most of the areas of the city. Got it. I got to speed up uh, to Mr. Whiteside. Uh, how do you advertise and bring awareness to your programs and what ages do you target? Uh, yeah, good, good questions. So the age range right now of our program is nine to 16. Um, the promotional approaches so far is we've had some flyers up at different, uh, aquatic facilities, which has had some success. I've tried some Facebook advertising, which actually was not successful. Um, one of the most successful, impactful things we had was when DPR put out a press release in November and, uh, our enrollment jumped, um, pretty much overnight. So the, the voice and the, of DPR and the channels of DPR are one of the most successful so far. I'd say our dream has been able to like get the word, even if it's just like a flyer into uh, the community schools as well, just so kids in this age range can just be familiar with it. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I did get a note from my staff. Is you targeting kids? It says you should target Instagram and TikTok. Um, most kids don't look at Facebook anymore. Okay. Yeah, we're trying to actually reach the parents, right? So the parents are the ones making the decision or, you know, sort of deciding whether or not to enroll the kids or not. So I was thinking parents, uh, but that's a fair point. You know, maybe trying to um, get the idea of the sport in front of the kids is a good idea as well. Got it. Thank you, Dr. Hoskins. Uh, I want to jump to you, Miss Wade. Yes, 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 yes. Um, have you been able to use the kitchen at Marvin Gaye? No, we haven't. Okay. And what are the barriers to that? So the bar first, the barriers are um, we have to make um, what does it go through a process of you know making sure you know the website. And, you know, finding out if the times are available. And a lot of the times the slots are taken up. But when you go into the facility, there are no cooking classes being offered. That's a reoccurring thing that I keep hearing. Um, not just this, but a number of sites. Because there's plenty, like our organization would love to use that space. Um, my husband and I, we also hosted a co-op last summer 
where we wanted to use that space to teach kids in the community, you know, nutrition and, you know, how to, to feed their bodies well. We weren't able to occupy that space. And again, this upcoming year, we are not able to occupy that space as well through our nonprofit. Okay. We uh, asked about that when our questions to the director, if we have enough time, we're going to thank you guys for testifying today. We appreciate your, your voice and your advocacy. We're going to go to uh, the next panel, ANC Commissioner Alejandro Pedro. You can start elevating these to the panel. Dolores Bouchon. Allison Clausen, Chester Harrison, for those who don't know where we are, we are, are at number 42. Rachel Clark, GW School of Public Health. Marcia Lee. Uh, Commissioner Pedro, you can go ahead and start. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. I'm Alexander Pondro, president of the Friends of Kennedy Playground, a 501c3 nonprofit organization that supports and advocates on behalf of the Kennedy Recreation Center in Shaw. Friends formed in the 1980s and have been a DC nonprofit since 1996. The Kennedy Rec Center is a critical community asset serving Shaw residents of all ages. The current building, completed in 2003, has had a $1 million renovation project in the works for several years, which is supposed to finally begin this year. But as a result of consistent communication failures on the part of the Department of Parks and Recreation, our community is confused about what exactly will be undertaken as part of the renovation and when the center will be closed to allow the construction work to take place. This failure is to communicate with the community is a systemic problem that has been a significant obstacle to the full utilization of the center by the community since the Roaming Leaders Program took over management responsibility for Kennedy several years ago. Councilmember Allen secured funding for the renovation in FY 2020 with the understanding that one of the principal changes that would be made to the center's building was the removal of a wall in order to expand the senior program room. This was necessary in order to allow the large population of senior citizens that live in proximity to the center to take advantage of the senior programming offered at the center. Other improvements were also to be made at the facility. But over the course of the succeeding years, the friends have repeatedly asked DPR for the plans for the renovation so that we could keep the community informed of what would be happening at Kennedy and when, only to be repeatedly told that the project schedule had been shifted to a future fiscal year. Along the way, the facility moved from Ward 6 to Ward 2 in the redistricting process following the 2020 U.S. Census. When we asked Ward 6 Council Members Office and then Ward 2 Council Members Office's staff to assist us in getting the information from DPR, they likewise were unable to get detailed information on the proposed renovations. At long last, a DPR representative attended the Friends meeting on January 9th, 2023, and recited a number of items that were to be included in the renovation project but the senior program room expansion was not included on the list. We requested and were assured that we would receive a detailed scope of work for the project the following week. Despite the follow following up with DPR, we still have not received these documents. Furthermore, the representative informed us that the start date for the renovation project was gonna be pushed to fall 2023 in order to ensure the community's youth would have access to the center during the summer of 2023. Earlier this month, in response to rumors circulating in the community that the Kennedy Rec Center would be closing at the end of February 2023 for renovations, the Friends asked Councilmember Pinto's office to get answers from DPR. We were provided the one paragraph project description from the DGS website, which indicated the project would begin in spring 2023 and end in fall 2023. Sadly, DPR's inability to clearly <coughs> communicate with our community is nothing new. Events take place at Kennedy that the community gets no advance notice of, and indeed, we often find out about them only after they have taken place. I'm the chair of the Advisory Neighborhood Commission for the area where the center is located, and I do not receive any notices of upcoming events from DPR, nor does the single member district commissioner where the center is located receive any information on upcoming events. When we ask DPR why this happens, we're told that DPR only uses social media to promote their events. Council member, I doubt I need to tell you that the vast majority of 
children and seniors that use the Kennedy Rec Center and those that should be attending events there don't use social media. When the friends have offered to assist DPR with disseminating printed information about upcoming events and programs at Kennedy, our offers are never active. We have offered for years to print a calendar of events and distribute it to the several high-rise apartment buildings adjacent to Kennedy. And again, I've been repeatedly rebuffed. The only calendar that is available is cryptic with no descriptions of the programs, only titles, days, times, locations, and age ranges. Not the information that is needed by patrons to determine whether programs are of interest. The status quo where the roving leaders and DPR treat the Shaw community with disrespect and disdain must come to an end. This lack of communication was never a problem when Kennedy had a dedicated staff on site whose only responsibility was serving the needs of the Shaw community. If the roving leaders don't have the manpower or the mandate to actively engage and communicate with Shaw residents, then we don't need to have them in charge of Kennedy. The roving leaders experiment at Kennedy has been a failure. A manager charged with responding to and addressing the needs of the community should be appointed along with the necessary staff to operate the center and its programs, as was the case before the introduction of the roving leaders of Kennedy. We need assurances that the expanded senior program room is part of the Kennedy renovation project as previously promised. And can we please get a schedule of when the Kennedy Rec Center will be closed so that we can advise the community. DPR is incapable of communicating with our community. The friends in the ANC can get the job done. Thank you for the opportunity to share our concerns with you. I'm available to answer any questions we may have now or after the end. Thank you, Commissioner. Let me scroll back up. Okay. Dolores Bouchon. <clears throat> okay. Dolores. I saw you unmute, but went back to mute. If you can cut your screen on and your mic and begin. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, yes Hello? I can hear you. I can't see you, but I can hear you. Yes. Okay, well, thank you. I would like to be able to, okay, let's see if we can start the video. There. Yep, I can see you. There we go. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon. My name is Dolores Bushong, and I live on Hamlin Street Northeast, uh, across the street from Langdon Park, where I've lived for the last 30 years. Excessive lighting is a concern in DPR parks. Even though parks close at dusk, lights on buildings and poles are on full power all night, polluting the night sky, negatively affecting humans, migratory birds, mammals, and insects. The wasted energy adds to our carbon footprint and takes money from taxpayers' pockets. In 2017, DDOT was preparing to convert all street lights to LED. I was appointed by the mayor to the street light advisory panel to share citizens' concerns and research about this conversion. With our input, I am happy to say that the LED street lights selected are at an acceptable level in both Kelvin and Lumen levels. I wanted to share what I had learned as a member of the street light advisory panel with DPR so they could understand the negative impact of the Kelvin and Lumen levels and parks on humans, wildlife, the night sky, and also the costs involved. With the combined effort of several organizations, DC Environmental Network, um, DC uh, Sierra Club, City Wildlife, International Dark Sky Association, DC Chapter, we were able to work with DPR staff in a very constructive manner for nearly a year and a half in regular meetings where we shared data about LED lighting. We asked them to develop deep PR lighting guidelines that reflected recommendations from Illuminating Engineering Society, IES, and International Dark Sky Association, IDA. Peter Nordgren, Brent Sisko, who are Capital Projects Planning and Design, and Chris Dyer, Communication Engagement Manager, were open to discussing our suggestions. We want to thank them for the time they spent reading the materials we sent to them, their willingness to consider ways to bring lighting levels in line with IES and IDA principles and for developing NPR, DPR lighting guidelines for all new projects that use dimming and motion detectors. We came to agreement with the final wording just a few weeks ago. We really want to thank them. DPR still has a way to go to make the parts compliant with IES and IDA principles, 
because many of the older lights don't have smart technology. So lights have to be either on or off, not just dim or a motion to sensor. You might even have dimming in your own house. I suggest that DPR set a goal of converting these existing park lights with the technology to dim lights and install lower Kelvin lights at 2200 level, which is what our, uh, our HPS system is now, as indicated as the preferred level in the new DPR lighting guidelines for new projects. Choosing several parks within each ward to begin this work would be a good place to start and would be fair to all the wards. Conversion of the lighting in the entire system may not be possible all at once, but a scheduled conversion park by park over several years should be possible. Please budget accordingly. And thank you, Chairperson. Thank you. Next we have Allison Clausen. I don't see Ms. Clausen. Chester Harrison. Okay. I do see Rachel Clark, GW School of Public Health. Um, good afternoon, Chairperson White, members and staff. Um, I'm Rachel Clark. I'm the policy director at the Redstone Center at the GW School of Public Health. We applaud DPR's goal in its ready to play plan to establish a unified and equitable park system as a key public health priority for the district. But as we've heard earlier, DPR faces a unique barrier when it's trying to improve the overall park system. It only controls 10% of the parkland in DC with the remaining belonging to the National Park Service. Recognizing this as a foundational problem, our center embarked on a year-long research project to better understand how NPS ownership affects DC's park system. We spoke to dozens of local residents and organizations in this effort and are finalizing a report that we expect to publish this spring. I'm here today to share a preview of our findings. Several key challenges emerge from our research. First, NPS's land preservation mission is a poor fit for managing urban parks. NPS's priorities often conflict with the needs and preferences of DC residents. Second, control of the district's green space is divided between six NPS units, several district agencies, and other federal agencies, which creates jurisdictional confusion for policymakers and residents alike. Third, with billions of dollars in deferred maintenance costs, NPS does not have adequate funding to maintain its assets in DC. Funding gaps drive inequities across the park system. For example, NPS receives nearly 100 times more funding per acre in its budget for the National Mall than for its parks east of the river. In addition, NPS relies heavily on outside support for its parks, which means that better resourced neighborhoods are more able to access supplemental funding, dri further driving inequity. Fourth, because the district and NPS share control of the district's green space, there is no central leadership and vision overseeing the overall park system. At the same time, there's no regular coordination between NPS and the district government regarding parks management. Fifth, NPS is not set up to be responsive to DC residents. NPS has no central user-friendly system for connecting with residents and it is not integrated into the 311 system. NPS is also not accountable to DC residents or its elected officials. Um, even though they manage 90% of our parkland, this committee can't make them come in for a hearing. Finally, NPS's permitting and partnership processes are overly burdensome, making it very difficult for DC residents to use park, their parks for desired programming. Because of these challenges, we find the district should take control of more of its parks. While some of our recommendations would require action by NPS or Congress, we identified several actions that DPR can take to address these challenges and to prepare for a future in which it directly controls more parks. First, it should establish an office of parks within DPR that is focused on managing the district's interests in NPS land and expanding the district's parks management capacity as distinct from its recreational facilities. Second, it should establish a parks advisory board to serve as a coordinating body for relevant local and federal agencies and organizations and provide long-term direction for the park system. Third, it should establish a parks equity conservancy to leverage district funding and philanthropic contributions to support stewardship and improvements across the entire park system, particularly in historically neglected neighborhoods. 
In addition, DC and NPS should work together to prepare a joint action plan that is specifically focused on future management of NPS land, including identifying lands appropriate for administrative transfers of jurisdiction, cooperative management agreements, and joint maintenance. This is consistent with the earlier testimony of Commissioner Licatos. Second, establish a shared database to consolidate information on federal and local parks to inform coordination between the two jurisdictions and to facilitate greater transparency with the public. Third, develop a coordinated approach to handling service requests, preferably by integrating NPS into 311. And finally, establish one permitting system for all parks and facilities. We believe these recommendations will help the district realize the full potential of its park system, and we look forward to sharing the full report with this committee once it's released. Be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Um, Marcia Lee. Thank you. Hello. Good afternoon, Councilman White. Good afternoon, all the esteemed panel, Parks and Vex um, people and all the guests on. Let me start by let me start by being positive. Um, I like to um the young people are doing some phenomenal things. And and Supreme Teams, thank you so much for having them on spotlight that, because that's important because it's it stars, it stars at you. So thank you so much for that. So I want to really talk about the good things about DPR. DPR was getting everybody fit. They have really great programs. I love um, Fit DC. I take advantage of everything. I'm a fourth generation Washingtonian. I'm a 30 year resident of Ward 5. But I'm finding some things that are disillusioning because while I was waiting to get on the panel, I'm looking at the upcoming aquatic schedule um, that's going to be coming up for classes starting um, the week after. It is no. Um, Aquatics class, no shower water east of the river, except for on Saturday morning. Um, it's only one yoga class east of the river, but it's only on Saturday. So Saturdays don't work for me. But overall, um, overall the programming is good for what I can get into. It's good. But my concern is I've talked to my neighbors who want to do the on my senior neighbors that want to do the classes, and many of them are not digital literate. So I know everything is literate. I mean, everything is on online now, but it's good for people who know, but it's some people who, who don't know. Some people are not going to embrace digital literacy, period. They just, they just not. So would there be any way that they can like do, maybe do it in person or, you know, set up a time they could do it or by phone or whatever. I mean, I don't know, maybe for people who are not really digital literate. Um, and I live in Fort Lincoln. And I also wanted to talk about, everybody's talking about pickleball, but I just want to rec center her and be built and open because I have a I have a vehicle. So I go, you know how I many rec centers I go to to get any type of workout I want? I go to I go to three or four rec centers. I go to Romsey, I go to Daywood, you know, um, where else I, I one time I was going to Rosedale and I was going to Banica. <laughs> That's four rec centers. So I'm going, you know, I'm going in all quadrants of the city to take class that should be somewhere in my community at night because all seniors, all seniors are not retired and all seniors cannot take classes during the day. Um, what else wanted to talk about? Oh, class pricing. I don't have a problem with, with, with taking a hit, but let people know when the, when the prices are going to increase and why the prices are increasing. Because it seems like every time I sign up, you know, the prices go up and up and up, but just put there will be a price increase, and this is why. Because you're just going to keep throwing, you know, keep throwing stuff in there. It's just, that's just, that was just an, an issue in mind. And Fort Lincoln Park, can y'all start giving it, can y'all give it to the trash cans? Because everybody think I, 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 I can use just a dumping ground, and it's not. We like cleanliness, too. And no, we're not in War Three, but we like nice things as well. So I'm going to occur with my War Seven and Eight relatives. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Next we have Rally Danikio. I don't think I called them for this panel. So if they're here, bring them in and I'll start back with um, questions for this panel. Um, Mr. Padro. Yes, sir. One second.
Uh, I, will send you, I will send you a copy of my written testimony. Please, oh. that'll be helpful for those other members who are uh, not here. I see Councilman Janice Lewis George is between this hearing, other hearings as well. So she's listening in. Um, I, I am here listening in. Thank you. Uh, I see that there was a, you know that there was a, a million dollars in the works for Kennedy Rec. Uh, can you give, when, when was that money allocated? Uh, and what was it allocated for? My recollection is that it was in 2020. Uh, Councilmember Allen, uh, you know, got that into the budget when it, uh, our area was still in Ward Six before the redistricting. And uh, there were a number of uh, of uh, improvements that were supposed to be made to to the center, including improvements to the kitchen, to the computer lab. Uh, but the the one issue that uh, was most pressing was the expansion of the senior program room. So currently the senior program room is, is rather small and there was an adjacent office that was not being used. So the proposal was to take down the wall, which was not load bearing uh, between the senior room and that office in order to expand it to have more room uh, you know, for the seniors to be able to have programs. So, um, so uh, but uh, more recently, uh, what's on the DGS website doesn't include the, the senior program room uh, you know, changes. And includes a, the, the the construction of a loading dock, which was never discussed with the community. So uh, we're very concerned that uh, what was intended to create additional space for programming uh, for, uh, for the center's users is ending up uh, being used potentially uh, for you know administrative purposes. Uh, that's why I think it's critical in terms of oversight for for your committee and as well as uh, the community to actually get a copy of the actual plans. The DPR has uh, for these renovations, so that uh, if necessary, we can make changes to it while we still have time to do that before they actually begin construction. Got it. Um, and I'm, I'm, <clears throat> I just asked my staff to add those to our questions for DGS as well. Um, and the schedule, of course, is is critical. So we we're we're being told that the building may be closing this month, and we have no information about that. DGS's website says spring, but uh, when we had a representative from DPR come to the friends meeting uh, in January, he told us that everything was being pushed off to the fall, so that uh, the center would be open uh, for youth to be able to use during the summer. What's the answer? We can't get a straight answer. Council members' office can't get a straight answer either. I got it. Um, Miss Lee, I did want to ask your suggestions. Um, for best reaching seniors, I heard you say there's a uh, a digital divide for those who are not. I guess computer literate or tech savvy. <laughs> yeah, so my suggestion is, you know, since I live in Fort Lincoln, I mean, in and around the city, when you're going out, you should have a different events. Also have paper copies, you know, just have paper copies. Not only do you need to have paper copies of literature, but have it in a big enough font so people can actually see it. Because <laughs> we're not only talking about, you know, that, but we're talking about people maybe that have vision issues. Um, councilman, and then also maybe you can have a representative come to like a central place and do a registration. Just allow some spaces, you know, come to the senior buildings in Fort Lincoln, you know, come to one location, like different parts where seniors are, do a registration, you know, they can pay, take it back. That's just my suggestion for the time being. But if I think any more, I'd be happy to send them to you. <laughs> Got it. Um, <clears throat> I want to jump to you, Ms. Bouchon. Yes. Uh, I yes. do think that D I do know that DC has started converting um, street lights program. I, I, I only know because I've seen the RFP go out and get awarded and I don't know where they are in that phase. Um, but I heard you say that they are. I didn't know if you say they are acceptable or uh, unacceptable. I, I, you were talking. They are. Yeah, they are. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, they are acceptable. They worked with us for probably two and a half years and got a lot of feedback and input. And it was uh, about eight of us on that committee. They have been delayed and actually 
putting starting the conversion. I just spoke to someone in DDOT last week to ask them if it has started yet. The a contract has been awarded, but yes, we do. Those of us who were on the committee did did support what they came to, which is why I was involved in the parks because I felt like if you look at what a street light is on a residential street and then what it is in an alley that it should be slightly less in the parks because no one's in the parks at night and because of the habitat that it provides for other, other animals. So I wanna say that DPR worked very, very closely with us. It's just, they don't have a lot of the um, technology for most of what's in the parks. And so for, I'm gonna give you an example for Langdon Park. So the pole lights on the pool deck are necessary in the summer. They're always necessary. So I'm never saying that lights are not necessary but they could be dimmed, particularly during the winter and would save an incredible amount of money for the district. Plus it would be healthier for humans, for animals, for insects, for pollinators, for everyone. For migratory birds who come to our parks as they head from south to north and north to south because they fly at night. And so they're very disoriented by those very large lights. Thank you for that. Um... Thank you. So, so you said that when you spoke to them, they said that they are delayed. So did they say they did not start yet? In DDOT, no, they haven't started yet because they, this is what they told me in DDOT is that they have not, the company that got the contract didn't actually have the lights and they're under a very strict guideline that once they put the lights up, if there is a problem with it, they get fined a lot if they don't have a replacement to go in immediately and they don't have those lights yet. So they've not started putting them in yet. So they're behind schedule because they were supposed to start uh, by the end of last year and they didn't start yet. Got it. Thank you. All right. I heard you also say that residents um, are concerned about the lights being too bright and affecting, I guess you said, the birds and other uh, yes. animals. And I, and I also hear that there is issues with public safety and needing more lighting for people walking and being able to be visible and be seen in the dark. Uh, what is your rebuttal to that? Okay, so it's not really a rebuttal because I understand people's concern. I live across from Langdon Park. I've lived there for 30 years. I've seen a lot of different things happen. But what happens actually with our eyesight, and, and perhaps you've noticed this, if you step out into darkness and a bright light comes on, for a minute you can't see anything. So when you have really bright lights and then they end, this is also true with LEDs, and then you look outside of that light frame, you can't see anything and you're blinded. Where if it's more subdued light, your vision is able to adjust and you can see more clearly everything that's around you. So brighter lights, everybody, and actually there's been no research that shows that it actually prevents crime, but people feel safe. And so I understand that need for safety, which is why we're saying that if you lower lights, and research has shown, and if you lower than 50%, people don't notice until it goes below that 50% that all of a sudden it looks like not as bright. So I do hear what you're talking about and your concern. Yeah, I even know that... Um the attorney general's office has come in and mandated in certain areas that uh, DC give lighting to areas because there has been several incidents of violence occurring. Um, and so we have been trying to monitor what spaces and places get what lighting. <clears throat> and I, you're going in depth to talk about what uh, level of lighting. I haven't heard like the, the bright. Yeah, well, it, it's interesting because a lot of us, particularly with LEDs, that's a really big change from what we were used to with incandescence. And so what we're talking about when I said the Kelvin levels, you know, they're, these, they're called blue lights and those are brighter. And then we have more amber ones, which are the ones that had typically been used on our DC streets. We've had those since probably 1950. So what we're saying is that's been sufficient and it's healthier for us as humans because those bright lights really do uh, interfere with our circadian rhythms. Got it. Um, I gotta move on with this panel. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, 
Clark. Okay, I'll come back. Miss Clark. Um when you talk about transfer transferring oversight from NPS to DPR, uh, we've been in a conversation about this for a number of properties. Um I guess I want to know you know from you, do you uh do you know what it takes uh, as far as the legal process? We heard that from two panelists, and I know uh, that. Um, and do you know which, which parks east of river NPS controls? We've had this issue with auction run on a lot of different occasions, and there has been some transfers over the years, uh, depending on the administration and the relationship with the administration. Oxen run is a particularly um confusing one because Oxen Run, part of Oxen Run is DPR, but then Oxen Run Parkway is NPS and the boundary is a little bit unclear and has moved. Um, but for a transfer jurisdiction that which the um, commissioner uh, described can be, uh, the NPS retains the title, but DP, uh, DPR or whatever district agency takes it over um, has control over the site and that can be done without congressional action. It just requires an agreement between um, NPS and the district, which I believe right now the main body um, at the district that oversees that process is OFRA, um, the Office of Federal and Regional Affairs. Um, and the National Capital Planning Commission also um, signs off on the transfers. But our recommendation um, is that is similar to what was what was said before is that in the past these transfers had have happened on sort of an ad hoc basis community members ask for them or maybe council members um and what should really happen is dpr in its parks planning um should come up with a plan for all of the parks that should get transferred that nps really doesn't have the bandwidth to manage itself um and put together a one package to transfer them at once um and as for parks east of the river, um, in addition to Oxen Run Parkway, NPS manages most of the parks. Um, so, of course, Anacostia Park, uh, Shepherd Parkway, uh, the Fort Circle Parks that are east of the river, Fort DuPont Park, um, et cetera. Okay, got it. We're taking note and following up with that. Um, I did want to so thank you. Um, I, thank you, Dr. Hoskins. Um, I am trying to watch and listen into this public safety uh, interview with the chief speaking as well. But in that, uh, thank you, Dr. Hoskins. I did want to note that light study found um, that developments that received new lights experienced crime rates that were significantly lower uh, than have been the case without new lights. Among other findings, uh, there was a study concluded that increased lights, a uh, level of lights to a 30% in, um, attributed to a 36% reduction in crime and the, and the index crime uh, data, um, such as includes murders, robberies, aggravated assaults, as well as property crime. And we know, we know that there's a, a significant jump in the last three years um, that had that jumped in the last 20 years it relates to property crime and violent offenses. And so we just want to find a healthy balance in that. Thank you. I'm going to skip to the next panel. Thank you for that information, uh, Dr. Hoskins. Uh, that's helpful. I uh, have Raleigh Daniklo. Um, give me one second. Um, Tisa Kosla, Casey Trees, Andrea Tahami, DC Greens, Jaron Hill Lockridge, The Well at Auction Run, James Harris, DPR Boxing. And and Darren Thompson, East of the River Dog Park. Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Miss Riley. You've been waiting for a minute. I apologize, but you can go right ahead where everyone else kind of comes in the room. No worries. Thanks and uh, good afternoon, Councilmember White and members of the committee. I'm Riley Denalco, a policy analyst with DC Action, home of the DC Out of School Time Coalition. I'm testifying today about the role of DPR in providing high quality and affordable out of school time, also known as OST, 
opportunities for DC's young people and ways that DPR can improve its performance to increase equitable access to after school and summer activities. I won't spend time telling you how important OST programs are to DC's youth, as the young people did a great job of telling you themselves earlier in this hearing about how OST has been a key part of helping them, achieve, uh, helping them reach their potential. What I will do is echo their words and add that from a big picture perspective, the challenges facing youth today from mental health challenges to the lingering effects of interrupted learning to gun violence in their neighborhoods must be addressed with multi-tiered solutions that meet the scale of these issues. One part of this is robust OST investments. The new $3 million Recreation for All Community Grants are an exciting step toward expanding access to after school and summer activities for youth. DPR must ensure that these new funds are distributed equitably, efficiently, and transparently to organizations with a proven record of providing high quality programs and those that are trusted by the communities they aim to serve. And the agency should provide ongoing updates about which organizations are selected to receive the grant money, how they're spending it, and data about the young people who benefit from these programs. DPR must also ensure that new and existing funding is used to ensure that all families can participate in the OST offerings. Many parents have to travel long distances in order to access desired programs. DC PAVE parents, especially those east of the river, have reported having to drive nearly one hour away just to bring their, child, their children to programs that interest them. In PAVE's parent survey, 17% of parents identified transportation as a reason for not enrolling their child in a program, and 20% did not enroll them because they couldn't find a program that interested them. DPR should work to ensure that all of their program offerings are available in each of the eight wards and to scale up programming in neighborhoods with high concentrations of youth. Another common barrier parents face is the process of finding and enrolling children in desired programs. The competitive first come first serve registration process often disadvantages children who need programming the most. Parents who are working during the sign up process and those with limited internet access struggle to get spots in affordable programs that interest their children. One way to address this is to create, create a lottery system that provides preferences to, to, to students with the greatest needs. Lastly, with additional funding flowing into DPR to provide after school and summer programs, there must be more public data about the reach and impact of DPR programs, including information about participants' race and ethnicity, socioeconomic status, and whether they have special needs, along with any data DPR collects to demonstrate its impact of programs on youth outcomes. This data is crucial to evaluate the performance of DPR as a source of affordable and accessible OST opportunities. In my last few seconds, I'll also stress the need for better coordination between DPR and the Office of OST under the Deputy Mayor for Education, OSSE, and other DC education agencies. If we are to create universal access to OST for our young people, it will take collaboration across these agencies to set the strategy to get us there and make it a reality. Thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Kosla, Casey Trees. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm the digital developer at Casey Trees, and uh, I would like to start. Uh, Council Member White, Casey Trees is focused on restoring, enhancing, and protecting the DC tree canopy of the nation's capital. We're dedicated to helping the district meet its 40% tree canopy goal by 2032. DC is a leader in environmental protection and climate resilience, and we commend and support DPR in all its work to provide a green and healthy environment for all DC residents. Last year, we testified that the district lost 1% of its, t its canopy coverage between 2015 and 2020, even though year after year, we exceed our planting goals. This highlights the importance of reducing the loss of existing mature trees, as it takes years for a newly planted tree to compensate for that loss in tree canopy. As such, we have some ideas as to how DPR's programs can help better support our city's ecological and community resilience. First, we commend DPR on the recent Ready to Play plan. It's a thoughtful and comprehensive plan for managing our city's recreational assets over the coming years. In particular, we, we commend their strategy for advancing sustainability and environmental conservation on DPR lands by working in coordination with other agencies to develop a citywide natural resource management plan to protect, maintain, and enhance our natural lands. We would also ask DPR to prioritize the strategy as the health of our city's forests is in decline and in need of much for of more focused management. Invasive plants spread unchecked in our green spaces and forested natural areas 
and these areas are often utilized as dumping grounds. These problems can compound taking years off the life of our city's trees, stifling natural regeneration, decreasing biodiversity, and reducing the ecosystem services our forests provide. As important assets for the entire district, we must address the care of these natural areas just as we do for our recreational facilities. Otherwise, the buildup of trash, extensive spread of invasive plants, and other issues in these areas will compound. We would like to see an interagency working group, including DPR, address these needs. Casey Trees and our partners continue to encounter difficulties with management of natural areas and the support programs and grants through which we contribute to their upkeep. Trail maintenance, invasive management, and many other standard issues rely heavily, heavily on volunteer work. Additional dedicated park support staff that work alongside partners like Casey Trees would go a long way to ensure our parks get the care they need. This team could assist with natural area upkeep, the volunteer events that have become indispensable for park care, and manage the grants available for NGOs who's, who take these responsibilities upon themselves. Lastly, we appreciate DPR's focus on supporting small parks embedded within these neighborhoods. These small green spaces, these small green spaces increase resident quality of life, health, and climate resilience. There's one parcel in particular in Trinidad of Ward 5 that is owned by Pepco and presents an opportunity to revitalize a former substation into a community green space. We urge DPR and the council to work with residents to support this project and others, particularly in those areas of the city experiencing extreme heat and flooding. Year after year, DC is recognized as one of the most vibrant and diverse communities in the nation, and our government continues to be a leader in green and resilient development. We thank DPR and the DC Council for their continued dedication to improving the quality of life for district residents, generations to come, and will continue to support DPR and their mission and vision for the city. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Tauhami, DC Greens. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chairman Tran White, and to the committee uh, members and committee staff for making space for community input. I am Andrea Tarjami, and I'm the programs director at DC Greens, a local nonprofit with nearly 15 years of experience advancing food access and health equity in the nation's capital. I am here to voice my appreciation for DPRs partnership um, helping DC Greens to build and maintain our community farm, the well at Oxen Run, and also to provide some recommendations on how additional support for key DPR programs and staff could help organizations like us do even more uh, in our communities. The well at Oxen Run is an intergenerational educational farm located in Ward 8. This is a one-of-a-kind one initiative located in Southeast DC and is the result of a partnership between DC Greens, DC Department of Parks and Rec, the Green Scheme Friends of Fox and Run, uh, Soul of the City, and with the support from community members living near Ox and Run Park. The well uses food as the entry point uh, to community and cultural wellness and as a tool through which community members can explore the relationship between physical health, environmental wellness, and financial wellness. We share food with our neighbors, connect youth to green spaces, offer a safe and peaceful space for our seniors, and celebrate art and culture with our community members. The well relies on funding from DPR to maintain our farming and community operations. While DC Greens does receive funding from other sources, farming is, not, is no small feat. DPR currently invests $500,000 per year in the well. And while we have kept our funding request flat for the FY22 budget, we expect our need for support to grow the well, our work, and our, as our community grows. Um, DC Greens received our first grant from DPR in 2022, which provided much needed support for both construction of the space and programmatic support for community partners. This year, we are heading into our first full season in the space, and we plan to expand opportunities for community engagement and programming based on community feedback we gather at the end of last season. We hope that the council we hope that the council will ensure that DPR is able to continue prioritizing urban agriculture and community wellness as spaces like the well. And we will be lifting up this in our 
uh, request a bit more when uh, we see you again in um, budget hearings. Um, but currently funding for DPR programming is fairly robust. Uh, however, one of the struggles um, we have noticed at DPR is lack of full-time staff who are able to deeply connect with community members, organizations, and projects. Without more dedicated full staff, um, like Watani Hatcher, Josh Singer, and Katie Rowalt, all of whom have been fundamental to our work at the well, even well-funded initiatives and programming will be unable to truly succeed. The work our partners at DPR do cannot be done by volunteers or contractors. It is full-time work that requires relationship building and a long-term presence. We encourage DPR to prioritize onboarding more talented full-time staff and the council to support this effort. Lastly, DPR is unique in the way they work and connect directly with the community, but they haven't always been able to provide resources to community organizations and projects in a direct way. The recently launched community-based grants is a great opportunity to cut out the middlemen and let DPR directly support the community efforts and organizations they know have an impact. This simpler process of going directly through DPR versus having to navigate multiple uh, agencies is also more equitable, as it will make support easier to access for community members and organizations not used to connecting to government. We are excited for this first round of community-based grant making, and we'll be sharing this opportunities broadly with our community. We hope to see more direct to community initiatives like this in the future. Um, thank you for helping us do the important work that, that we're doing and for your time today. Thank you, Council Member White and members of the committee uh, for creating space for community input and I'm available for questions. Thank you. Thank you. I did want to also note that we have Council Member Matthew Fuman, who's also listening in as well. Um, and this, did you, uh, give me a second, Councilmember Fruman. Sure. Uh, this is a good segue into Ms. Churn Hill Lockridge, and then, um, we'll go to Darren Thompson, and then we'll come to you, Councilmember Fruman. Uh, welcome, Ms. Hill Lockridge. Hey y'all, um, I'm Jaren Hill Lockridge and I'm here as chair of the Ward A Health Council and a Ward A resident, not in my my capacity as the director of the well at Oxford Run. Y'all just heard from my programs director, so I think she's covered a big piece of that. Um, I really wanna touch on Oxen Run Park as the largest piece of DC government's inventory. And I'm specifically asking for an update on the comprehensive plan for Oxen Run Park. Um, to echo Mr. Ab Jordan earlier, understanding where we are with the Outdoor Fitness Center would be really great. Um, and I also just want to ask DPR if we can publicly take better care of our tree babies over here in the Great Ward 8. Um, as we're talking about Oxen Round Park, everybody has become aware of this new, uh, they're aware of this gym, but we've always known how wonderful it is. Um, Marion Barry charged, you know, Mayor Marion Barry for life. Love him. Shout out to him and the work that he did. Charged James Bond and Ab Jordan to preserve Ward 8's parks and green space for our future generations. As a result, they created the Friends of Ox and Run as well as the Ward 8 parks and green spaces. And we have a number of, am of amenities within the park. We have the Southeast Tennis and Learning Center. We have the pool, the Lockridge Field, the Bond Amphitheater, the Solo Farm. PR Harris, multiple playgrounds, the basketball courts at Livingston Road. And as you know, we discussed earlier, the well opened its gates for the first time last year. These are all amazing uh, amenities, but they're really kind of happening in silos and without a comprehensive plan, I think we're gonna keep just chipping away and not really taking advantage of all of the things that are coming. I really want to drill down on the necessity and the follow-up, um, as Ab said, about that Oxen Run Outdoor Fitness Center. It was first presented to us as the community um, from DPR at an ANC meeting hosted by ANC AD. And we've been eagerly anticipating its arrival for a minute. Part of the reason why we don't have um, 
permanent restrooms at the well at Oxford Run is because we knew that this other facility was coming. But it's been no movement or any traction on that. So I just really want to know where we are on that so that we can move forward with other plans accordingly. And then the other thing is taking better care of our tree babies. Uh, we have the largest amount of cherry blossoms outside of the tidal basin. And, you know, we own DPR land, but DGS cut the grass, DDOT and KC trees planted the trees. But because of like all of this kind of piecemeal stuff, we're losing a lot of our newly planted trees in the canopy. So I just want to real clearly ask for support for our young people to begin to be, do some of that work. You know, we have the Ward 8 Water Watchers um, with the support of Sycamore and Oak. We're going to be launching the Ward 8 Tree Hugging Experts. So if y'all want to know how to take better care of our trees, come holler at your girl. We're going to figure out a lot of those resources and let people know um, this is how we want y'all to take care of us over here in the great Ward 8. Um, and again, thank you for all the work that you do and your support and everybody else. I'm available for any questions. Yeah, that's all I got. Thank you. Darren Thompson. Uh, hey, uh, Chairman White, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Darren Thompson. I'm a native Washingtonian, War 7 resident, Navy veteran, uh, DC platoon leader for the Mission Continues, also uh, one of the teachers of the free improv classes for War 7 and War 8 residents at Project Create through Washington Improv Theater, uh, DOEE 2019 Sustainability Champion, current MBA student, George Washington University. Uh, but in this instance, I'm here as the executive director of the East River Dog Park Group. Uh, I'm here to speak today on uh, the upsetting delays and lack of accountability in DPR constructing the Texas Avenue Dog Park. The district has almost 20 public dog parks. However, currently there are none located east of the Anacostia River. Uh, the city talks about equity yet consistently has excuses for internal government delays on constructing what is really a basic amenity for residents of Ward 7. Ward 7, specifically the east of the river section of Ward 7, is the most difficult place in the entire city to own a companion animal. We're the only community that has no veterinary service, no pet food stores, no public or private dog parks. Uh, pretty much every other ward in our uh, city has those. Um, we're the only one of these services can easily be rectified by district government. That is a dog park. We've been advocating for this park since 2017, had our official petition submitted in 2018, approved in 2019. The health benefits of owning a canine have been well documented, uh, and we provided some of, the, some of that uh, documentation of those health benefits in our initial application to DPR. We know that owning a canine gets people out of their homes, connected with their communities. Uh, that is the things that are crucial uh, to our community um, and for many homes uh, it, with companion animals in our ward, this would prove to kind of be just a, a public third space that is very crucial uh, for community building. We further feel disrespected that the original dog park proposal seemed to significantly reduce literally everything that we asked for in our original petition to DPR. Uh, it felt as if DPR was just refusing to give residents east of the river what we had requested. Uh, our original ask was for 10,000 square foot dog park, which in this space is uh, more than, an, uh, which this location has more than enough space for. Um, we were, and it's still pretty much smaller than every other dog park that the district has that is not in a pocket park. Uh, DPR proposed a 5,000 square foot dog park. We asked for a dog park with a separate section for small dogs. DPR did not provide that in their original proposal. Uh, we asked for a six foot fence citing that we have dogs that we know can jump a five foot fence. DPR's original proposal was for a four foot fence. We asked that the dog park be situated along the rear of the property line. We reached out to Urban Forestry who had told us that we, uh, if our group was to ask this, we would have to come into some agreement with Urban Forestry to replace those trees that need to be cut down. We let DPR know we were willing to do that. And then DPR continued to cite that Urban Forestry would not allow them to cut down any trees due to their restrictions that we had already talked to Urban Forestry that they said could be mitigated. Um, and so now they're trying to take up the bulk of this space, which is not necessary uh, for our park. Uh, we believe uh, that our park, uh, we were led to believe that our park could not be prioritized in 2020, rightfully due to COVID. We completely understood. However, this did not seem to be a barrier uh, for the construction of the 26th and Ash Street Dog Park, nor the Hardy Dog Park, uh, both west of the river, additional dog parks. And just as a aside, uh, the 26 and I dog park is about four blocks from the Francis dog park. So this is not a community that needed a dog park, yet this is a community that got a dog park. Uh, 
as a taxpayer in the district, I'm tired of having to drive to Maryland or Virginia for my dog to socialize in communities where I don't live. DC should be ashamed of that. And I understand that I specifically am privileged to be able to do so. Many of my neighbors don't have the ability to drive to Greenbelt or to Sherlington to take their dogs to an off-leash play area. And as I cited before, we have almost 20 dog parks, but those communities don't really have good parking to make them truly accessible for people who do not live in those communities. As a group, we supported our community and they overwhelmingly support the construction of our park. Uh, in 2021, during COVID, we were made aware of the lack of amenities and activities for our, our children in our community. We as a group got together, we raised uh, just around $8,000 and set up the only recurring uh, outdoor movie night east of the river. Every Wednesday, we partnered with Fletcher Johnson Task Force to have that at Fletcher Johnson Field. It was a great success. We had a lot of community come out. Uh, we're really proud that we were able to do that. In 2022, uh, we found out that the school closest to where our dog park is located didn't have a PTA. Uh, they reached out about snacks and juice for testing. We raised $200 to do that. We found out because they don't have a PTA uh, that they had nobody to kind of do anything for their, for their staff during Teacher's Appreciation Week. We quickly, within a week, raised about 800 bucks to provide lunch for the entire staff. Every time our community has reached out to us, we have answered whatever the call has been. We will continue to do that. We aim to be a model for how a dog park group can be a positive attribute to communities around the city. We just need DPR and the district government to support us and to actually get this dog park done and prioritize it to make it a model dog park in the city. This dog park will be the only one east of the river that is public, uh, made by DPR. It should be the envy of the city. Uh, these delays, uh, kind of were compounded by this like really inexcusable initial proposal just feels like another example of the continued disrespect uh, from DPR to communities east of the Anacostia. As I've said on this since noon, I've just heard over and over residents east of the river who feel like they it sounds like they're not getting what residents elsewhere are getting that we're asking for scraps and we shouldn't be able to do that. So hopefully uh, I really hope that this body is able to kind of step up this year uh, and get this park constructed as soon as possible. Uh, and with that, I thank you all for your time. Thank you. Um, is Mr. Councilman Fruman, are you still here? I am still here. I'm, I'm listening. I, I don't have okay. any questions at this point, but and uh, I sure found that that last testimony troubling. Yes, um, we got to get that done. Also, Councilmember Fruman, can you check your text message, please? Mute your computer because you're still on. Councilmember, okay. mute your computer. That'd be helpful. Yeah, here I am. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Um, uh, wow. Council member Fruman is listening in. Um, I want to jump back up to Miss Rally Danico. Danico? Yes, hi. Hi. Does your data report where most of the OST programs are located or from which wars most families are forced to travel? I heard you talk about data, I guess, from the uh pave advocates saying that they had to travel an hour um if you can give us more information on that so we can add it to our questions yeah absolutely um i'd be happy to send you the copy of the full survey that pave released um the survey results that have a lot of information about um the challenges that parents have in accessing out of school time um and uh, it'll have the statistic that I shared along with other um, data about what the top barriers are for accessing out of school time opportunities. So um, I'd be happy to forward that to you um, right now. Um, thank you. And I, I know that you have talked extensively about equity and even as it relates to the new grants that went out. Um, I, I am concerned. Um, as always, when money hit the streets, uh, that there are on the ground individuals who are doing a lot of work, as you heard, um, like Coach Lou Hall or 
some of the workers with DPR that's doing a fantastic job that may be volu- in a volunteer capacity um, that may not know about the funding or may not have access to grant writers, but doing good work. What is your recommendation for DPR to uh, make sure that those individuals are reached and also, also considered for funding? Yeah, I think um, I agree. There's a lot of really good um, grassroots community-based groups that often have trouble accessing some of the public funding and, you know, especially meeting some of the administrative requirements that come along with receiving public funding. So I think um, doing outreach to organizations that um, that may have applied for other funding, like through uh, perhaps Learn24 or the 21st Century Federal Funding through Aussie. Um, I know there's groups that um, that would be interested in receiving that funding, but again, the the barriers that they have to go through to to get it just outweighs the capacity that they have as a small organization. So um, I think you know if DPR could work with with those agencies and talk about how um, how Learn24 and Aussie um, overcome those barriers and support smaller nonprofits, then that would be a good start. Um, also, the DC Out of School Time Coalition that um, that I help manage has um, a really big community of um, nonprofits of all sizes that you know we're definitely pushing out, you know, trying to get the word out about these new grants. Um, but happy to talk more about strategy on that with you. Got it. Thank you for that, and uh, we would like to. Um, push that because we did, we were integral in getting some of these resources into the community through DPR, um, and we want to do more. We just want to make sure it's done right, you know. Um, DPR has a lot of responsibilities on top of the, this new thing that they have. Um, I did want to jump to Ms. Jern Hill Lockridge. <clears throat> um, first of all, thank you for the remarkable job you're doing down at the well. I did get a chance to see uh, you and some of the community the other day. What was that? Two days ago. Yeah, um, two days ago. doing the work that you do. Uh, what are some of the the offerings, uh, programs that you have going on currently at the well, and how does how do people access that information? Excellent question. Um, but I will say I'm not here in my capacity as the director of the Well at Oxen Run, so I'm going to defer to my programs director, Andrea. She's here representing DC Green, so. I want to keep those two things separate at this time. Okay. What capacity are you in here with? Uh, Ward A Health Council and Ward A resident. You know, oh, I mean, I, I can that. talk about some stuff that the well is doing as a Ward A resident, but we're going to keep these two separate right now. I'm going to okay, let her. I appreciate that. But go ahead, yeah. um, Ms. Talhami. Sure. Thank you. Um, so in terms of uh, this year, we are... Um, In the process of finalizing our calendar for the year, we do know that we are plan. We have uh, plans to do uh, financial wellness classes. Uh, We have plans to do again uh, fitness classes, like physical fitness classes, such as yoga that was very popular last year. Uh, We'll definitely bring that back. Uh, We were talking just about some like walking clubs, opportunities for uh, community members to engage in other uh, fitness classes that they have indicated we're interested in. So we're uh, sort of like looking at um, the different folks who are gonna come in to teach some of those classes, but we are uh, also bringing uh, nutrition education classes. There are There is youth programming, um, the, Ward 8 Water Watchers, which is led by uh, the Green Scheme. Uh, We're going to have several events throughout the season. Um, So community events for folks to come over, just enjoy the space. Uh, We'll be also having um, food food distribution uh, at least once a month where we have, we are partnering with um, Caprea Food Bank. They're coming over doing distribution. And then once the uh, growing season starts happening, uh, there's our, our, um, our stand will be also open for uh, food distribution. Uh, so our community members can come over to get that uh, and uh, much more volunteer opportunities, uh, opportunities for folks to come in 
uh, get their hands. Um, Got on... it. So uh, have you all started partnering with uh, Simon at all in any capacity and or Hot and Blue? Um, I do know that we engage them through uh, mostly with our um, youth programming through the green scheme. Um, DC Greens doesn't do that that youth programming uh, specifically. The green scheme does uh, do a lot of the outreach for uh, youth. Um, and my understanding is that we do a lot of that outreach um, through them. All right, got that. Um, I'm gonna jump back to you, Ms. Hill Lockridge, with the little time I do have. Um, with their work on the Ward 8 Health Council, um, I attended the meeting, was it last Wednesday? Yep, it was. Um, that encompasses man, probably a hundred different organizations that's intertwined and in being progressive about addressing the health inequities and successes of our residents here in Ward 8. That meeting was held actually in Ward 7, but it was a powerful meeting. Um, and one of those at the facility talked about the um, services uh, available for seniors. Can you speak into speak to some of the uh, services that you know of that's intertwined with the Water Health Council uh, that particularly um, caters to seniors? Absolutely. Um, I know one of the things when we saw each other the other day, two days ago, you were at Be Me the Memory Tree, right? Um, Me Me the Memory Tree has been around since the inception of the well. Um, Miss Jackie Ward, another one of our amazing residents, she said, you know, you better not let nobody cut that tree down because that tree has seen so many different things. The stories of our elders, right? Um, one of the reasons why we held the meeting at Eden Bridge was because we recognized the challenges of Ward 7 and 8 are very much aligned, right? And when we talk about the quality of life for our elders, we're really trying to make sure that we're hitting that from a number of different areas, whether that's nutrition education, whether that's being able to go outside and enjoy spaces like, you know, the well at Oxen Run or the outdoor fitness center, hopefully whenever it comes DPR, right? Really just trying to make sure that our elders have some of that wraparound services to make sure that we have the intergenerational approach that we're trying to that we're trying to um, address at the Water Health Council. Thank you. Um, and we look forward to figuring out ways we can be helpful um, with some of the work in conjunction with DPR um, there. Uh, I want to jump to Mr. Darren Thompson. I did note that you. I guess stated in the DC this article mm -hmm. that you had to go as far as to Arlington to go to a dog park. Yeah, so there's a, a few issues. One, I, I have a large dog, right? I have a large breed dog, and racism is still pervasive in this city, even as subtle as it is. What so type of dog? I think I heard you say it earlier. I have a bull mastiff Rottweiler mix. Oh wow. <laughs> <laughs> he is Mr. Popular if you ever meet him. Um but we often find ourselves having to go to Sherlington, uh, especially in the summertime, because uh, the Virginia Avenue Dog Park doesn't have really good shade. So that gets really hot. Um, the Kingman Park Dog Park, uh, if it's rained, I, we haven't been there in a while because it used to flood really bad. But also you can't see from the street if there is pe if there are people in the park. So we hate driving over there and then there's no one in the park. Uh, Swamp Doodle and pretty much every other park that is close ish really in the city at all uh they don't have good parking so once we get in the car it is honestly quicker for us to go to a place like Sherlington um or Greenbelt uh Rollins Avenue and Capitol Heights just built a smaller dog park um but it doesn't have a enclosed area uh and a lot of times small dogs get very aggressive around him because he's such a big dog he lets them bite but their owners don't really like that they bite him so um <laughs> So, so, so yeah, we find ourselves just like traveling very far to places we don't pay taxes. So I also I also heard from uh Commissioner Wendy, Reverend Wendy, that there are little to the most to no signs and or dog bags uh stations east of Anacostia River. Can you speak to that? Yeah, so there are I will say at least in Ward 7, uh there was a mass push uh during COVID. Uh, we saw a lot of signs come up in DPR fields that said, 
you know, I kind of felt disrespectful to us because the sign would say like dogs not allowed on DPR fields, go to dpr.dc.gov to find your closest local dog park, which didn't exist, but yet they had the time to put these signs up. Uh, there's about three or four, at least in Ward 7 that I know of, of, of public uh, dog bag stations. There's some private ones throughout certain communities. I know off of Ridge Road and East Capitol, that community has four or five just in like three blocks. Uh, the problem with the ones that are owned by the city is there's, they often run out of bags and then there's no contact point to say, hey, we need more bags here. Um, and because they're installed by the city, it's not like there's a friends group that is responsible for refilling those bags or anything like that. So um, they come, I, I have no rhyme or reason as to how the city chooses when to go and uh, refill those, but there's one I know uh, right off of Bennett Road and C Street by Fletcher Johnson. There's one in front of Bennett Stoddard Rec, things like that. So I know they exist, they don't, they're not as plentiful as they need to be, um, but they also run out of bags pretty quickly. Got it. I apologize for that ringing. Yeah, my phone was on ringer. Uh, thank you for that. I do have to jump to Mr. Harris. I apologize. I uh, didn't realize that they elevated you to the panel. Um, you can go right ahead with your uh, your opening statement. Oh, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, okay, okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Chairman White, Director Hunter, uh, DPR staff, and everyone else, uh, fellow testifiers. Uh, I'm uh, My name is James Harris, Jamie, as everybody call me, uh, and I'm a part of DPR Boxing. Uh, the DPR Boxing, we uh, actually work out of uh, Bald Eagle, Kenilworth, Langdon, Woody Ward, Columbia Heights, Emory Heights, and then soon to be Furby Hope again, because they're working on opening that back up, which is a, is a joy because the youngsters over there need to learn the art of the sweet science of boxing. Uh, the DPR boxing program now is under one umbrella uh, and uh, we, we have one team. So we want to make sure we stay that way as far as uh, everything that we need uh, dealing with these kids. Uh, we have over 200 kids in the boxing program with DPR and the numbers are growing every day. Uh, the kids participate in local fights. Uh, we do a fight at Barry Farms. Uh, we do one uptown ceasefire and a lot of the local boxing matches uh deal with uh stopping the violence and keeping the peace amongst uh you know dc natives and the dmv natives um one of our big concerns is uh you know funding for traveling uh uniforms and equipment uh we participate in every tournament in the world which includes the golden gloves uh which we we've placed number one in golden gloves so golden glove champions uh the usa national championships but we've placed number one in the, you know, the past year in the championships, silver gloves, the junior Olympics. Uh, those um, tournaments have taken the kids from D.C. in the DMV area to Texas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, Kansas City, you know, and, and got some over in um, this international tournament going on now. But uh, one of the biggest things that we uh, deal with is, uh, you know, we get a certain amount of kids and we need the funding for those kids uh, to get well, as far as transportation, the uniforms, we want everybody in DPR to represent our nation's capital. So we're going to have one uniform for all of the wrecks. Uh, we're going to have one sweatsuit. Everybody will be uniform and we'll represent the city well. Um, uh, one of the, another thing that we're doing, uh, we're trying to uh, form partnerships with different organizations in the city in order to have somebody sponsor a team when the kids do go out of town alongside of the monies that we're asking for through, um, through the council. Uh, but right now, uh, that's pretty much what we're looking at. You know, all of those uh, centers, the, the seven, seven gyms in the, in the city and just money for travel, uniforms, equipment, and uh, like kids like Nasheed, who we talked to earlier, who's one of, one of our kids, they can move forward and, and, and be great in the sport of boxing. Thank you. Um, and I, I know uh, boxing is uh, picking up in the district. Um, I did get a chance to, to attend the uh, boxing match at the uh, Capital One Arena with Javante Davis, which was a phenomenal event. We had a lot of local talent there. 
and along with you know Al Malik Furcon hosts boxing at the event on 14th Street. I've been to the one at the uh sports arena here in Ward 8 at uh Virginia Williams Center, all over the city, really. Yeah. And it's growing. Um, I do know that uh director Hunter has taken note of that, and there is funding that will be released uh for equipment and uniforms. And so he has commissioned the staff to focus on that. Um, I'm not sure if you spoke to him about that yet, but he uh, is zeroing in on that. So I want to give you some confidence in that to support the youth while they're traveling. Also, traveling dollars is including a now grant that's coming out now. It's currently on the streets right now that people can apply for. And from what I hear, it's relatively uh, easy to apply for. It's several different categories and it's not a strenuous process. So. Uh, if you connect it with someone uh, to uh, bring it on home to help the students, you or that organization or can can get it, or several organizations can get that funding. And we want to get more. So we'll be bringing that also up in the budget oversight um, that we're going to do with DPR as well. All right. Well, I do appreciate you. Everything yeah, how many participants do you have in your boxing program? In, in the whole boxing program together, we have about 250. Ranging and from what between, ranging from what ages? So we'll start at age eight and we go up to age 40. Okay. And uh each each program, like say different programs have a uh, different amount of kids. Like say if you go to Langdon, that's a smaller facility, so they may have up to 20 kids, but in, in rec centers like Kenilworth and uh Ball Eagle, you can get up to 80 kids in there a night. Uh, are you aware of the controversy with the potential boxing facility at Furby Hope at all? Yes, I was up there last week and I talked to a few people up there and we're going to try to uh, pull all that stuff together and, and make, make, it, make it work for the kids. Now, are you an employee of DPR or you have your own organization? No, no, I'm a volunteer. I've oh, you been volunteer with DPR for okay. 15 years. You said DPR box. I didn't know if you, okay, you volunteered. Okay, yeah. so you can apply. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. So I've been up there for 15 years. So. All right. Great, great, great. Um, that's all I have for this panel. Uh, my colleague, uh, Council Member Matthew Fruman, We'll be bringing on the next panel because I have to jump into this public safety hearing around public safety in the district. And I think I'm next. So thank you. I think we we had we just finished uh with dirt number 50. So we're on number 51, uh, Council Member Fruman. And I appreciate you. And and Chairman White, can you do 10 at a time, or how how many do you like to do at a time? Um, I tried to do five to seven, but you're the boss, man. <laughs> okay. I just transferred my, my, my throne to you, man. You're the chairman. Throne, thank you very much. Yeah. Good luck on your other testimony, and, and I'll try to give you a synopsis of um, of what's been said. So when I'll you be come listening, back. In and I'll be jumping back in uh, momentarily. Thank you. All right, wonderful. Thank you very much. So, so um, Carol Rodsons from the Capitol Hill Village. Uh, if, you're, if you're the here, can we have you be elevated? Rachel Katz, Noah Storchan, Shandell Richards from Horton's Kids, Max Broad from DC Voters for Animals Education Fund, Dallas Salisbury, and Tiana Addison from Dean Wood radio broadcasting. Wonderful. It looks like we're there in terms of elevating folks. So why don't we um, get started with uh, Carol from mm -hmm. Capitol Hill Village. Yes, thank you. Um, I I was sort of daunted when I saw that I was number 50 on the list. <laughs> and when I got here at noon today, 
And especially since I think it's the most glorious weather day we've had all year or for maybe five years. Um, but I've got to say that I found it very, very inspiring um, to listen for the last four and a half hours, um, especially with the youth and to see other senior organizations too. Um, my name is Carol Grodzins and I testify here today representing Capitol Hill Village, which is part of the National Village Movement and one of 13 individual villages throughout the District of Columbia that deliver services, resources, and opportunities to seniors and their communities. I'm pleased to be able to provide this feedback to you on the DPR's Ready to Play 20-Year Master Plan from Capitol Hill Village's Recreation Services Committee. And they've worked very closely with Mr. Hunter and his, and his staff um, and have appreciated the opportunity to create be part of creating this plan. Um, Capitol Hill Village is a membership organization of 400 DC residents, mostly over the age of 70 in wards six, seven, and eight. And our members are, are diverse in race, income, ethnic origin, and physical ability. Um, our programs help us to continue to enjoy an active and congenial life in our community as we continue to go through the stages of growing older. Key among our challenges is to prevent seniors and older adults from becoming socially isolated and to help remain as active as possible for as long as possible. And the Recreation Services Committee of our advocacy team has carefully reviewed your draft plan and has sent comments before. Um, as, the, as the number of older adults in the city is increasing and is likely to continue to increase, to become a larger part of the DC population, the 20 year plan must incorporate programs for older adults of varying capabilities to a much greater degree and be reflected in your indices related to equity and growth. We also note that disability status should be highlighted, highlighted more. We would like the, the plan to be improved, it can be, continue to be improved. We're a little disappointed in the paucity of attention paid to older DC residents with, old, with others and others with disabilities. We urge the final ready to play plan to include the following features for all parks and recreation facilities and should be factored, factored into the indices. First, um, more appropriate programming for older adults. Older residents could make much better use of our parks and facilities if there were more offerings tailored for them. Since many older residents are not physically able to take part in the most demanding sports such as basketball, a different group of amenities and activities that improve balance, flexibility, strength, and aerobic fitness need to be major element of the final plan. Paved walking paths through the parks should be highlighted as should benches at regular intervals, game tables for chess, mahjong, and other board games, all these amenities give opportunities to reduce social isolation and experience by many other older adults. Include picnic tables and outdoor exercise equipment specifically for persons with limited mobility and provide shade. I was interested to hear about the from the tree people because more shade and benches and tables, this will make our parks much more usable in the summer. For immediate action, we, um, we would like you to review the use of facilities for seniors during school hours. And we feel that this could increase facility usage and also staffing efficiency. Expand the swimming and water aerobics programs for older adults. These are very popular programs that fill quickly and do not meet the demand. And increase offerings of activities such as yoga, tai chi, qigong, which can be conducted outdoors or indoors and consider aligning them with the evidence-based fall prevention programming, which is both enjoyable and proven to prevent falls. I would just like, why, why um, am I here representing my organization? And there are over 4,000 members of village groups all over DC. The population of older Americans is growing and people are living longer. According to the Census Bureau, the number of Americans aged 65 and older is projected to nearly double from 52 million in 2018 to 95 million in 2060. 
and the population of those 65 and older will rise from 16% to 23%. In just 20 years, the 85 plus population is projected to more than double from 6.6 .6 million to 14.4 million in 2040, which is a 118% increase. Um, this, the Census Bureau projects that the number and share of older Americans will surpass that of children by 2035. Like the nation, the District of Columbia's 65 plus population is also growing by 29% between 2009 and 2019. Approximately 90,000 of DC residents are age 65 or older, and over 70,000 fall between the ages of 55 and 65. Taken together, this group represents almost a quarter of the population. And I would like to thank you for the opportunity to presenting these facts and suggestions to you. Thank you. Uh, and thank you very much. I was, you, it is a beautiful day and you waited a long time, so I didn't want to cut you off. <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your testimony. Um, Rachel Katz. Hi. Um, thank you so much for having me. My name is Rachel Katz, a Ward 4 resident and a mom to two young boys. As a parent, there are a lot of things we try to teach our children um, to be kind and generous, to read and do math, to ride a bike, and, and very important to us to swim. Um, luckily, we don't have to teach all of this alone. We work together with a variety of teachers to make sure that we are raising smart, well-rounded children. In 2019, we looked for swim lessons in the area and were unable to find ones that were available or near our home through DCPR. And instead, we signed up our older son, Noah, who's actually going to be speaking next, uh, for private lessons at Washington Sports Club. They were expensive and didn't give us the results that we were hoping for. Our goal in the summer of 2020 was to focus on finding a way to make him a proficient swimmer. But obviously, we all know what happened in the summer of 2020, and we weren't able to do that. It's now three years later, my son is eight years old and he does not have the swimming aptitude that he should. Um, swimming also holds a special spot for us as there's a Jewish proverb that says what parents are obligated to teach their children and included in that list is specifically swimming. Why? Because one of the highest obligations in Judaism is the preservation of life and swimming teaches them a skill that will allow them to survive independently of our help as parents if the need arises. I'm not looking for him to be the next star on a swim team, but what I want is to simply feel like he's going to be safe and that he's comfortable around any body of water. There was a lot of excitement around our house when Roosevelt Pool opened. We, were, we are frequent visitors to the Upshur Pool in the summer, but the convenience of an indoor pool only a few blocks away when the city was opening up again was a real thrill. We hoped we could make up for lost time and add our younger son into the mix so he could get started on lessons on an earlier timeline. We found a private swim teacher and we're making incredible progress until we were told that we are unable to host a private instructor at the pool. Unfortunately, that early excitement has dimmed and led instead to much frustration. There are no DPR lessons offered. It's not open on the weekends and we are unable to get permits to allow for private instruction. We've looked at lessons at other pools but they fill up so quickly it feels impossible to get a class. This is all very frustrating as our tax dollars are paying for a pool in our neighborhood that feels unusable to us. Being in a two-parent full-time working household is not conducive to attending lessons all around the city, even if we were able to get a spot. We do want to work together with you and with DPR to find a solution, either having DPR offer swim lessons at Roosevelt, either after school, in the evenings, or over the weekends, which would require Roosevelt to open, be open at least one weekend day or allowing for permits at Roosevelt so that we can hire a private instructor while also making the permit process a bit less unwieldy. We don't wanna reserve a full lane or a large section of the pool. One-on-one -on -one lessons do not take up any more space than me being in the pool with my child. Um, thank you for your time today and for con your consideration in making Roosevelt more open to the community. Thank you very much. Uh, and now, is Noah there with you or is he is? Noah? He's gonna be on my Zoom. So he will. All right, wonderful. Nice to meet nice to meet you and nice to meet you, Noah. My name is Noah Storchner and I'm eight years old. When I walk into the pool, I'm here to take swim lessons because I don't know how to swim. I think it's important to know because if I am on my own and I go to the deep side, if 
I don't know how to swim, I will drown. I was taking lessons and it was fun. I was learning a whole lot and then I had to stop lessons. Everybody who is little, like my younger brother, and doesn't know how to swim, they go to their pool. So when I can't swim, why can't I go to the, spool, the, the pool that's closest to me? I love swimming, but want to know how to be safe, so I can also use the upshore pool this summer. Please let me take swim lessons at Roosevelt Pool. Thank you. Thank you, Noah. Great job. All right, so, uh, excuse me. Um, Shandell Richards from Horton's Kids. Oh, uh, can you hear me? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so my name is Shandell Richards and I'm the Chief Program Officer at Horton's Kids, a Southeast DC um, longstanding nonprofit organization helping children learn how, learn and grow. Each year we support the physical, educational and social emotional development of, of over 600 young people in grades kindergarten through 12th and families living in the District of Columbia's 48 neighborhoods. Thank you for holding this, this oversight hearing and for allowing me to testify today. This year, we're launching Horton's Kids Next Phase of Growth, a new community resource hub, dubbed Horton's Hub, located in the heart of Southeast DC. Horton's Hub will allow us to expand our presence in the neighborhood and help us meet the increased needs in our community as we aim to serve hundreds more students and families. Horton's Hub will serve as a beacon to reach 16 additional low-income housing communities and 13 public, private, and charter schools within a half mile radius. We are testifying today to thank the council for its support last year and to ask you to consider making the dream of Horton's Hub a reality with further support this year. With your support, we can make sure that children in Southeast DC has the resources that they need uh, to graduate high school, pursue their dreams and build the life they deserve. Horton's, Horton's Kids serves two under-resourced communities, Wellington Park and Staten Oaks, that have some of the highest rates of violent crime in the city. In our most recent engagement survey, 77% of respondents said that the community needs support with crime prevention. We see the day-to-day -day reality of this statistic. Frequent shootings create a climate of fear where people are afraid to leave their apartment. Horton's kids had to shutter its programs on multiple occasions and caregivers have been forced to choose between safety and their child's education. We recognize that reducing violence is complex long-term is a long-term effort for 34 years, Horton's Kids has provided a safe and constructive alternative to risky behavior. In a neighborhood where only 40% of high school seniors graduate on time, students enrolled in Horton's Kids are twice as likely to graduate from high school. In fact, for the sixth year in a row, 100% of high school seniors graduated on time. We recently purchased a former community church building, and after six months of renovations, it has been transformed into a vibrant community center. With nearly 20,000 square feet of indoor and outdoor space in Southeast, Horton's Hub will serve as a central location to bring resources into the community. It, will, it also allows space for potential partners to provide services like job training, mental health assistance, and other community identified resources and supports. Early conversations with partners have surfaced the following programs, such as creating um, entrepreneurship and job training as it serve as a entrepreneurship and job training center to help young adults and caregivers develop the skills they need to create profitable businesses and or attain a living wage job, develop one of develop a one-stop shop for community members to access resources like tax preparation, help screenings, deliver STEAM and enhanced literacy program for pre-K pre -K to 12 students. To purchase, renovate staff and ensure the sustainability of Horton's Hub, we are still in the process of raising $5 million. Thanks to our early campaign contributors, Horton's Kids has, has already raised more than half of this campaign goal. In conclusion, I wanna reiterate, that Horton's Kids comprehensive programs interrupt cycles of violence and poverty to help youth overcome the debilitating equity gap so they can graduate high school ready to succeed in college, career, and life. From our earliest days on basketball courts and picnic tables to establishing 
a community resource center within um, our housing communities. We welcome the opportunity to discuss our campaign in greater detail with the council. And we continue to look for the ways Horton's kids can help the city with interrupting violence and placing children and families on the part on the path to a secure future. Thank you again for allowing me to testify. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Richards. Um, Max Broad, DC Voters for Animal Education, Animals Education Fund. Yes. Nice Hello. to see you, Max. Yeah, you too, Councilmember Freeman. Um, great to be with you here today. And um, I'm, I'm testifying in my capacity as the founder and chair of DC Voters for Animals Education Fund. Uh, at the Ed Fund, we work to strengthen the role between DC residents and our animal friends, whether animals on farms and labs, wildlife, or companion animals, such as our dogs and cats. Um, in this capacity as leader of the Ed Fund, I also am the elected co-chair of the DC Good Food Purchasing Program Coalition, GFPP DC. We're a coalition of 30 organizations committed to transforming the way public institutions purchase food. We believe that food purchasing is a powerful tool to address many problems in our food system, including social justice and racial equity. I'm really glad you're here, Councilmember Freeman, as I think this is a topic that you know, will be of, of personal interest to you. Um, the, our coalition works to improve institutional food across five core values. Uh, those five values are nutrition, animal welfare, valued workforce, local economies, and environmental sustainability. Gotta love those values. Um, today I'm testifying about the opportunity for the Department of Parks and Recreation to make an impact in our community through values-based procurement. When I say values-based procurement, I refer to purchasing food that better aligns with community values, such as supporting local farmers, food businesses that employ fair labor practices and are mindful of their environmental impact and so on. As DPR bounces back from the upheaval of the pandemic, we should not pass this opportunity to rebuild our food systems better than ever. Not only have we seen that access to healthy food is so important, but intentional purchasing can offer many solutions to our broken food systems, from climate change to supporting BIPOC farmers to student health. As DPR reestablishes the summer meals program that proved Herculean during the pandemic, the agency should not give up the opportunity to adopt a more community-minded and potential food paradigm. There are several ways that the Good Food Purchasing Program is advantageous for DPR. One, GFPP is a clear set of standards that are adopted not just by DC public schools, but 10 cities across the country, therefore validating its proven concept. GFPP meets institutions where they are at. The institutions conduct a baseline audit, then they get to decide which of the expert approved measures the institution adopts to improve their school or their food for each category. And third, GFPP has community backing. Our coalition of over 30 businesses, agencies, and nonprofit organizations work together to support adoption. The GFPP DC coalition has subcommittees to advise the institution on values based procurement, engage the community on the benefits and opportunities of GFPP, and to advocate for improvements and systemic solutions. We strongly encourage CPR to consider GFPP as a tool to strengthen local and regional food supply chains, promote fair wages and benefits for food workers, and improve public health. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Broad. Um, Dallas Sal Salisbury? I'm not sure I see Dallas here. Okay, well, well I, I will turn to questions then. Uh, Carol. Uh, am I right? Is, is the Capitol Hill Village, is that one of the first villages? It's number two after Boston. Is that right? Mm hmm Congratulations. Uh, we have a number of villages in, in Ward 3, and I was an ANC commissioner when the first one came, mm -hmm. and it's really exciting to see. You were the first in D.C., and it's really exciting to see the network of villages grow around the city. I think there are villages in all corners of the city at this point. All corners of the country right now. 
Um, so have you submitted formal comments that outline these things about greater emphasis for programs for seniors? Yes. And for people with disabilities? Yes, we have. And and if you could send them, have you sent those comments in to uh, both the chairman and, and you could send them to myself so that we have the full set of comments that you've provided? Sure. Um, I don't know that I have your contact, but... It's mfruman at dccouncil.gov. Oh, okay. Uh, the numbers that you you cited uh, for the growth in the senior population were staggering. So, can and I was trying to take notes as you were going through it, but can you say again for the district what you think the yes. population, the over 65 and over 85 population? What we have is um, like the nation, the District of Columbia's 65 plus population has grown by 29% just between 2009 and 2019. Wow. Approximately 90,000 of DC residents are 65 years or older. In addition, over 70,000 more fall between the ages of 55 and 65, soon to catch up with me. <laughs> uh, taken together, these groups represent almost a quarter of the city's population and 28% of its voters. Wow, that that is those are staggering numbers and underscore the the importance of making sure that we're serving a, a population that's essentially a quarter of our population. So, Absolutely, and one that needs to that. stay healthy and happy. <laughs> All for it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, um, Rachel and Noah. Uh, I I have to say I'm a, I'm puzzled at that um, there was a prohibition on having a private instructor. When so are we, yes, we were, we had a private instructor, the lifeguards for a couple of weeks, the life, then after a couple of weeks, the lifeguard stopped and said that you actually have to have a permit to do that, which is fine in theory. And then we went to go see what the permit process was, found out that the pool at Roosevelt doesn't even let you get permits. And that the permit process seems to be, it is very confusing on the website. And it's to only get then a reserve an entire lane or a whole section of the pool, which isn't even what we want to do. We, we don't, you don't need that much space to do a one-on-one. -on -one. We're not trying to start our own class or anything like that. But then we found out that Roosevelt doesn't even let you get permits. So we can't even use Roosevelt for anything Um except for me who knows how to swim doing laps and stuff. And I know how to swim, but not well enough to teach somebody how to swim. And so we're just sort of running in a circle with the people we've talked to and they suggest we go to other pools. It's just, it's not as convenient as having one right here. And um, it's very hard. One person told me that they open the classes at midnight, the, the day that they're open and to be online at, 11.55 to sign up for a class. And I have two young children. I'm not up at, at midnight anymore in my life, especially not to sign up for like a swim class. Mm -hmm. So it just, it just feels very unmanageable when we live so close to two pools. I understand not having classes at a pool in the summer because those are, they're very busy. And so that, that can be difficult, but at an indoor pool, I just, it's, we just don't know what to do. This has been going on for months. There's another mom and her children who are testifying later that we met through this private instructor and have come together. We have over 200 signatures from people in our neighborhood wanting to have, be able to use Roosevelt pool for our children that she's going to be submitting. Um, and so we just, we're, we just don't know what to do anymore because our kids need to learn how to swim and we're just at a loss. So, I mean, I, if it were just a relative or a friend and it was not a person being paid, would that solve the issue? Or is, is it about someone being paid? Or is it about the use of the pool? I think it's about somebody being paid because it was, it was obvious she was a teacher because we would come and then we took our kids and then she stayed in another set of kids. If we just had like our last summer, our babysitter did some swimming lessons with him in the outdoor pool. And like, you can't tell, right? It's just our babysitter in the pool with him. 
Um, but this was the, the lifeguard said, we didn't know that we weren't supposed to be doing it. Then the lifeguard pointed it out to us. And so we had to stop. Um, and, you know, the pool's not even open the weekends for us to like go in with our kids and try to do some stuff on the weekends with them. But I, I'm fine proving that she has, um, that she can do CPR, that she's registered to teach. We're, we're happy to even use someone that DPR has available, a, a one-on-one -on -one instructor that someone can offer to us. We just can't do anything at this pool. So I see that your council member, um, Janice Lewis-George has joined and I wonder, um, Council Member Lewis George, if you if you wanted to chime in at this point, yeah. Um, thank you, um, Council Member Fruman. Um, thank you, Rachel, and thank you, Noah, uh, for testifying. Um, and I want to thank you both for being here and for for testifying today. Um, before I get into the um, the big questions, Noah, I just wanted to ask you, what is your favorite thing about swimming? What's your favorite thing? Yeah. You're My favorite is splashing in the pool. Wonderful. I like I like splashing in the pool too. Can you like do a big bomb into the pool where you jump and splash everyone? Mm, no. Okay. You got to work on this cannonball. That's what I used to do. <laughs> a big cannonball. You can splash everyone. Um, thank you for for testifying. And Rachel, I understand there's a community petition going about um, to to allow swim lessons at Roosevelt. Um, and wanted to know if you you wanted to, if you could share any more about the community's response to the petition. Yeah, um, and the other mom who's coming up later, Nicola, she. Uh, she and I worked together. She wrote the letter um, and we put it on a couple of neighborhood listservs and Petworth News because we've been talking to other parents. Um, uh, her kids go to Powell, which is right next door here, and they in third grade teach swimming at the school, but right. it's still, it's not one-on-one -on -one instruction and there's still, you know, a bit of a gap up until you get to third grade and not all of the schools do it. Um, our son's um, charter school does not teach swimming. So there's just, it seems to be there's a gap for a lot of mm -hmm. parents um, in finding swim instruction. Um, even if you want to pay for it, there's very few private pools in, in the city to do it. And, you know, we did it at the Washington Sports Club before. And it's just, it's very expensive for, especially when you already feel like some of your money is going toward pools in the city. Um, yeah. It's hard to justify paying even more to, to get these lessons. Correct. Um, and Rachel, I'm, I'm going to ask you this just for the record. Um, when Noah was, would have swim lessons at Roosevelt Pool, was that disruptive at all to other community members who, who were there using the pool? I, I mean, no one said anything to us. The, um, there were people swimming in lanes, so certainly, and we were not near the lanes. And then there were other families who were also just there who, I mean, frankly, they're more disruptive, right? You have like someone, yeah. a, a parent there with two or three young kids jumping in the pool and being right. around, then, you know, that's. I guess, disruptive. I mean, it's not disruptive to me. That's how a pool is supposed to be used. And so yeah. we were just using it in the same way, swimming as anyone. And like I said, I even, I have a younger son. We weren't even having them in lessons together. It was one-on-one -on -one so that there was no distraction. It would just be as right. if I was in the pool with him taking up the same amount of space. Thank you. Um, so it sounds like the answer is no, you, you were not disruptive. <laughs> we were not disruptive. Um, and another question, I, I just introduced a bill, reintroduced a bill that would keep Roosevelt Pool and other pools um, based at DCPS facilities open at least one day a week, uh, a weekend. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about how this would benefit the community members like you and other families? Definitely. I mean, I, I understand that the pool is not open during the day when school is in session. That makes obviously a lot of sense. Um, it's open in the mornings and then it's open um, a little bit in the evenings, I think from five to eight, um, at least when we were doing this back in the fall. Um, but having it open on the on the weekend also, I mean, we're, we, we're happy to try to accommodate lessons in the um, evenings after school and weekends. But for us, you know, we're a, a two parent full time working household. It's very hard to do lessons that are before the end of the workday or, um, you know, when we're trying to do dinner and get everybody after school to get stuff done. So having the weekend is when most of our activities are. So having the pool open at least one of the weekend days um, would be incredibly helpful. Yeah. 
Um, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, and, you know, you, you all have my support here. Um, and I'm going to be asking the director um, with follow up questions um, regarding um, not only weekend access, but also uh, ways to get swimming lessons um, at uh, uh, Roosevelt Pool as well. Um, there's also some very interesting equity equity gaps and racial equity gaps. Yeah, Nicola has all of those stats. Also, yeah. she she put a lot of that into the letter, and we've been um, we're very happy with your your support. We know that um, we've seen what you've put out there, and we're excited about it. It's sort of what helped buoy us to actually continue to continue our fight to to try to get some lessons at the pool. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you again. Thank you, Noah. Next time I see you, you got to have that cannonball ready to go. Um, and thank you again to other witnesses on this panel. Um, and thank you to uh, Councilman Fruman. Oh, and Chairman White, who is back. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Chairman White, just to bring you up to speed, um, we had testimony from Carol Grodsons from the Capitol Hill Village talking about the need for greater programming for seniors and people with disabilities to be incorporated in the ready to play plan and citing data about the number of seniors uh, over the age of 65 and over the age of 75 of 55 suggesting a quarter of our residents are in that range already um, and then we had testimony from Rachel and Noah um, about the Roosevelt pool and the difficulty in having lessons there that you heard Council Member Lewis George speak to. And I was going to turn to um, Shandell Richards from Horton's Kids. I'm sure that's an institution that you are very, very familiar with. Um, and then next up was uh, Max Broad from uh, DC Voters for Animals Education Fund. So I will, to, uh, I, I will set you up on uh, Ms. Richards. Ms. Richards was talking about the great work that they're doing, which is really um, phenomenal. I've followed Horton's kids for a long time and really, really impressed with what you've accomplished and the data that you cited on graduation rates, just, you know, so impressive. And I take it that uh, I, I'll just ask this question and then and turn it back over. Uh, Chairman White, that you're in the middle of a capital campaign for $5 million for the renovation of the church. And am I understanding it correctly that you, you've raised two and a half million and then must have two and a half million more to go? If you want to speak to that and then as a, uh, and then Chairman White can pick it up from there, that would be great. Yes, you're absolutely correct. We're like almost halfway there um, and we're in the middle of our um, capital campaign. Uh, most recently, we had our grand opening um, our, of our Horton's Hub, <clears throat> which uh, allowed us to bring in some of our key stakeholders and uh, donors and board members um, into the space um, to celebrate all the things um, getting to this particular milestone. Um, historically, Horton's Kids um, has been riddled with not having enough space. Um, we functioned out of a two bedroom apartment within the communities that we do serve. Um, and this is the first time in 30 years that we have space that allows us to actually have programming um, on site. <clears throat> Thank you. I guess I'll chime uh, right in. Um, I, I, since we're on you, Miss Richards, on Horton's kids, um, mm -hmm. I know you, you, Horton's kids have been in the community for decades, mm -hmm. doing phenomenal work. Um, and I think I was uh, on the Wellington Park. I mean, they got they got a new name. It's probably the third name now. But you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. The last week, in fact, they had something there today. Uh, I think. Um, I wanted to know from you um, how with the new location, mm -hmm. what's the difficulty, if any, that you're having getting uh, these both both of these community kids to walk or commute to the to the next location, or is the transportation? How is that working out? Because one of the barriers. As you heard earlier, um, if you were on a hearing from youth was safety, being afraid to travel, parents concerned about if they crawl. And as you know, both of these neighborhoods have had issues over the years. It's mm -hmm. been 
um, terrible to say the least. Um, how are you working through that? So right now we bus our kids from um, both communities um, to our Horton's Hub um, after school, but we do see that that's an issue just walking less than what 10 minutes away from their community maybe like five minutes to um to our new location will be an issue and our hope is that we can partner with um like building blocks and pd just to kind of create a safety corridor uh so parents and kids can feel uh, better about walking to our hub um and we've started some of those efforts already where we sat down with parents and they identified like routes that they would want to consider a safety a safety corridor um but our hope is that we can just kind of have more people be a part of that conversation and us actually creating the safety corridor and getting the people in place in order for that to happen got it um and i, I did hear about the uh need for 2.5 million i know we did something i can't even remember the actual number of what the government was able to do but is five million a new number no okay sound new to me <laughs> all right um uh and i see your message miss grogens um okay for aspiring so okay we well my staff is 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 here and sending me notes um i see you say the brookfield property uh we will follow up um and, and you live in Libya. okay got it um and we can have an offline conversation i'll send you now my contact information sure uh, we just had a uh a event in navy yard three days ago oh. with the frederick douglas memorial bridge and we want to include nice. you the residents about what we are doing there um yeah so we want to open up communications down there. Um, I just sent you my number. Confirm you have. I've I found this whole afternoon really inspiring, and I've learned so much. And uh, I'm glad you're my council member. <laughs> yeah. And we and we are we have fairly new a few new staff, as well as committee. Uh, staff and so those who may have been communicating with our committee please stay in touch because we want to make sure that the information shared today if you can email that to ryA at dccouncil.us that'll be helpful for us to go on back in our staff meetings and our meetings with the other council members who are in and out of these hearings to have the information you're sharing today uh, thank yeah, you all. I have already sent that to ryA yeah all right, I sent my you. testimony there. Thank you. And I think I Chairman Fruman already asked questions of this committee, this panel. Thank you all. Uh, Thank you. Following up. Actually, um, uh, Chairman White, I, I had I, I had not gotten to Max Broad, so if I could just ask a, a couple of questions of, of him, if that's okay. Absolutely, Co-Chair. Go right ahead. <laughs> Co-Chair for another three minutes. Um, Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Broad. Um, did I hear correctly I mean, the, the idea of moving to a new way to buy, to procure healthier foods uh, sounds very, very sensible. Is DCPS using that program? Did you make a reference to that, like DCPS and other places around the country? Yeah, that's correct. DCPS has um, enrolled in the Good Food Purchasing Program. Um, as of 2017, and DC Council formally authorized it in the Healthy Schools Amendment Act of 2018. Is and is it um, does DCPS use that program to purchase all of its food or just a portion of its food? It, it, it's intended to guide all of its food purchasing, um, and you know DCPS gets to decide how they apply the criteria. I see, and. Um, and what about charter schools? Are you aware of whether any of the charter schools that may be providing meals also are are participants in these program in this program? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I, you know, personally, I'm not aware. I'll have to you know look look into that and see if there are any examples. I mean, it does seem to me, you know, that's that's a lot of kids being fed. So it's it's a thing worth thinking about. Um, and 
Is the program, the program does not point to specific vendors per, do, or does it? Does it, does it, or is it that the criteria then inevitably lead to certain vendors? Yeah, it's a great question. The, the, the program is um, agnostic to vendors. Um, it, it's really, you know, like, for instance, looking at environmental sustainability as one of the criteria, CCPS gets to choose, are we going to implement a composting program or are we going to use uh, more plant-based meals or recyclable material, I mean, uh, compostable materials so that they get to choose and, and through that they approve points. Is, is, there's, um, are there studies that have shown what the impact of this kind of program is? Because, you know, one of the things that is a real issue is childhood obesity, you know, pre-diabetes, things like that. Are there studies that suggest that adhering to these criteria reduces those and including studies in the district? Yeah, I, I don't know about studies in the district. I, I, I don't believe so. But all of these um, criteria come from uh, a, a panel of stakeholder, expert stakeholders um, who are, you know, experts on each of the, the categories, including nutrition. So I think it's, you know, well uh, founded. All right. Well, thank you very much. Turns out you're everywhere. So Appreciate it, Mr. Brown. Good to see you. Thank you. Thanks, all. Well, we're going to move to our next panel. Um, Elena Mintz, Urban Adventure Squad, Aisha Bailey, East River Family Strength and Collaborative, Lena Duran, DC Career Pickleball, Eileen Daughtry, Washington, D.C. Pickleball, Terry Alec Garfield Park Pickleball, and we're going to uh, go push right through. Ms. Duran, you can go right ahead. Hi, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. All right, let's get started. <clears throat> um, so my name is Lana Duran and I am one of the co-hosts for DC Queer Pickleball. Um, I'm here today to share with you my experience with pickleball um, and also to ask for more lighted outdoor pickleball courts and trash cans. So. Um, I am an immunocompromised person, and because of that, part of my experience living in today's times is really limited to outdoor spaces and outdoor activities, and um, it's like really isolating. So when I found DC Queer Pickleball, I was so excited. DPR has an offering for LGBTQIA people, and um, we are able to play at Turkey Thicket Fridays 5 to 7 and we have reserved courts, two courts, two pickleball courts, one tennis court. Um, with a tennis court, a pickleball takes up half the size of a tennis court. So we have to, um, I guess, put up nets to be able to play. Um, and that works for us. So no problems there. We have reserved time. People respect our reserved time. So I, no issues as far as I know. Um, but that brings me to my point of pickleballers using tennis courts. I'm well aware that most people do not have reserved time and space to play, um, especially if you're a non-retired person. Most of the offerings are in the middle of the day and they're indoors. The problem being we're at work. Um, and when we get off of work, it's late. We only have maybe like two hours to play before it's dark. Um, which is why I am asking for more outdoor lighted pickleball courts so that we can play when we get off of work, we have time. I'm also asking for those outdoor pickleball courts to be um, on like timed lighting. So it's to not like waste resources, conserve energy, but also we don't wanna add, add to light pollution. 
Um, I think if we are able to get our own dedicated space to play, we're not using basketball courts when we're indoors. We're not using tennis ball courts when we're outside. And I think we could be able to like coexist and respect our playing time and space. So having dedicated space for a pickleball um, is like going to benefit everybody, tennis players, basketball players. I can understand the frustration of coming to play tennis and then having pickleballers on your court. Same with basketball. So lighted outdoor pickleball courts, the way to go. Thank you so much. Thank you. Is Miss Bailey here? Okay. I'm sorry. Where are we? Ms. Mintz? Thank you. Hi, I'm Ilana Mintz. I'm the founder and executive director of Urban Adventure Squad. We're a DC-based nonprofit that for almost 10 years has brought children and educators outside to activate the city as the best possible classroom. Our parks and recreation centers are a critical part of that. The default the position of the U.S. public education system is that indoors is for learning and outdoors is for play. Based on that premise, we built a system in which children and their teachers spend most of their day inside, often in windowless classrooms. Also based on that premise is the idea that our parks are primarily for recreation and are not considered outdoor classrooms. Urban Adventure Squad strongly disagrees with the lack of recognition of the outdoors as a critical classroom for children of all ages. This week we're in Ward 5 and students in our February break program, Neighborhood History Detectives, are exploring Brookland's African-American Heritage Trail, which winds through the neighborhood near Turkey Thicket Recreation Center, where they stop for a picnic lunch, free playtime, and bathroom breaks, which are a critical piece of outdoor learning access. In the past, we visited Turkey Thicket with students in elementary and middle school for outdoor curriculum aligned lessons on reducing pollution, how to estimate the age of a tree, and Civil War history. Also on the agenda this week in Brookland is Noise Park, a wonderful place to play with covered shelter for eating, socializing, and hands-on lessons, but no bathroom, which means our time there is limited. The same goes for Oxen Run Park in Ward 8. As Mr. Jordan pointed out earlier today, we love it there, but without a public bathroom, we can't spend as long as we want to. DC's incredible nationally recognized network of parks and green spaces are treasured places for the squad. And we wanna make them treasured places for our schools so that teachers can activate these spaces as extensions of their outdoor, of their classrooms. And kids can experience regular sustainable walking field trips that don't include the expense or logistics of hiring buses. And don't message to children that to connect with nature, we need to leave our neighborhoods. I'm asking the DC Council and DPR to recognize the vital role you play in providing and maintaining safe, welcoming spaces for DC's children, educators, and caregivers in every ward, and to act with funding and repairs as if you were building and maintaining the classrooms you'd want your children and grandchildren to learn in. That means clean, accessible bathrooms, working water fountains and bottle refilling stations, well-maintained equipment, and playground surfaces that don't contribute to the pollution of our waterways, which DC's kids deserve to swim in and eat from, but can't. Urban Adventure Squad envisions every ward of the city as an outdoor classroom that safely engages children of all ages in our green spaces. Please join us in making that vision a reality, and thanks very much for the opportunity. Thank you. And please note, if you have not sent the written testimony, if you can send that, that will be helpful for not only me, my staff, and the other members who are in and out of this committee. That's important. Aisha Bailey, I called her. Uh, Ms. Daughter, Daughtry? Um, good afternoon, Council Member White and Director Hunter. My name is Eileen Darty. I'm a Ward 6 resident and an active senior pickleball player. As a member of Washington, D.C. Pickleball, I want to speak with you today about where we play outdoors in the city. Most of the courts offered by DPR for pickleball are temporary hybrid courts. Scott Parker, who you heard from earlier, 
works closely with Andrew Aquato, the citywide tennis and pickleball director, to identify tennis and basketball courts suitable for pickleball play. Scott recruits volunteers from the pickleball community to help Andrew measure the courts and paint the lines or tape them to create pickleball courts. Generally, one tennis court is lined to create two pickleball courts. Well, this effort was a cost-efficient way to service DC pickleball when the sport first started in our area. These hybrid courts are not a solution to the enormous surge in pickleball demand we continue to see. The sport has already outgrown the hybrid courts, and these courts offer pickleball players little of an opportunity to play. Let me explain why. In many cases, using these courts would require players to furnish their own 20-pound net, making it inaccessible to many residents. Pickleball is known as a low-barrier sport. To play it, all you should need is an inexpensive paddle. Where DPR does provide nets, they're locked in a box, and need to be set up by someone with the lockbox combination. Pickleball players are only guaranteed access to courts during specific times. Guaranteed playtime on the hybrid courts is limited to less than 10 hours per week per court. I drive over to the Palisades Rec Center to play. Pickleballers show up three days a week between 9.30 and noon year round filling all the hybrid courts while players wait on the sidelines. The same is true at each of the hybrid courts. Too many players with too little guaranteed time to play. At Turkey Thicket, where DPR has lined all tennis courts for pickleball, there's a sign prohibiting pickleball players from using most of those courts. At locations where DPR has allowed hybrid courts, one court remains unlined and reserved solely for tennis. Often those dedicated tennis courts sit empty while pickleballers players, pickleball players wait in line for chances to play. Limited guaranteed slots on hybrid courts also do not allow time for league play, youth play, lessons, or courts where beginners can play their skills. We're pleased that DPR is launching a competitive pickleball league in the spring and thank them for that. But many players wonder where they can practice as teams. Team play is not allowed during dedicated court hours. With so little access, the rule is everybody rotates into games as slots become available. We would like to commend and thank Andrew for creating new hybrid courts in 2022. He's worked very hard with limited resources to help ensure we have places to play and we appreciate him. We would like to offer a few additional solutions. We'd like to see DPR identify and turn tennis courts into dedicated pickleball courts in 2023. We believe four pickleball hubs located conveniently across the wards will help alleviate crowding and address the needs of this growing sport in the short term. Each hub should have a minimum of four to six courts. We'd like to see the council allocate funds to build permanent pickleball courts at locations convenient to all city residents. When creating hybrid courts, we ask the DPR remove the mandate that one tennis court remain unlined for pickleball. We ask that funds already allocated for new recreation centers and approved to renovate existing sites include dedicated pickleball courts. Thank you very much, Council Member White and all the members of your committee and Director Hunter we very much appreciate the opportunity to share our views and look forward to seeing you on the courts one day. All right. <laughs> so you got to be in shape to do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't have to be in good shape to play pickleball. Yeah. I watched some of the older guys play pickleball, man, and put my little legs to shame. Well, you can play against me then. I will not do that. <laughs> I'm going to spot you a few points then. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right. All right. Um, where are we? Uh, Terry Allard, Garfield Park. Right. Uh, thanks very much. Hello, everybody. My name's Terry Allard. I lived, I've lived in the district for over 30 years, and I'm part of the larger pickleball community that Scott Parker talked about earlier today. <clears throat> I'll be advocating for our smaller Southeast Capitol Hill neighborhood in Ward 6, which urgently needs dedicated outboard outdoor pickleball courts, uh, like Eileen just mentioned. As a group, we've been playing year-round pickleball, pick-up pickleball games for over five years, 
on a stretch of Virginia Avenue Southeast bordering Garfield Park that was essentially abandoned by the district. This stretch of Virginia Avenue is at the southern border of Garfield Park by the railroad tracks in the shadow of I-395. It was completely buried in dirt and trash and wasn't a safe place for the community to visit. The friends of Garfield Park, our neighbors, cleaned it up, patched the cracks as best we could, painted lines for three courts and made it a safe place for the entire neighborhood to enjoy. We buy our own nets, pickleballs and paddles, so we're not dependent on the district. Outdoor pickleball on Virginia Avenue Southeast has been a lifeline for seniors during the pandemic. Uh, we've been there year round, winter, summer, fall and spring. We now have a group of over 70 people playing next to Garfield Park, mostly seniors, and that number is growing. This stretch of Virginia Avenue is a critical component to the connector between the new Navy Yard neighborhood and Capitol Hill. It has been permanently closed by the architect of the Capitol. I asked the council to consider transferring these two blocks of Virginia Avenue Southeast from DDOT to the Department of Parks and Recreation and be formally incorporated into Garfield Park proper. If DPR's jurisdiction included the permanently closed blocks of Virginia Avenue, they could turn this unused road into four or five outdoor pickleball courts. In the short term, we want to have DOT to, uh, to pave these two blocks of Virginia Avenue to make it safer for seniors to play outdoor pickleball today. In addition, <clears throat> DPR should paint pickleball court lines on both Garfield Park tennis courts during their plan renovation and establish non-conflicting times <clears throat> for both tennis and pickleball play. I don't think this is gonna be an issue. In the long term, we urgently need to plan for the explosive growth of pickleball across the district, but including our Garfield Park Pickleball Coalition. We support Commissioner Miller's uh, goal of establishing a three to six month assessment and strategic planning effort as soon as possible. So in summary, we're asking the district to provide fair and equi equitable access to outdoor courts for the growing pickleball community, including the seniors in Ward 6 uh, on Southeast Capitol Hill. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, Colin Dersing, see you here already, so. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Colin Deersing. I'm a Ward 1 resident. And like several other people, I signed up to testify about the shortage of pickleball facilities in DC. In particular, I want to call attention to the significant and growing interest in pickleball from young adults. While the sport initially took off as an activity for seniors, and you've already heard testimony about the importance of the game to DC senior residents, in recent years, pickleball has also attracted significant attention from people of all ages. If you go to Turkey Thicket, where I play, on an evening with nice weather, you'll find dozens of people in their 20s and 30s from across the city trying to play pickleball. They range from former college tennis players to total novices seeking social connection and a way to stay active. We play open play style, inviting any resident interested to come by and mix in. I say they're trying to play because the existing facilities are dramatically overcrowded. On a nice night, there are generally dozens of pickleball players crammed onto just four permanent and two temporary courts, and a DPR policy barring people from setting up temporary pickleball facilities on many of the neighboring tennis courts, even when they sit empty otherwise. People often leave having sat waiting far more than playing. Last night, I left the courts at 6 p.m. when there were zero people using any of the neighboring facilities, but more than 30 pickleball players tried to fit on too few courts. I'm sure the numbers will be far worse tonight with the nice weather while you all sit on the Zoom. The distribution of courts across the city also limits access for young adults. In my home of Ward 1, there are no courts at all. In Wards 2, 7, and east of the river, there are no permanent courts. Most of the courts that DPR describes on its website are the type of hybrid courts that Eileen talked about, which are often only available for pickleball during a small number of hours during the workday, making them entirely inaccessible to anyone who works a 9-to-5 job. In comparison to other sports, the DPR facilities for pickleball just don't come close to meeting the interests from the community. This strikes me as a real shame. Pickleball is an easy way for people to stay active and meet their neighbors. For young people, it's commonly a way to be introduced to people in the community they've moved to. And as Scott Parker pointed out, the small court size means that you get far more bang for your buck in terms of number of residents able to participate in DPR activities per the square footage used. 
appreciate your time and uh, look forward to any questions. Thank you. Um, I think that DPR is saying that there are um, a number of courts, um, almost a dozen pickleball courts with about 50 courts with lines. And I'll get the validity of that um, from the director when he jumps on to figure out what are some of the solutions to this. Um, but I want to, I'm going to push ahead because I didn't think that most of these uh, panelists are from the pickleball community. And so for the sake of time, I'll continue to push forward. Thank you all for coming on and giving the testimony today. Thank you. thank you for waiting. I know you've been trying to get on here for a while. Thanks for your time. Ruth Ellis, David Schwartz, Beth White, Jane Pierce. Jakia Sparkman. Mark Selick, Lizbeth Melendez, Rivera, DCG, DC LGBTQ Plus Pickleball League, Janice Polly, Washington DC Pickleball Club, Dennis Baker, DC Pickleball Club, Deborah Fox, Queer Pickleball DC, Patrick Burke, DC Police Foundation. Pick a ball. I'm going to stop there. Miss Ellis, I see you're here. I never seen a screen like that, but if you can cut the screen on and your mic on and go right ahead. There's no video. Can you hear me? I can hear you, but there's no video. Yep. Okay. All right. Yeah, my name is Ruth Ellis. Um, I live in Ward 8. And um, I've been a pickleball player for about five years. I started coaching um, about two years ago. And like so many other panelists that are about to speak, I'm very passionate about pickleball. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, about why that is. So pickleball is a great sport. Um, it's not only fun and athletic, uh, very competitive, but it's also really good uh, for your mental health and reducing social isolation. Um, when pickleball players get together, they are close to each other, they're talking to each other, they're laughing with each other, they're having a good time. Um, it brings people of all, from all walks of life together. People who are older people, younger people, um, black people, white people, people from all different economic backgrounds get together and they play pickleball. A lot of people mentioned uh, during the pandemic, I mean, I know for me personally, pickleball was a lifesaver. I would get a text message from one of my neighbors asking me to come out and play on Garfield Park uh, on those uh, courts on Virginia Avenue, and it got me through the pandemic. So pickleball builds communities. Um, when people play pickleball, they typically play several times a week. They get to know each other, they, and they get together on and off the court. Um, uh, I've recently volunteered to be a pickleball ambassador, uh, joining Scott Parker and his work in the DC area. Uh, I'm gonna be working in the Southeast and Southwest quadrants of the city. I'm especially hoping to grow pickleball uh, in our community uh, and east of the river. Uh, Scott mentioned several different rec centers uh, where pickleball is available. There's only one rec center east of the river where there's pickleball available. It's only available there two hours a week. Uh, there is actually no pickleball in Ward 8 east of the river. The only pickleball uh, in Ward 8 uh, is at Capper, which is my neighborhood rec center. So I really look forward to working with DPR and with the council, uh, and with you, Council Member White, uh, to grow pickleball in Southeast and Southwest DC. It's a great thing, not only for individual players, but it's really a great thing for the community. That's why there are so many of us that have been <laughs> sitting on the Zoom call all afternoon waiting to speak because we, we know what pickleball can do for our city, which we all love. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Ellis. David Schwartz. So David is not participating. I'm speaking for him today. Who is that speaking? 
Uh, th this is Ruth. David is my husband. So, oh, okay. he, yeah, I'm speaking for him today. Thank you. All right. Got it. Beth White. Seeing none. Okay. Jane Pierce. Seeing none. Uh, Jakir Sparkman. Okay. Mark Selick. It's Jackie Sparkman. Jackie. Jackie, J-A-C-K-I-E, like Ed Robinson. Okay, it's spelled wrong on mine, but go ahead. Okay. For that. Sorry about that. I didn't do it. Yeah. All right, go right here, Ms. Spock. Um, I'll be quick. I am part of that first contingent, first responders of pickle, to Pickleball in D.C. We started, uh, I think, in 2017. It might have been 16, but I think it's 2017 at Emory, Emory Heights rec center i'm a resident of ward four and emory was the main place for pickleball when we first started uh we learned to play it scott taught us how to play there uh, uh i think uh greenleaf and sure sheridan uh came online all pickleball play at that time was indoors um and almost all the players were like myself, senior citizens and retired. So we had time and we wanted to be active. We quickly found a, a found community um, playing pickleball um, and um, were, and were welcoming to all these new young upstarts who started to playing pickleball during the uh, pandemic and took over our courts. But, Fortunately, uh, pin, uh, pickleball welcomes everyone. Now, most of the players in the city are not senior citizens, but the seniors are still there, thank God. And um, we do need more space, more places to play uh, because there are so many, many more players in 2017 and 18. You knew almost everyone uh, in the city who played pickleball. People from um, Chevy Chase and Palisades and um, other places um, in North Upper Northwest came to Emory to play, but um, but now they have uh, places to play in their parts of town, and we still all meet each other on the various courses in and around town, including now at uh, East Potomac. We need more pick places to play pickleball. There are still lots of tennis players in the city, and we don't need to be at loggerheads. We just need to find more places for everyone uh, to paddle up. Thank you. Thank you. Mark Stieglick. Let's see, Mark. Elizabeth Melendez. Um, for my staff, uh, if these people are not here, just um, ping me so I won't go through this whole list. But in the meantime, I have no choice. Janice Pauly. Janice Pauly. She's here. Okay, I am, I am here. Sorry. <laughs> Um, I can repeat everything you've heard about pickleball, uh, and, but you've heard it all, so I will just sort of focus on something a little bit different. Um, first of all, I, I came from another community and um, was extremely happy to meet both Scott and Andrew, and, and, be, and particularly because of Andrew's effort to get pickleball going here along with what Scott does. Um, many communities, the tennis professionals or the tennis directors really make no effort to promote pickleball. And I, I've really found Andrew to be extremely helpful 
in that regard, he does a lot of good work in getting pickleball going in the city. Um, I'm the sort of competition director for Washington DC pickleball. So I put on tournaments and I run the leagues. Um, so I, I think that we need to, as well as having places just for recreational play, we need to have opportunities for competition as well. And right now there's not, there, there's minimal ability to do that. We have Turkey Thicket, which has a number of courts and we do run two tournaments a year there and we're starting some league play. Um, but other than that, it's strictly a recreational program. And as the age of the players goes down, I think that there will be more of a need to offer some place where we can have some fairly regular competition and leagues for kids as well. And for that, uh, I believe we need a dedicated pickleball facility, not just pop-up places and not just places on tennis courts where there's potential conflict or on basketball courts, which really, you know, we shouldn't be taking those over when the kids need them in the afternoon. Um, so I think we need a dedicated pickleball facility for all of the reasons that have been mentioned before, but also to be able to expand the pickleball opportunities to younger ages and to kids um, in and in constructive recreation. So I'd like to thank you for letting me uh, speak. And uh, I hope that we can get something going here with a dedicated facility. Got it, thank you. <clears throat> Dennis Baker. Deborah Fox Queer. <laughs> Never Fox Queer Pickleball, sorry. Uh, Patrick Burt. Good afternoon, Council Member. How are you? Good, and yourself? Good. I apologize. If you hear any chatter, I've got, I'm listening to Chief Conti in the background also. Um, good afternoon, Chairman White, members of the committee. My name is Patrick Burke, and I serve as a board member and the director of planning for the nonprofit Washington, D.C. Pickleball. Councilman, I also know you. I'm a retired assistant chief, and I was U.S. Marshal for D.C. under President Obama, so I appreciate all the work you've done in, in public safety space as well. And yeah. I know you're probably saying, you know, where did pickleball come from? And I was asking the same question about just a year and a half ago when my I'd never heard of it. My wife took me out for my first pickleball lesson, and, and now I'm an addict, as you've seen many of the people um, in front of you are today. Uh, and I heard you ask Scott Parker earlier about uh, the demographics. And one of the things that, that I've seen when I thought it was just an old person sport, it's black, white, Latino, uh, Asian, LGBTQ, young, old, you name it. I've, I've met so many great people and I thought I, I've met a lot of people working for 30 years as a cop in DC. And I've met so many wonderful people of all ages, been to rec centers all around the city more than I have in my entire career, uh, meeting wonderful people. And I'm going to paraphrase some of the things from my testimony because you've heard a lot of the statistics over and over again. It's the most uh, fastest growing sport in America. Um, the courts are dramatically overcrowded. Trust me, council member, I'm all around the city. It's packed. And when the weather breaks, it's going to be crazy. Uh, there's eight dedicated pickleball courts. You've heard a lot about Andrew and his efforts done a great job. You know, we've, we've got a lot of band-aids with temporary tennis courts. But the reality is there's limited time for play. You've heard it over and over again. We, we don't want our residents traversing. So many of my buddies are going to, to Maryland and Virginia. Uh, we need to keep them in DC. We need to keep people healthy here um, and playing pickleball here in DC. We've got an opportunity, council member, you've got an opportunity to make this a hub, a benchmark of best practices of what we're doing nationwide. Bring in dollars into DC. People don't wanna to go to Virginia and Maryland to play. We can do a lot better here. So really what I just want to say, council member, is we need to work and we are working with DPR um, to identify appropriate courts with permanent solutions like dedicated courts, both indoors and outdoors. As I said, it's really limited space. And when you talk about indoors, it's extremely limited uh, with no dedicated courts to it. 
Uh, we'd also like to see the courts kept in good playing condition with regular repairs. I know my wife, when we go over to Turkey Thicket, she'll carry duct tape to fix the nets. Uh, that's a regular problem. The court should be in, in good shape. You don't want to trip on cracks or courts have grass growing on them and other things. So as you've heard before, council member, uh, we want to see fair and equitable access for all residents, dedicated courts. It's the only way to ensure that for the pickleball community. I thank you for your time. It's interesting, council member, because uh, MPD only had 46 witnesses. You've got over 100 on this committee. So I appreciate your, your time and the, the effort that you're taking to talk to everybody and, and, and hear our concerns. Yep, thank you. And I think a lot of that tributes to the pickleball community, um, which is growing, not just in DC, but across this region, I'm, I'm seeing. Um, I did have one question for Ms. Ellis about the tournaments. What is required differently from recreational play versus what's required for a tournament? I know bleachers probably, but um, you're muted. You're still muted. Is that for that question for me or for Ruth? That would be for Janice. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so for tournaments, um, you don't necessarily need bleachers uh, because there's usually enough space surrounding the courts for spectators to sit, uh, although bleachers definitely add to it. Um, the, the real issue with tournaments is you need enough courts in one place to run a tournament. And depending on the size of the tournament will determine the number of courts that you need. And, um, and I also want to mention the fact that tournaments, as well as recreational pickleball, are social events. Uh, even though it's competition, it is extremely social competition. So that's another, um, I guess, uh, positive factor about pickleball compared to other, maybe other competitive sports. Got it. Go right ahead, Ms. Deborah Fox. Thank you so much, Chairman White. It's great to be here with you and all of my uh, pickleball folks. So I am speaking on behalf of uh, DC Queer Pickleball. So I'm a proud member and I'm the founder of the DC Queer Pickleball Club. And I also coordinate with other queer pickleball groups around the country. As many people know, DC is a large, has a very large LGBTQI population, and there's very many sport leagues that um, cater to LGBTQI folks. So I created the um, Queer Pickleball Club a couple of years ago after I was going out to play a turkey thicket, and then I just realized, like, there's so much social isolation during the pandemic, and queer folks are always needing places um, that are more expansive and visible to play, and also just, I realized that this sport, um, as many people have described, is very inclusive and age diverse. Um, and I also um, was thinking about it, but just being very gender expansive, diverse. So, uh, you know, our group that plays weekly at Turkey Thicket um, is very inclusive of people who are gender non-binary, don't conform to um, the binary gender um, schemes. And uh, we're very inclusive of transgender folks as well. And as we know, um, both, um, I think there's over 300 anti-trans bills um, across the country right now. So we're very lucky to live in a place like DC that's very inclusive and supportive of our um, trans community and our um, LGBT commu LGBTQ community. So um, I want to just speak specifically that it's just been a great space um, where people are coming together and um, of all um, abilities, sizes, um, genders, races, and it's been really, really wonderful to see that. And that's why I have enjoyed and loved the sport so much. And um, we do need more spaces and more folks um, um, to help organize pickleball. All, all of us are doing this in our free time. Luckily, we have a lot of um, retired folks who are helping out, but um, I definitely think DPR and Andrew, who's been mentioned um, numerous times, they could use a full-time pickleball uh, staff person at DPR, but definitely um, we're in need of more spaces. Um, we play on Friday nights um, from five to seven, and we started out playing there at Turkey Thicket because no one was there on Friday nights. And now um, it's it's not as easy to get court space, and often it's tense trying to negotiate space. And we don't want to really be um, having those kind of conflicts with our 
tennis neighbors or other pickleball friends. So if there are more options, it would be really great. And there are other communities in the country that I played pickleball at that there just are more options, both indoor and outdoor. So however we can um, grow as a community with this sport, I think is needed. And I just think it's a wonderful sport in terms of um, being very inclusive and, and this community has demonstrated that. So hopefully we can put some more resources into, into that. And I definitely think there's a, a youth element that um, we could get more youth involved is they're often interested at Turkey Thicket, but um, not often the space or the people to lead the, those efforts either. So thank you for your time. Thank you. How long have you been playing? Um, a little over two years and I play every day. Every day. <laughs> so that, kind of a, that kind of a sport. I heard okay. Attic, I heard that play every day. So this is really, okay. Well, we'll, we'll play with you anytime if you want to come out too. So that's the other thing. I'm <laughs> I'm just going to play with some not so stiff competition so they don't make me look bad. Yeah, we can arrange that. We're going to offer it up. So hope my staff take note of that and make sure we get that going. Maybe do it on, maybe do a live on, on Facebook or something. Yeah, that would be really fun. Let's do that. All right, cool. Thank you. Um, all right, for the sake of time, we're going to move right along for panelists 76 through 88. Thank you, Mr. Burke, for your testimony and your service. Uh, to the nation. Um, so I got last name, I only see last names, Lee, Lowry, Cotton, Nabel, Juris, Curry Savage, Simone Scott, Marquise Cotton. Hello? Can you hear me? Yep. Can you? Yep. Oh. Good uh, evening. Uh, you're not up yet. I remember why. Yep. And members of the committee yeah. for recreation. Yeah. You, you're not up just yet. I called you, but uh, okay. Mr. actually in front of you. Uh, th and thank you guys for your patience. And this hearing me going on, what, almost six hours. Ago. Mr. Andre Lee, I see you, but your computer is, you might got to bend your screen to one spot. So like your computer is... You might have to turn your screen off and just speak, man, because it looks crazy. And say, Lord. Hey, Dr. Council member. There we go. I'm great. How are you? I'm good, sir. Go right ahead. All right. Uh, so, uh, hello, uh, chairperson, council member, Treyon White, and committee members. First, giving honor, praise, and glory to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, so I'm going to testify on the beginning of the Department of Public Work. I mean, ha, you know, that's where I worked at. The Department of Parks and Recreation and Lee Little League and Feed My People Food Ministry. My name is Andre Smokey Lee, CEO and founder of Lee Little League and Feed My People Food Ministry in partnership with Reverend Marvin J and Lady Barbara Owens of MJO Ministry. Councilmember White, just a little history of the partnership between DPR and Lee Little League and Feed My People Ministry. Started long time ago. It started with Senator Satchel Page Little League. Uh, I know you remember that. That's how long you've been. Uh, chair of this committee. Okay, I won't say that. <laughs> uh, it's a community baseball sports organization, which was based out of Ward 4 and 5 back in 1996 and has grown into a community 100 food basket giveaway, which started during September 2020, during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. 
We partnered with the mayor through DPR and director Delane O'Hunter, Shalita Settle, site director at Riggs LaSalle Playground. We first started out giving food baskets to community seniors and residents every Saturday morning at 10 a.m., consisting of a bag of chicken quarter, canned goods, corn, string beans, onions, carrots, cabbage, a bag of rice, and bakery goods, and one loaf of bread. Now, because of financial budget and food being so costly, we have to do once a month giveaways every third Saturday of the month. And DPR has been our partner through thick and thin, allowing us to be able to store the equipment at the center and staff helping us prepare for the food basket giveaway. Lee Little League, who is a 501c3 nonprofit, donates food once or twice a week to the seniors at Rig LaSalle Recreation Center. So Council Member White, I ask that you continue to help DPR, our partner, continue to be able to work with community-based organizations like Lee Little League through funding in the budget and not cut their much needed budget. Uh, I have a testimony, if I can have a little time, I can uh, go ahead and read that from my board member, Michael uh, Proctor. Lee Little Lee, with the help of DPR, composed of volunteers from the community that provide a multitude of resources for the city. We are truly thankful for all the support DPR has provided from staff, locations, storage space, and so much more. We initially started our food ministry almost three years ago, giving away fresh food, meat, poultry, fruits, vegetables, as I said before, Although when the donations slowed down, things became challenging, yet we have managed to continue food giveaways on every third Saturday. As a father, I understand that it takes a village to raise a child, which is why Lee Little League also offers a mentorship program. The goal is to pair our mentees with mentors that share the same interests or backgrounds, so our youth have more positive influences in their lives. In addition, we also have our little, little league team that will bring back baseball to the inner city. Our coaches will teach the basic fundamentals and allow them to have fun. Our main goal is to give our youth productive and positive activities that can expose them more options in life. This is near and dear to me because I remember my father worked for a grocery store and retired. He would mention times people would not have enough money to feed their families and how he would help them out, which showed me that giving back to the community is a great thing. So as a native of DC, I am honored to be a part of Lee Little League because it's allowed me to give back to the city that made me. Thank you so much, Mr. Lee. Um, Larry. Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for this opportunity. My name is Tiffany Lowry. I'm a long-term resident of the city and I'm currently a, a member of Ward 4. Um, over, I've benefited as a resident for, of the, um, for the activities um, that have been offered here in the city during the 90s. Um, it has made me the person that I am. It was critical in the choices that I made, especially during that time. Um, when I could have been out being, you know, hustling, I, I, I was in a youth facility learning life skills. Um, I think right now we're at a critical position where we need to have those um, opportunities for our youth now, because um, as we know, they're out making choices that are not the best for them. Um, I'm specifically here to talk about the program, um, Young Ladies on the Rise. It is offered to six to 12 year old young ladies in the city. They currently have 25 um, uh, DCP, um, DPR uh, facilities that um, 
they utilize to expose young ladies to different cultural things that they would not normally have um, or they would not experience. This includes paddle boating, high tea, double dutch, horseback riding. Um, tomorrow they're having their international day um, at, um, I believe it's at Kenilworth. Um, and these things teach, teach young ladies how to not only communicate effectively with each other, create boundaries, um, make better choices, conflict resolution, and it teaches them how to, let, to make long-term friends and bonds. Um, my concern is the program is, uh, is tremendously underfunded. Um, a lot of the time myself and the facilitators, um, my parent, myself being a parent and other parents and facilitators come out of their own pockets to make sure that the children have the things that they need for these activities. For example, for tomorrow's activities, I made sure that the young ladies at the Le Mans Rec are, will have their um, their t-shirts to represent um, Tanzania um, during International Day. Um, they don't have the basic needs that are, that they basic items they need to meet their goals for these activities, including arts and crafts, um, stuff for, to be able to cook at home economics, radios to listen to, um, music, games that they can play, you know, um, and, you know, just different arts and crafts and things to help to, them to expand on the things that they learn as young ladies. Um, I believe that this program is important to the development of the women, the young ladies in our city. And I, what better way to show the children in our community that we care than to support them with funding to continue the pro, this program and programs like this. Um, thank you for your time and the opportunity to speak on this. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Next, we have Mr. Cotton. Hello, dear council member White and members of the committee of recreation, libraries, youth affairs. I would like to introduce myself. My name is Marquise Dion Cotton. I'm a proud parent of three children. One graduated from Thurgood Marshall. I have a senior at Friendship Track Prep on Martin Luther King, and I have a sophomore daughter who attends Templeton Academy in the Penn Quarter um, District on 7th Street in Chinatown. I'm also actively involved with Parents Amplifying Voices in Education as a citywide PLE Ward 8 member. First, I want to express my gratitude for the 13 million and additional funding for out of school time programs and the secured needs assessment to inform OST office strategic plan in the fiscal year 2023 budget. These are essential investments that will benefit our children and communities. Today, I'm testifying to advocate for my vision for OST programs run by Departments of Recs and Rec Department of Parks and Recreation. My goal is to ensure that all kids have access to quality summer programs, regardless of what ward or background. Right now, I see two major issues that we can improve on. The first issue I want to bring up is the sign up process. And as I had previous conversations during DC Voice and Choice Parent Week, um, all the council members and, and all um, representatives acknowledge that there is a glitch in the system and that the system will be upgraded. But just to give an example, it's like trying to sign up on that website is, is impossible. It's, it's like trying to win tickets off the radio station to see the onside, and it's just not equitable. Um, second, there aren't many programs for females who are in high school. My daughter, she has special needs and she's in high school. So yes, I have the opportunity scholarship, but I'm still paying out of pocket 
for my daughter to attend private school. And they don't have the out of school time programs because most of the school day is based on her getting the extra help in reading and math um, proficiency. Lastly, I want to say quality DPR programs and Ward 8 look accessible and affordable and safe programs that provide high quality educational experiences and support for students with disabilities. I would like to see DPR programs improve in the equitable sign up process, improve scholarship opportunities, and a sliding scale that adjusts the cost of living and family size. District leaders, system leaders can deal and support accountability by enhancing communication, increasing funding, engaging with families and communities, and passing relevant legislation. Families should be engaged in this work through community outreach, PTOs, and community advisory groups. I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify and share my vision for OST programs in the district. I hope you will take my recommendations serious and work to make high quality OST programs accessible. And on one last note, I want to say when my kids were younger, we was able to go to the National Youth Academy in Ward 7 and do parent activities with the cooking class. And, and they even had um, internships from G GW Mental Health Services who would come in and offer services to the children. And they also had mentors to come in two days a week with the children. But that's just at a specific age group. Once they hit that 14 year old age group, it's not that many program in Ward 7 and 8 that addresses those issues for our children. Yeah. Yeah, that, and we do have some legislation speaking to equity and programs coming soon. Um, so thank you for that, and it's not going unnoticed. Um, we have three witnesses for the for the jurors, naval jurors. I saw them on Blaze. There we go. You gotta unmute. Tyler, you gotta get up. You muted it back again. All right. Go ahead. Dear Council Member White and Committee on Recreation, Libraries, and Youth Affairs, my name is Blaze and I am a third grader at Powell Elementary School and I do not know how to swim. We need swim lessons to learn so if we fall in the water, we will not sink. I was learning how to swim with a swim teacher that we met at Upshur Pool, but she is not allowed to teach me and my brother anymore at Roosevelt because she needs a permit and cannot get one there. Now I am learning to swim with my third grade class at Powell on Thursdays, but I want my two brothers to learn to swim so I can play with them. Roosevelt is closed on weekends, so I can't practice and show my brothers what I learned. My family and I had to drive for 15 minutes to get to Wilson, Deanwood, Tacoma, and Tucky Thicket, even though we had Roosevelt three blocks away from our house. We hope you make it so there are some lessons for the neighborhood around Roosevelt. Thank you, Blaze. You're amazing, Blaze. I appreciate you um, speaking for the needs of the community. Very articulate and smart. I want to ask Blaze. I want to ask Blaze. How old are you? Eight. Eight years old. Okay, I thought you was thirty-eight. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Good evening. Um, thank you, Council Member White, um, Council Member Lewis George, and members of the committee. Um, my name is Nicola Nabeldris. I use she, her pronouns, um, and I'm a ward four parent um, to three children, Blaze, who just met, who's eight, um, Siler, who's six, and then Arden, who's two. Um, I want to share that um, 
as you've heard, the pandemic has stolen the opportunity for many children to learn how to swim at ages when they might have otherwise. Um, and that's very much true for my children. Um, and both Rachel Katz and her son Noah, who spoke earlier, and my son shared how Roosevelt Pool doesn't give the opportunity to take lessons, whether that's offered through the Department of Parks and Rec or through a private instructor. It's not possible at the Roosevelt Pool. Um, and so while we are incredibly grateful and want to say thank you for opening the pool to the public, um, we feel that it's important that swimming lessons are available. Um, parents who live near Roosevelt currently have to travel to Tacoma Pool, Turkey Thicket, or Wilson to access DPR lessons. Um, and I've talked to many parents who actually have joined private gyms for the sole reason of accessing swim lessons for their children. Um, and while this is an inconvenience for, you know, families like my own, it really presents barriers for a lot of other families in the area. Um, I know that the pickleball community um, has been very present at this hearing, but I want to say that there's almost 250 members of the community who have signed on to a letter supporting swimming lessons at Roosevelt. Um, and the barriers that are preventing them from accessing swimming lessons at other of these, of these other locations are also the barriers that prevent them from being able to wait all day for a hearing such as this to testify. So you'll be getting written, written testimony from them. Um, as Councilmember Lewis George mentioned earlier, um, there is a a serious racial and socioeconomic history around access to swimming lessons. And while it's not my personal story to share as a white woman who moved to DC almost 10 years ago, I think we can't talk about access to swimming lessons without this history. Um, Black, Latino, Black and Latino kids um, and children from low-income families are at much higher risk of drowning and water accidents, and that really describes the community that lives around Roosevelt. 45% um, of our community is Black, 25% is Latino, um, and all seven elementary schools, DCPS elementary schools within a mile of Roosevelt are Title I schools, which means at least 35% of children qualify for free and reduced lunch. Um, and the statistics are chilling um, about the safety for children in the water. 64% um, of Black children nationally have little to no swimming ability. 45% of Latino children have little to no swimming ability. And 40% of white children have little to no swimming ability. Um, and when we talk about children from low-income families, that 79% of children have no swimming abilities. Um, and so when you layer that on top of the generational trauma related to swimming, um, that in 1949, DC school DC pools were integrated, um, there's, there's elders who have spoken at this hearing who have lived through that experience. Um, but that generational trauma of um, kids whose parents have been excluded from swimming, parents who parents who don't know how to swim, only, there's only a 13% that their children will learn how to swim. Um, so that really means that our children in our community aren't safe around the many areas of water. And I want to say that that fear is real. Um, I was walking one day on the path near the Potomac River with my three kids alone, and my then six-year-old almost fell in the water. And it was like, it was gut-wrenching to imagine that alternate future that could have happened had he fallen in. Um, and so I just want to advocate that we don't have any family in DC face that horrifying future for their family um, when it's so easily preventable by offering swimming lessons in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else from your family be testifying? Okay. Go ahead. My name is Sila and I'm in fourth grade at Powell Elementary School. We're trying to swim at Roosevelt. That's three blocks away. I want to know how to swim in because for my birthday, I want to go on a big water slide. Eight. And Roosevelt is closed on weekends and that's when mostly people are from school and they cannot take swimming lessons. Thank you. Sila enable Joyce. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Sila. Um, how old are you? Six. Six years old. Okay, thank you. I did so I did not know that Roosevelt was closed on the weekend. That's great information to share. We are uh in conversation with DPR about opening up the recreation centers for longer hours on the weekends. There are a number of recreation centers that close at 1 p.m. Um, and we know that we need productive and constructive activities. Uh, especially for our youth and young adults to participate in so we can um, keep them engaged, get them some mentors, get them active, get them um, in shape and just keep them engaged in our local facilities. So you two have been great today. Uh, we are taking notes and we will be following up. Thank you.
Next, we have Nathan Brown. Hello, does everybody hear me? Yep. Hey, how you doing? My name is Nathan Brown, community activist in Washington, D.C., um, in the Noma area. I'm a, I'm a native Washingtonian. I've lived in Washington, D.C. for 38 years. Through organizing, I was successful at bringing back 211 families from my community called Temple Courts, um, which is at the bottom of certain quarters. I'm here speaking today for Parks and Recreation. Um, I'm a former junior roving leader in Parks and Recreation. Damon Singletary was my roving leader who introduced me to Parks and, Recre like, Parks and Recreation. Um, Damon was a, a graduate at Boston College who influenced me heavily and has been a source of positive reinforcement through basketball for at least 20 years for at-risk youth such as myself. I learned 20 years, I mean, I learned through the powers of playing the sport under his tutelage. And now my son at 12 years old had the privilege to have the same opportunity at Kennedy Recreation, Go Rage basketball team. Not only has Kennedy provided a new resource of sporting, also they have given him an opportunity, an economical opportunity through hiring events for summer works and also through other DPR events. Again, my first job was with DPR and I learned life through Damon Singletary. I can't forget Rodney Weaver, a few who gave up opportunities through coaching at number two boys and girls club, Walker Jones, Terrell, um, Dunbar, and the list goes on now up here at Kennedy because number two boys and girls club was closed in my community. So we had to migrate like the great migration up here to Kennedy. But I've been enjoying the state to our adjacent neighborhood, our brother neighborhood, and it's been great. I don't know what I would have did without Parks and Recreation. Being able to learn about organizing and stepping up as a leader was pivotal towards me going and stepping forward and, and doing something great in my own neighborhood. I could really say I watched so much happen in my community that without, without them giving me an opportunity or a chance to see different things and get different exposures all over DC, I wouldn't have made it this far. And I'm forever grateful for them. So any call for parks and recreation, I'm coming running. And um, to all my former Temple Court residents, I also want them to know that parks and recreation are available for you too and for all at risk, at risk youth. Thank you. No, thank you. Um, for for your leadership, um, for your community, for your family, and also just being a strong example, especially with our young black men need to see in our community. And also shout out to uh, Big Damian, man. He, he, I know I rebelized with him. And I know his work is not in vain for what he's been doing for a long time. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's Carrie Savage. Good evening, uh, Chairman White, uh, members of the committee and committee staff. My name is Carrie Savage. I'm the Director of Policy and Advocacy at PAVE, or Parents Amplifying Voices in Education. Um, PAVE is also a member of the Out of School Time Coalition, which is a coalition committed to ensuring that DC children, youth, and families have access to OST programs. Um, so today I'm going to focus my testimony on DPR, which plays a key role in PAVE Parent Leaders' top two policy priorities um, uh, that Marquise Cotton is a member of and mentioned earlier, um, and Simone Scott's on this call as well, um, school-based mental health and out-of-school time programs. DPR facilities and programs offer DC residents the opportunity to engage in enrichment programs, learn new skills, explore their passions, and enjoy our beautiful city that should be a state. DPR is a critical source for OST programs, which we know provide numerous benefits for students and families, um, including but not limited to academic enrichment, social emotional learning, skill building, and a safe, productive environment while parents are working. We know as violence continues to impact families and communities across the district that OST programs play a critical role in violence prevention and access to these programs directly impacts students' mental health. We must ensure that we have a comprehensive approach to supporting mental health and wellness, particularly for our young people at all times of the day and in every ward and community. 
For all of these reasons, parent leaders continue to elevate the need for improved access and quality of DPR's OST programs, and that includes after school, summer, and programs that take place during breaks in the school year, like teacher PD days or spring break. But parents have come together in countless meetings to develop actionable policy solutions that they shared with you at DC Parent Voice and Choice Week that are foundational to lasting systemic change around OST programs and would address some of the biggest gaps and needs in our current system. So today I want to highlight their top priorities specific to DPR. First, creating a lottery system that provides preferences to students with the greatest needs. Um, for example, based on income level, families with students with disabilities, um, similar to the My School DC lottery system. Marquise alluded to this earlier in terms of trying to get tickets to a Beyonce concert. Um, I've also heard the sign up process compared to Hunger Games more times than I can count. Um, so, where families are working during the sign up period, they struggle to access programs and get spots and programs that interest their children. Um, it's also a particular barrier and challenge for families with limited internet access. Um, they can't connect fast enough to get programs. And even those with privilege have shared photos of multiple computers and devices at the ready um, as a necessary measure to secure a spot. Um, so that's an inequitable process. And we uh, and parents have outlined a solution that they think will um, make that process more equitable um, and increase access for those with the greatest needs. Um, and I particularly want to highlight the preference for students with disabilities. Um, given the number of programs that adequately support students with disabilities currently, we need to take steps to make sure they're prioritizing and getting matched to those that work, um, in addition to a long term plan for accommodations. Um, the second is to improve and expand access to scholarships, vouchers, and financial aid. Too many families are relying on scholarships right now, um, uh, or at least partial financial assistance to attend DPR programs, but it's still out of reach. Um, our last survey found that one in five families didn't participate in OST programs due to cost, um, and so looking to make sure that those uh, options are expanded for more families. And then lastly, to increase access to quality programs in convenient locations, as Marquis shared and others will share in written testimony and in the future. Um, it's particularly acute east of the river um, in Ward 7 and in your ward in Ward 8, uh, and particularly for students who are in high school. Um, so parents are asking for at least 10 more million for OST programs in order to expand seats, and we hope that this work is coordinated across DPR and Learn24. Um, and I just want to end by saying that these are things that are must-haves uh, for kids and communities that are really relying on your leadership, along with your colleagues at the Wilson Building. Um, not nice to haves uh, for those who have alternative options um, for recreation. And so I hope we can count on your partnership for this. Thank you very much for your time and the opportunity to testify. Yes, and absolutely. Thank you. Um, next, we have Simone Scott. Can you hear me? Yep. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, dear Council Member White and fellow uh, committee representatives, uh, thank you for your time and consideration today. I am Simone Scott, a native Washingtonian and social impact entrepreneur. In addition, I am a two parent board member with PAVE. We just started that. Um, a parent led organization providing a platform and resources to support, strengthening my ability to give my testimony today. And uh, the other is with Digital Pioneers Academy. As a Ward 7 parent leader within these positions, I'm also a mother of two, a 15-year-old sophomore thriving at Digital Pioneers Academy, and my daughter loving her kindergarten experience at I Dream, both public charter schools east of the river. Um, I first want to thank you for adding the additional $13 million this year uh, to the fiscal budget pertaining to ST programming. Uh, continue to work together to fund these initiatives is just one of the many reasons to acknowledge your successes. Furthermore, the implementation of OST offices needs assessment in order to answer many questions many residents have around equity, accessibility, and affordability regarding where the OST program currently is and how it's maximized moving forward. Uh, the DC Committee of Health have worked on reciprocity to meet the need of filling the SBMH uh, professional vacancies. I believe this innovative approach should be addressed to meet similar hiring needs within OST programs. To continue, I believe we are leaving much on the table, naturally assessing how we can utilize many of our residents who may already be qualified but not in regulation to sponsor DPR programs. Most importantly, this uh, may meet hiring requirements necessary to increase more program opportunities. I uh, became a social impact entrepreneurship, and that basically means a founder who commits 80% of their mission to community-based engagement. 
uh, five years ago after my TANF interview for benefit eligibility, excuse me, eligibility during a time of a major health recovery, I was asked, Ms. Scott, what do you really want to do? Um, and after my professional assessment for job placement, I found myself actually career searching. Uh, career placement, although acknowledged on a federal level, is not fully developed for successful business ownership in the city. Uh, many residents who find ourselves on assistance are looking towards purposeful driven career training, placement, career creative ownership, and vocational rec recognized uh, accreditation. However, we are only supported federally if entrepreneurs are interested in job placement. What I witnessed is counterproductive for the current process, let alone eligible re residents like myself looking to offer our best qualities within career professions servicing the district. Um, the reason I find this important is to share is that within these five years, I often ask myself how much ground could I have covered with my community initiatives if not cycling the same repetition of entry level entrepreneurship programs. I hope with your support, the DH business entrepreneurship system will be completed for qualified residents to add more value to our city, our lives and position passionate individuals for hire, further startup businesses can begin to roll out more products and services to bridge the gaps needed to assist with facilitation of OST programs and goals. Um, and so since I'm out of time, I just want to uh, thank you and just let you know how important it is for um, business, for startup uh, businesses and those who are looking to get into a registered business to be able to do so and then do be effective within our city and in uh, OST programming and other uh, initiatives. Thank you so much, council member. Thank you, we're moving yeah, right yes. along. Ms. Scott, real quick, yes. I'm trying to get to the next panel, but you said career placement is not fully developed only for those seeking job placement. Um, and Through business entrepreneurship, I apologize, I didn't let you finish, but it's uh, DHS offered in 2019 a business entrepreneurship course um, for TANF recipients. However, it is not rolled out on a federal level for vendors to actually support that initiative as a second generational activity for business entrepreneurship that has been recognized, but it's not fully uh, completed. Okay, so how do you see Envision the district being supportive of that? Well, uh, the main thing is one would be an assessment of how many um, uh, residents are actually eligible and able to become uh, or are interested in becoming business entrepreneurships through the DHS program. Um, and through that assessment, what actually begins to focus on purpose placement uh, based upon career um, and your why instead of just finding a job. And so I feel that if we move, if the city moves more towards career placement, um, then we will find maybe a difference in um, how we show up to the workplace, how we provide um, community service or just a service at a period. But where I am right now is I've been doing this for five years and as a project-based program recipient, I have really no real way around the red tape and uh, provisions to really understand how to open my business as a TANF recipient. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to this panel for testifying today uh, and being patient and advocating for those in the district, um, especially around needs and around recreation and our parks and our pools, and even our pets. Uh, the next panel will be Bonche Tabor. I believe that Tiffany Lowry is the same as T. Lowry. Correct, correct me if I'm wrong. Yes. Okay. Patricia Butler. Hillcrest Rec, Janice Jefferson, Commission on Aging, Almaz Ajiz, Chijarada Gebru, Mel Stark, Cheryl Friend Ladera. Edgewood and Power Gardens. 
Christina Tillman, Lip Nation Media Inc. Uh oh, my computer tripping again. All right. Hey, boy. Okay. I see Leonard Waterfront here. Okay. Waiting for those to be uploaded into the panel. We're still searching for those public witnesses. You don't have to get started. Tabor, if you're here, you can speak. If not, I'm going to have to go to the next person. Going once, going twice. Go. Great. Butler. Okay. Jefferson. Good evening. Good evening. There we go. Now we got it. <laughs> Good evening, Chairman, Council Member White. Committee on Recreation, Libraries, and Youth, Youth Affairs, DC Council, Witnesses, and Virtual Viewers. My name is Janice Jefferson. I'm a native Washingtonian for four generations. As this is my first testimony in many years, I want to first give a salute, kudos, and appreciation to all of the youth who took the microphone uh, earlier this afternoon. That includes their families, the dedicated efforts of DCPS, DPR, DC Libraries, and youth affairs. It is quite apparent that they all have shaped our young people in so many ways as those same entities shaped my life. We will see them at the top. As a health navigator or public health officer at 19th Street Baptist Church and a member of the mini commission on aging 4D, I speak on behalf of our seniors for both groups of which I'm a proud member and our youth, I'm a member in heart only. We love our fine DC, public libraries as safety, knowledge, and social space, social, socially safe spaces. We especially love the new design, planning, and construction of the new library renovations that have come to fruition and those that are on tap for the near future. The safe spaces that I experienced as a hungry young reader at Langston Library, Langston Terrace, Northeast DC, which regret, regrettably is no longer in operation, and Petworth Library, Northwest DC, as an adolescent re reader is still seen as a safe place by many of our citizens of all ages. Today, however, a large number of reading citizens may also be experiencing housing concerns and a lack of life skill issues. Many may be in need of services in several areas of health, like physical, psychological, social, intellectual, spiritual, and social well-being. Think out of, out of the solution box with me if you can. Can you imagine meeting your social worker or public health worker or life skills counselor right there where you read the morning newspaper or the daily word or even wash your face? Now that's thinking out of the, out of the box. Okay, help could be right there to offer a pathway to real safety and services. After an almost three year pandemic that has, that has wrecked, wrecked havoc on families, communities, and the del delivery of services, the time is more than right for the addition of social workers and mental health interns and public health professionals to meet, assess, and to connect those in need of a my myriad of city services at the neighborhood library. Additionally, those types of social and health hands-on social scientists st stationed at the neighborhood libraries could take the burden off of the libraries, the librarians and staff who are ill-equipped to handle the library concerns of the readers and the expanded personal needs of others, of other readers at the same time. Our seniors at 19th Street Baptist Church read at Petworth, Shepherd Park, Woodridge, MLK and beyond. Our seniors at the mini commission on aging 4D read at those same libraries and beyond. 
as do our youth. They are all avid readers and lovers of all the great programming of our libraries. Council Member White, I just learned this the other day. The former Deaf Cafe, which shared information on end of life acceptance and planning. And at the other end of the spectrum, Colgate's Bright Smiles, Bright Futures, a mobile dental health education program would visit the libraries and provide dental screenings, education, referrals to preschool age children and children under 12 for free. So we've got many great <laughs> programming, much great programming going on at the libraries. These creative entities are great models of reaching readers where they are and where they read. This is what I call taking advantage of the space that you've been gifted to reach the masses. What I'd leave you, like to leave you with is that all yeah. groups of residents, especially our seniors and children, are in need and deserve our attention, respect, and creative solutions to their successful, safe, healthy daily living, including reading in safe spaces. The wonderful spaces that the new and the classic library facilities offer could provide a great post-pandemic solution for on-site social workers and public health workers in light of current human resources drain and current economic climate. Creativity, solution thinking, and connecting the dots to health and social services outside the library box to be brought on the grounds or inside is a novel thought whose time has come. Council Member White and committee, I thank you for your time and all that you do to make our nation's capitals wards shine. It is appreciated. Thank you, Ms. Jefferson. Thank you. All right, Ms. Rose Moss. Hello. Hello. Um, thank you, uh, Chairman Trayon White. <clears throat> I, my name is Rose Moss and I live in Ward 7. And I was at Sherwood doing line dancing. And I heard all this going on in the other room and I had never heard of pickleball in my life. Well, I played one time and I have been playing ever since. It is a, a good game and it's for, uh, we love each other. We're just like family. First, I want to commend Andrew for the indoor courts he has provided and expanded with only the help from our volunteers most of the time. And he is a perfectionist with these lines. He don't play, he's not off by hair. The inside courts are taped off on the basketball courts. So therefore the lines can be confusing. So uh, we have limited time, hours off for playing and not all retirees are taken uh, totally retired. Like me, I work three days a week. And I have to go um, around their schedules. Like um, they offer classes in the daytime for seniors. I can't do it. And I must shout out for the new Michigan Park. They have a clean facility over there. They are one of the newer indoor courts and Hillcrest. I think it's about nine indoor facilities that was operating in the winter season but we need dedicated indoor courts with hours to accommodate all that's interested in playing. But some have slippery floors, poor lighting. Well, at Sherwood, we had a lighting problem, but after a couple of weeks, they took care of that. And as I mentioned um, earlier, not easy to read the lines. This is a sport that has really busted out. At Sherwood on Wednesday night, it's standing room only. And we need someone available to help with the beginners because we'd be helping them and it's cutting out on our play. For, um, so we are asking council members for the DPR to assist us with additional staff, uh, funding to get additional staff and to open a rec facility that's dedicated to just pickleball. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Appreciate it. Sorry for that. 
There was a video on how to play pickleball. <laughs> And Kyle, what I'm looking at, we have Leonard Bethel. Thank you, Councilman Abuait. I, I appreciate the opportunity to, to be here today. And I, I appreciate, too, the long day that, that you've put in today. Uh, so coming at the tail end of things, I'll try to keep my remarks short. My name is Len Bechtel. I'm representing Waterfront Village. Waterfront Village is one of 13 villages in DC that serve older adults. Uh, we do this by providing home and health services, uh, such as rides to medical appointments, uh, errands, delivery of prescriptions and groceries, technology assistance, home repair, et cetera. The other part of our business uh, line is to provide programming to fight social isolation. We have socials, we go to cultural events, uh, we have educational events about financial planning, end of life planning, et cetera. We also spend quite a bit of our programming on the well being of older adults in the district. The reason for this is very clear uh, social isolation and physical weakness are two of the leading causes to problems that older adults have with their health. Uh, in fact, we lose from the beginning of our 40s, every decade, we lose 5% of our strength. By the time you get up into your 70s and 80s, this means that you have difficulty doing everyday activities. In fact, one of the things that it creates is a problem with balance. Uh, falls are among the leading causes. In fact, the highest uh, injury-related cause of death of seniors every year in America. And that number is going up. From 2009 to 2018, the number of deaths of seniors due to falls has risen 30%. Last summer, Waterfront Village started to encourage older adults in Southwest DC in the Navy Yard to play pickleball. Uh, but it's just one of a number of health-related things that we've encouraged. Uh, we've held seminars on fall prevention. We have clubs that uh, walk every week. We have yoga every week. We have meditation every week. Uh, so we are, we are trying to look out for the health of our, our seniors. Uh, we do this through partnerships with other nonprofits, uh, but also with the Department of Parks and Recreation. I want to you know, praise the folks at the uh, King Greenleaf Recreation Center. They worked very closely with us this winter to have indoor pickleball there uh, three times a week. Waterfront Village encourages our members to go there on Thursdays at noon, uh, and you are invited to join us anytime that you like. Uh, we are definitely not uh, the most skilled players, uh, but we have a great deal of fun uh, learning how to play and socializing with one another. Uh, I want to uh, keep my remarks short. I'll, I'll put my testimony for the record, but I think there are opportunities for even more senior related physical fitness activities within the district. Uh, we have pockets of, of different events, uh, but oftentimes our, our older adults are uh, distances away from where those events are taking place. So to the extent that there, there might be the availability of, of shuttles or uh, transportation that, that's easier on uh, older adults than you know, getting on a bus or, or taking the Metro, uh, it would be great to get them to, to some of these events so that they could participate. Uh, we also look forward to a continuing relationship with DPR. Often the villages work with the Department of Aging and Community Living uh, but we, we realize that there are opportunities in other parts of the government, including DPR. Uh, so we look forward to building those relationships and working with DPR are more programming for our seniors because for our seniors, you know, physical fitness and social, isolati social isolati isolation actually are life and death is issues. And so to the extent that DPR can, can continue to expand their focus on senior fitness, uh, we were we are there to partner with uh, the district. 
thank you. And I have to say, Miss Rose Moss was really motivation for me. And she was doing one thing and came over there, so pickleball, I've been doing it ever since. And uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, Lena, um, uh, does Waterfront Village only work in Waterfront, providing these yoga and clubs and meditation? Yes, each of the 13 villages is assigned a neighborhood. We're, we're definitely neighborhood-based. Our services are provided by volunteers who are neighbors with older adults here in Southwest and the Navy Yard. Uh, there are 12 other villages that are serving uh, neighborhoods across the city, and we hope to uh, help uh, other interested people throughout D.C. Uh, create villages for their neighborhoods, too. Do you have a website? Uh, yes, there's a, a, a D.C. Villages website, and then Waterfront Village has its own website at uh, dcwaterfrontvillage.org. Okay. Got it. If you could put it in it. Do you have any uh, east of the Anacostia River? There is one village uh, east of the river. It's a Kingdom Care Village. Uh, it, was, it was started uh, from people from a, a single church getting together and saying, hey, we can do more for older adults in our neighborhood. And they've been doing some really wonderful work over there since. Uh, in fact, uh, they are the primary sponsors of an effort to get other uh, churches uh, to consider working within their neighborhoods on village-like services so that more older adults can get the types of services that village members are getting both for health and uh, for uh, just every everyday living support. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, our, our goal is to help older adults stay in their own homes for as long as possible. That's great. Appreciate that. Um, my staff will be reaching out about this Thursday, your Thursdays at, at noon. I was noting your testimony. All right. Thank you. I see we also are joined by Council Member Zachary Parker, who is listening in, and Council Members. Denise Lewis George and also also um there was another member here. Um I got one more guys before we open it up to the members if you want to say Liz Crawford. Good evening and thank you so much. Um here we are finally. <laughs> I appreciate all your um patience and listening to so much testimony from the community. Thank you very much. Um, my, um, my name is Liz Crawford, and I am a resident of Shepherd Park in Northwest DC, where I have lived for almost nine years. I'm very grateful to the employees of the Department of Parks and Recreation for their commitment to caring for the city's recreation spaces. I want to especially thank Ms. Sherlita Settles, who manages the Shepherd Park Community Center, and Kathleen Raywald, who oversees the Adopt-A-Park program for our local park, Shepherd Field. I have two related requests to make to the committee and to the Department of Parks and Recreation today. First, that the department increase the number and size of natural conservation areas throughout all eight wards of the city. And second, that the de department better maintain existing park properties and future natural areas with improved collaboration with other district agencies. While DPR has done a great job of providing organized recreation opportunities for many years, having natural areas that are well-maintained and accessible to residents has been a shortcoming. Not long after moving to DC from Alaska, I became interested in native plant gardening because I wanted to experience more of the local natural beauty of the Mid-Atlantic, a place where I had not previously lived. As my interest in our local environment grew, I noticed on my hikes in Rock Creek Park, the overwhelming tangle of invasive vines, shrubs, and even trees that have damaged or destroyed formerly healthy native habitats. As I learned more about how serious this problem is, I became involved with the Rock Creek Weed Warriors, volunteers who work to remove invasive plants trained by and under supervision of the Natural Park Resources staff. I soon realized that similar problems exist on DC lands outside the park, 
And in fact, the invasive plants on city and private land are in many cases contributing significantly to degradation of both DPR and national park lands. This concern led me to form the Shepherd Park Weed Warriors, a local neighborhood volunteer group with hopes of addressing the overgrowth of invasive vines, shrubs, and trees at a small area of my local DPR park, Shepherd Field. This journey has led me to a better understanding of just how important healthy native ecosystems are for everyone, especially people and wildlife living in cities, where studies have demonstrated the physical and mental health disparities in communities without access to nature. These natural areas are also essential for the overall health of the city itself in terms of their ability to support a diverse community of pollinators, to provide energy for the local food web, to manage the watershed in which they lie, and to remove carbon from the atmosphere, all essential functions in order for a healthy ecosystem to support people and wildlife. Even though the National Park Service is responsible for the majority of the natural land in our city, DPR-managed natural areas can and should be better managed. Our current model for caring for these areas does not include any kind of land management plan outside of formal grounds maintenance by DGS. Hence, many DPR parks have areas that are overgrown and full of invasive plants, like the area at Shepherd Field where we've been working. If we are to improve the city's degraded natural habitats, it would help to have a district-wide cross-agency collaboration for the stewardship of all our connected lands, Better communication between those caring for the land and those using the land would benefit everyone, employees, taxpayers, residents, seeking recreation, and the environment. The key to living in a nature-smart Washington, D.C. with a vibrant and healthy population is to have a vibrant and healthy natural environment in its midst. The biggest thing we can do for sustainability and resiliency in these uncertain times is to become better stewards of, my, of our land. Let us try harder, as Aldo Leopold taught us, to see the land as a community to which we belong and not as a commodity belonging to us. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I know Councilman Janice Lewis George has been here, but I'm not sure she has a question for this panel. Um, um, uh, no, uh, one, thank you, Liz, and the Weed Warriors for all the work that you do. Um, good to see you. Uh, and Janice Jefferson, who also testified. Um, uh, I will forego any questions, Chairman, so we can get to the government, just because it looks like you and DHS are going to enter government round at the same time at this rate. So I will forego those questions and thank just thank them both for their testimony and also the former panel that had a number of four, four witnesses who testified, including young people. So thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Ward 5 Council Member Zachary Parker. Thank you, Chairman. I will be brief for the same reasons. Uh, Ms. Crayford, uh, I appreciate you calling, and I hope I now pronounce your name right, uh, but you called attention to the conservation areas. That has been a focus uh, in Ward, Far Ward 5's Langdon Park area, uh, namely the Langdon uh, Park Forest Patch. Uh, yes. I was curious, are you thinking that that management plan that you're talking about should be managed by DPR versus another agency? And if so, why? Um, I, I don't have a firm answer to that. I think that what's most important is that DPR collaborate with DOEE or whatever other agency and make sure there's a consistent plan because there isn't right now. We see we see the beautiful forest patch at Langdon Park, but we see parts of it overrun by invasive plants. And DOEE has the knowledge of how do we properly maintain it. And that's a conversation that then we need to bring DGS into. And then yeah. there's all these adjacent areas with Department of Transportation. So the focus is we need it's all land that belongs to all of us and it all needs care. And so by cross collaboration between these agencies, whoever ends up actually managing it, if it's a recreation site or if it's true conservation land, they, they want to set aside. I, I think you city leaders are better at making that decision, but more unity about how we address it all is what's needed. Yeah, no, that is cool. One thing we found in Langdon park is that uh, the powers to be in the city don't have a full accounting where these 
grass patches or urban forests are in the city. And so that, before we think about a management plan, it all it seems as though there may need to be a, a audit of sorts there. So thank I, you for that. I completely agree. Step number one is what do we have and what do we want to do with it? That's right. Um, and so I see at least one other member of the Transportation and Environment Committee. And so I'm sure we will follow up on that. Uh, one other quick thing I would just throw out and anybody that spoke that may be able to speak to this, a trend that I'm hearing, at least in Ward 5, is that some youth don't have equitable access to rec centers. Um, I'm thinking notably about Edgewood Rec in Ward 5, State of the Art Facility. Chairman White, I know you went out to the community and spoke with residents and they were really appreciative of that. Uh, are residents that testified experiencing or hearing similar things, uh, I'm trying to identify if this is a trend or a one-off issue. I know it's at least happening in another rec center in Ward 5. So I can speak to that. You can also uh, exit to DPR's director, but it has been a continuous theme around who has access to the field. And what you typically hear is that community members are saying, I live here, I work here, I play here. And historic, I grew up here and historically I've been able to access the rec, but if I don't have the money to reserve this particular space, I can't participate, my child can't participate. And what about the regular rec uh, hours just to come and play on the court? Yes. Um, or use the pool. Um, and or uh, this space is reserved, but when I look at when I look on the computer, it's reserved. When I look in the room, no one's there. Um, and so yeah. those equities and as part of the ongoing conversation with DPR, um, just to answer your question in short. I appreciate that. Um, that is something I'm hoping to speak with the director about. And the last thing I would just throw out there, I heard earlier uh, those speaking about access to out-of-school time programming, as well as uh, programming through DPR and how can we have a more equitable sign-up system there. So just want to say that that too is something top of mind for me. Uh, and thank you to everyone that testified. Thank you. Moving right along. Just trying to find an email in the chat. Okay. Um, we have George Williams. Now, if you can help me to find out who's all in the chat before I go through all these names, I don't mind doing it, but if you can see them. We should just start elevating everyone that's in the chat. We'll do, Council Member. All right. Call these names. George Williams, Anise Cody, Catherine Matthews, Cynthia Davis, Thomas Walsh, Paula Edwards, Brenda Jordan, Bella Anderson, Kathy Lovings. Jukan Butler, Hillary Kasser, Carolyn Ash. And next panel, you will hear from our government witnesses. Heather Ferris. I'm not sure if Rodney Cephas joined us or um, because Virgil West saw them earlier. I'll try to compare who's here versus this list. Okay, real quick. And forgive me if I'm out of order because I'm my list is on two different screens. So I'm going to try my best to not skip over anybody. I won't skip over. I mean, you're on the panel. You'll get a chance to speak. So. Let's 
Well, if you hear your name, just open up your. If you if you hear your name, just uh, cut your camera on. I know you here. Catherine Matthews, Cynthia Davis, Thomas Walsh, Brooklyn. Paula Edwards. Paula Edwards, you're uh, up next. And then Brenda Jordan. Then Bula Anderson. Paula Edwards. Yep, go right ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Chair White, thank you for giving me this opportunity to testify at the Committee on Recreation, Libraries and Youth Affairs, Department of Parks and Recreation Performance Oversight Hearing. I'm a native Washingtonian, graduated from DC Public Schools, have recently been elected to represent ANC 4A01, covering parts of Shepherd Park, Colonial Village and North Portal Estates. My observations pertain to my personal experiences more than my experience as a commissioner. I would also like to commend Mrs. Sherletta Settles and her staff who manage the Shepherd Park Community Center. They do a remarkable job keeping the center clean and inviting for all users. They are always welcoming and willing to assist users and to answer questions about the facility. Mrs. Settles and DPR work to have programming available for the community to enable it to enjoy the resource. Ms. Settles is also sometimes called upon to utilize her diplomatic skills in negotiating questions about facilities use. That being said, the programs at the center are popular and fill up quickly. There are questions about the reservation and rental of the field to professional teams that compete with community use and sometimes do not clean up after their use. I'm hoping that there can be some type of bond affixed to the rental agreements to ensure that these professional teams do clean up after themselves. If they do not, the bond could be used to pay for our own having to clean up um, the facility. Unfortunately, I'm not in favor of the model of co-locating DPR facilities with local schools of which the Shepherd Park Community Center is an example. I will speak to this more in my budget testimony next month. In my experience with the community center, this model results in the communities being shortchanged in access to DPR facilities. Apparently the community center was constructed in such a way that the safety of students cannot be assured without closing it to the public at certain times. While one can understand that the safety of the school is paramount in limiting the public's access to the facilities, those blackout periods are not allocated to DCPS's budget, but come out of the DPR's budget. As a result, the facility's cost to DCPS is understated and the cost to DPR is overstated. This distortion of costs makes it appear that the community has access to adequate recreational facilities when it does not and that DCPS is not a primary user of the facility when it is. As a result, analysis and planning for both DPR and DCPS cannot proceed on an accurate basis. In the future, it will be better to match funding to use rather than trying to piggyback funding from one agency on the back of another. This ultimately results in confusion, frustration, and political gamesmanship from one side or another. Finally, I would like to commend you, Chair White, on the manner in which you conduct your hearings. I've testified before several committees, and I find your and your staff's management of your hearings to be among the best. You are well-informed, engaged, and respectful of witnesses, even in these long hearings. You listen and take time to ask questions. It makes for a longer hearing, but I at least do not feel as though I wasted my time taking off from work to offer testimony and that my comments were heard. That's not always my experience with other committees. Again, thank you so much for allowing me to speak. Thank you, I appreciate that. I'm pretty sure my staff, like like to hear that. Um, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get them off work tomorrow, but I'm working on that to see how we're going to answer these phones. So, <laughs> um, Kyle, if you're looking at it, Brenda, Brenda Jordan. Okay, uh, you gave me these lists, these names. Bula Anderson. I don't see some of these people you listed. Jukane Butler. All right. 
Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you and see you. Yep, go right ahead. Right, thank you, Council Member and Chairman White. My name is Jacane Butler. I'm a longtime resident of Ward 7, East Capitol Dwellings. I grew up, graduated from Drew Elementary, Evans Junior High, H.D. Woodson, UDC, and the University of Notre Dame. I am a volunteer at Letter of Garden on Nanny Helen Burrow, 4801. Uh, we grow and give away organic vegetables during the spring from April to December. Uh, our Ward 7 has two grocery stores, one on Minnesota Avenue, one on Alabama Avenue. There's 100,000 plus residents in two grocery stores. When I grew up, I could walk to three different grocery stores in my neighborhood. Now I got to catch a subway, Uber, get a ride. I pass a bunch of carryouts and liquor stores on the way to the letter garden, just get some vegetables or have to depend on the church giveaways. Uh, we have one full-time volunteer who regularly works that block long garden. Uh, he could use some help. He also oversees two other gardens in Edgewood and Powell up Northwest. And we wanna even do more because the city, some people just don't have access to produce, uh, good, healthy vegetables. In the time I've been volunteering, I'm also a chef and a rapper and a computer scientist. So I, I, make, I make, every Wednesday I make healthy dishes from the produce we grow and show residents, kids, parents, how to make delicious, healthy dishes all without meat. It's very important for health reasons. You know the health in our community reasons and you know the eating habits what processed foods do to people and with carry outs. So it would be really great. I testified last time. I didn't see another staff member. I did notice some more supplies. I don't know if that's just regular yearly budget stuff. But if you can find it in your heart and in your budget to get Josh Singer some more help. So Josh can, you know, once in a while take off or, you know, if something happens to him, have to take a sick day that the whole operation don't shut down. It's mostly volunteers. Josh, I believe they have administrators. Uh, at Ladera Gardens and supervisors. But we need somebody doing the uh, heavy lifting, weed pulling, planting seeds. We got all kinds of stuff. You should come out there, Councilman Juan White, one Wednesday, get you some free vegetables, test out some of my food, help me cook. It looked like you can throw down a little bit in the kitchen. Looks like a deceiver. <laughs> I was trying to get you. You got me. You got me. <laughs> But I can show you. I can show you. I can show you what to do with some collard greens, some kale, some eggplants, all the good stuff. We even got beehives, grow honey, all the herbs. We got fruit okay. that's beautiful. Stay okay. right there. That's my signal that I got to get off. But yeah, Ladera Garden, full time staff, if you can. I'm out. Well, there are gardens, but uh, thank you. Uh, uh, next, we have Ms. Heather Ferris. Then we're going to have. Hello. Anderson, if you can mute yourself, Ms. Anderson. I think I got. Do you hear me? Yeah, mute yourself real quick. Okay, I have a few things. I'm not going to hold you up, but I didn't know if y'all can meet me at Deanwood to talk about some of my problems that I have. Like getting some new furniture and getting my float down at Deanwood Recreation Center. And, um, you know, get some furniture because we haven't had any since we've been there. And now I know when the last the float been done. And I will talk to you some, some, about some more stuff, but I don't want to hold you up. And okay. can you make an appointment, you know, come and visit with us on a okay. Tuesday or you a Thursday? 
Okay, uh, my staff will take note. I got a lot of visiting to do from pickleball, okay, just food to rec visits. So we're gonna we're gonna get it done. Dean will recreation center. Dean will. We got you. Uh, yes. Uh, and what do you do I'm there? I'm sorry, Mr. I'm a little late getting you. I don't know how to work this, so just throw me back because I never worked it before. What do you and do I'm there, Miss Anderson? What do you do there? I'm a senior. Okay. We do exercise. We do art and craft, so on. And then we have to provide our own food. Okay. Uh -huh. So, and then Brenda, she's trying to get into you too, but her husband not to bed too. And Ms. she's okay. another thing we're working. She had a problem. Okay. And she then Chad, called. I really need. I see huh? Ms. Jordan. Um, so we're going to go to Heather Ferris, then Paula Edwards, then Brenda Jordan. If, if okay. That, uh, Thank you for listening. Bye bye. Now, how I get out this thing? <laughs> I think oh, I'm no. out. Is I'm out? Not yet. Okay. How do I get out of here? Shall I go ahead? Sure. Okay. Uh, so my name's Heather Ferris, and I'm a resident of the Hillbrook neighborhood in Ward 7. That's ANC 7F04. And like Jucane, who just spoke recently, I'm also a volunteer at Letterer Gardens. In fact, I'm one of the communal farm leaders. And the, the main purpose of my testimony today is to ask for more funding for the communal farm program. We do have one person in DPR who oversees all of the communal farms. His name is Josh Singer. He is amazing. He works super hard all over the city. And as Duquesne said, he could use some more help. Uh, so we would ask for there to be funding for one other full-time farm worker. So not someone who's seasonal or temporary or on contract, but someone who's dedicated to farm work for the duration of the year, because farming doesn't only take place digging in the dirt. There's lots of planning that goes behind it. Um, so just a few other things regarding that. Um, we've got the, as my fellow volunteer Jucane said, uh, we're growing beautiful, fresh, organic vegetables at Letterer. And also within the communal farm program at Edgewood and Powell, those farms are much smaller. Letterer is the big one. And we have a lot of volunteers who come out and help out. Many of us are out there throughout the winter to planting, preparing beds, all the, the maintenance that goes behind things. Last year in 2022, we, we grew and gave away about 10,000 pounds of vegetables. That's a lot of vegetables. And those went to uh, seniors who are at risk, uh, food insecurity wise, um, families, local residents of the neighborhood. Hillbrook, where Letterer Gardens is located uh, adjacent to Deanwood as you know, is a food desert here in Ward 7. So very difficult to access really good quality, fresh vegetables. So having the farm is just an amazing resource for the neighborhood. And lots of people's feedback is that they are eating healthier as a result of being, of being able to access those foods. So my wish is for more funding for the whole thing and funding for a full-time staff. And if and just to also say that it's a really great uh, community and just yay for the whole program. And if I could take a couple more seconds and shift my testimony to support what some others have said about the need to maintain and support our green spaces. It's a huge issue. There's way too much litter going on in our green spaces. And then the other concern that some people brought up today was about light pollution. And I would say that that is also a huge issue because we have sports lights on at all hours when no one is using them. So that's all my testimony for today. And I thank you very, very much for allowing me to speak and for listening today. Great job, Heather, Mr. Kane. <laughs> thank you, Jukane. I got a question. Yes. Is Mr. Josh Singer, he works for DPR? He does work for DPR. 
He is a full-time um, person in DPR for the uh, community gardens. He's a community garden specialist. Well, and he garden. runs our communal farms. Yeah, and I, I, I think we were trying to figure out what, where where does he work in and if he has supportive staff. And so we're asking the director. I think I know that DPR has a community garden team. Yeah, but we don't see them at Letterer. We only have Josh. That's right. All right. So you're right. There are some maybe part-time people who are also in the community garden program. But as I said, we don't have them laboring with us at the farm. And he has to do three gardens. Mm -hmm. One person. Yeah, he does Edgewood, Letterer, and Powell. And then he also supports other farms like the farm at Kelly Miller and the new farm that's going in at Fort Stanton. And we Marvin cooperate. Gay. We, co we cooperate with Marvin Gaye. We are hosting other community groups in our greenhouse for the winter to get seedlings going. There's a the whole lot of- We provide too. Yes. Yeah, we do a bunch of workshops, growing mushrooms, honey, yeah. harvest and honey, apple cider, all kind of good stuff. Yeah. So you can add, add visiting us uh, for- for laboring on your long list of things to do there, council member, if you like. Okay. Get your hands dirty in the on the farm. Yep, I'm open to that. So, any other questions? Um, not at the moment. I uh, see the other members are waiting. I know we have Miss Brenda Jordan as well. Um Thank you. and, and Bula, Miss Anderson. This oh, she already spoke. Miss Jordan. Should I mute myself now? Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Jordan, are you still here? I know Ms. Anderson mentioned that you were with her. Um, oh. Yeah, go right ahead. We're listening to you. Um, good evening, um, Councilman um, White. My name is Brenda Jordan, as uh, Ms. Anderson has stated. I am a senior at Deanwood um, Recreation Center, and uh, my testimony would be um, brief. What I'd like to discuss, or if you could look into it, um, the seniors there have been, um, It's we feel that we've been um, ostracized, so to speak, because the one complaint that we would have is um, during the summer, we was notified by um, uh, Mr. Christopher White, who's um, also a DPR employee that stated that all of the transportation that is utilized is only utilized for the young people. That's unfair for us as seniors who have worked all of our lives and we go to the senior center at 9 a.m. in the morning because we like to go early as if we were still working. We call that our job every day. However, it has been predicated upon us to say that the young people are entitled to only the services in the summer for utilizing the bus services and we are not because that they're going to camp and different things we feel as seniors that we're just put aside and not um, our thoughts and some of us that come on a daily basis, we won't be able to take the trips and things that we're planned. That's not fair to us as we stated before. We were also told that we should not come to the center until someone is there. The reason that the young man said that to me is I am a, a dialysis patient. Uh -huh. We had a Christmas party um, and they all wanted me to be there. Those young ladies that are there, they changed their whole schedules around me. So I go two days a week where they go five days a week. Okay. They changed the date, the date for me. I came during the Christmas holiday from dialysis. I slipped and fell when I was trying to go to the restroom. Mm -hmm. So I had to go to the hospital. But when mm -hmm. I went there, the doctor let me know that the reason that I did all of that was because 
I had no fluid in my body, not unbeknownst to the young ladies and things are there. So I made up in mind, whatever you all are going to have on a Monday, I can't come. But this young man changed the whole schedule around. But then he said it wasn't him. It was just the DPR um, management who changed the staff. But in his um, talk to us, he stated that um, I don't want anybody to fall again. So you all can't come if our um, senior coordinator is not there. That young lady is great. She does everything for us, help us all when she's there. She was there the day that I fell. She had no idea that I was going to fall because I went out to go to the restroom and I slept. However, I just wanted to see if we can get somebody to come and find out exactly what we as the seniors are entitled to. Because when you look back at it, we all help build that center. We yes. all help the, with the budget down the line before you all even got there. And what I'm saying is, please don't leave us behind. We yeah. have a lot of input that we can put in. And it seems that every time there's something, we have to be the last ones to get the input or just don't tell it. Nobody tells us at all. I appreciate all of you today. I've been on all day and I thank you for listening to me at this hour of the night. And I wish you continuous success. And thank I just you. say good night. Good night, Ms. Jordan. Thank you so you, much. Are you, are you yes. able to look at the chat, Ms. Jordan? Yeah, I'm still here. Did you, are you able to look at the chat on the Zoom? I left you my cell phone number. If you can send me your number, we want to follow up. Okay. With, I will. I will do that. With, D, uh, with DPR, with a meeting there at the facility to figure out how we can be helpful to you guys. Okay, I, I will definitely do that. Ms. Anderson has been the coordinator for all of us, and I've been helping her. So um, I'll be glad to send you my number. Okay. I left it in okay. the chat. Okay, so. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Ms. Ferris, I left my email for Ms. Hughie for you um, in the chat so we can follow up. Uh, okay. Okay. Do you see it, Ms. Ferris? Kaser, go right ahead. This will be our last witness for today. Thank you so very much for this opportunity. Uh, we are uh, the, the group of us who are the former users of the old Joy Evans Therapeutic Aquatic Center, um, uh, who, who, where we used it before it was closed. We are extremely grateful to you, Chairman White, and to this committee. Uh, for putting forward into the fiscal year 2023 budget, the programming for the interim services for us. Uh, we're also grateful to, um, to, to, to Council Member Gray and also for, for, put, for supporting it so strongly. And we got a lot of support from Council Member Bond's office. We got a lot of support from many of the ANCs in um, 07, including especially, you know, the late uh, Betty Diggs. And of course, we want to also appreciate DPR under the direction of uh, Director Delano Hunter and the staff, a, a lot of the staff, in particular, the therapeutic recreation staff, Ms. Priscilla, uh, uh, Ms. Lely, Mr. Jordan, and uh, especially Mr. Russell Rogers, uh, but also I think Ms. Priscilla in particular went to bat for us to make this happen. This program that you all budgeted for us began exactly one calendar month ago. So it took more than one quarter of the fiscal year to get going. And I'm sure it was a very complicated thing. As Director Hunter said, it was something they'd never done before. Um, there are a few little bugs. In my Some of the stuff that I submitted two days ago in my written testimony has altered a little bit since then. There was an issue with a wheelchair lift, but that seems to have resolved. Although yesterday the bus, I don't know what happened, was an hour late. So there's two main things. I want to thank you. And I want to say, look, it will be wonderful when the TR Center reopens in DC. That may not happen 
providing us aquatic services as of October 1st, 2023. So please think now about us for the next fiscal year. We do not need another service gap. It's been almost three years since COVID until this program started last month that we didn't have it. And I tried, I showed you video a year ago and I don't think my technology was up to it. So, but I have some video testimonials I need to share with you from some of the seniors and it's, it's really life giving. It's extremely important. So thank you. And please don't forget about us. Uh, I'm not sure what's going on with the transportation now. Uh, just little bugs in the system. For the most part, people are very happy, but please continue to oversee now that this program is in place after, you know, just only for, the, for a few weeks now it has been. And um, there has been some talk just through the grapevine that the transportation is very expensive. Some of the folks were saying, you know, we, uh, we didn't have any, you know, say in how that was selected or whatever. The concern that some people have raised is that the funds that you allocated last year for this year that are currently being spent, that, they, that we hope that they will last through September 30th. That's another consideration. But first and foremost, thank you. Secondly, I hope TR Center be open October 1st. If we can't use that aquatic facility, please, please let us continue under this wonderful program that you put together for us for this year. Thank you so much. You said the bus was an hour late today? Yesterday. So right now the program is going from Woody Ward on Monday and Wednesday. I was not there yesterday, but I was, and I tried to get to the bottom of it because it was just yesterday, but I was told by the participants that were at Woody Ward that the, that the, the, they said something about how the bus had been there, but then it had been gone. It was not clear at all. Um, but they said that it was an hour late yesterday. And what, do you know the actual amount of these fees for transportation? I don't know. No, we haven't been given any kind of breakdown or anything. Okay. I don't know how it how any of it works. Okay. All right. Thank you. I but I have been told that the transportation is the big part of the the expenditure, right? Because the admission to the the South Southern Regional Aquatic Wellness Center is not the lion's share of where the money that you all budgeted is is being expended. Thank you. Okay. That's what I've heard. It's all anecdotal. Got it. Um, all right. Got it. Thank you. Thank you very much. No problem. Thank you. Now we were transition to our government witnesses. If we can elevate all the government witnesses to the screen um, to be sworn in. Director Hunter, will you be only be the only one from the from uh, your office speaking? Hi, good, good evening, Council Member. Brent Cisco should also be elevated to the role of a panelist. Okay. And Miss Brenda Jordan, I did get your text. Okay, and also, can the screen sharing permissions be enabled for Danielle Evenu? Yep. Uh, director, who else are we waiting for? Uh, that's all. We are set to go. Brent Cisco are from DPR and myself. We are the only two witnesses and we're ready to get started. All right. If you can cut on your screens and raise your right hand, 
as you know, it's the practice of this office to swear in all uh, government witnesses. Okay. Do you swear or affirm on the penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give today is the truth and nothing but the truth? I do. All right, got it. Go right ahead with your testimony of video, Director Hunter. All right, first, I, I want to thank you, uh, Council Member White, and your committee uh, for hosting this hearing today. And I want to thank uh, the nearly 100 witnesses that took time out of their busy schedule uh, to testify. Uh, I've been in attendance uh, for the duration, now seven and a half hours. Uh, I enjoyed the insights and look forward to having a, a robust conversation. So I'll get started now with my formal testimony. Uh, good evening, Chairperson White, Councilmember Lewis George, and also members of the Committee on Recreation, Libraries, and Youth Affairs, and members of the public joining us today. My name is Delano Hunter, and I'm proud to serve as the Director of the D.C. Department of Parks and Recreation, and I'm pleased to testify today on behalf of Mayor Muriel Bowser to discuss our performance during fiscal year 2022 and fiscal year 2023 to date. I want to thank Mayor Bowser, City Administrator Donahue, and Deputy Mayor for Education Paul Kine for their ongoing support and leadership. DPR's mission is to provide DC residents with equitable access to gold standard recreational programs, services, and facilities. DPR manages an inventory of 68 active recreation centers, 34 aquatic centers and outdoor pools, 35 splash parks, 113 athletic fields, 19 dog parks and over 900 acres of parkland. First, I wanna highlight some of DPR's FY22 accomplishments. Uh, we are proud that Washington DC parks were ranked number one in the nation by the Trust for Public Lands Park Score Index for a second year in a row. And we remain confident in our ability to continue the district's legacy as a premier parks and recreation system well into the future. We are excited to share that DPR has completed a draft of its ready to play master plan, which sets a roadmap for how our agency will grow and adapt to meet the changing recreational needs and demands for the next 20 years. The plan focuses on addressing existing inequities in the park system through future investment and operations so that we can meet the needs of residents in every neighborhood. We received over 800 comments on the draft plan from council members and the public and our team is carefully analyzing this feedback, and we look forward to finalizing the Ready to Play Master Plan this fiscal year. At DPR, we seek to level the playing field by providing access to recreational opportunities for all ages, abilities, and communities. In FY22, DPR had nearly 760,000 recreation visits and over 500,000 visits to DPR aquatic centers and outdoor pools. We issued roughly 40,000 permits to residents for recreational activities. And in our latest customer care survey, nearly 90% of over 2,000 respondents reported having a positive experience with DPR. We continue to foster a district of champions mentality embodied by our DPR athletes, some of whom you met today, including seven boxers who have earned national titles this past year. The DPR Elite Stars cheer team continues to win bids to travel and compete at the highest level in national championships, including two this upcoming April. We are also proud of our senior athletes who represented DPR at the National Senior Games and won 80% of the medals awarded, earning Washington, D.C. the prestigious Cola Cup Trophy, which is a prize given to the city or state with the most medals. Operating 365 days a year, DPR staff engaged 66,000 residents through almost 600 special events, including our Chuck Brown Day, Senior Fest, our legendary holiday events like our Haunted House at Fort Davis, and a holiday turkey and toy giveaway. Through Fit DC, we continue to deliver premium fitness and wellness offerings. In FY22, we offered 30 Fit DC programs and facility access with a hyper focus on wards five, seven, and eight. In addition, we continue to draw thousands with our signature Fit DC district-wide events, such as our Fresh Start and Her Story 5Ks. Through our innovative environmental programming, we offered or provided 10,000 pounds of free produce 
grown at DPR's ur urban farms. Meanwhile, our nutrition programs distributed nearly 250,000 meals to both youth and seniors. Along with our gold standard recreational programs, we strive to provide all district residents with access to world-class recreation facilities. To that end, we're stewards of a six-year capital budget of nearly $365 million. To touch on a few capital project highlights from FY22 and FY23, DPR in partnership with the Department of General Services delivered a brand new Arboretum Community Center, complete with a gym, fitness room, tech lounge, as well as a beautiful park site, a playground and a community garden. In FY22, we opened the first ever DPR outdoor pool in Ward 3 at Hearst. We also installed an innovative small park at 19th and Lamont, transforming a underutilized District Department of Transportation public space into an accessible green landscape for neighbors to enjoy. Working with the Noma Parks Foundation, we continue to increase the green footprint in the Noma community with the addition of Swamp Poodle Terrace. And in addition, we also reopened the Tacomic Aquatic Center with the brand new HVAC and roof, including a renovated pool shell, ensuring its ability to serve residents for generations to come. Lastly, I want to highlight the innovative work of our DPR team to establish a brand new boxing gym at Columbia Heights Recreation Center last fiscal year. We quickly activated this new facility uh, through the efforts of DPR employees and the sweat equity uh, with public open access three nights a week and training sessions for USA boxing athletes who are also district residents who compete as part of the Columbia Heights boxing team. And we look forward to offering even more programming at Columbia Heights this spring with the addition of senior boxing fitness and ladies boxing fitness classes. So maybe when they wanna take a break from pickleball, they can come into Columbia Heights and train with our boxing team. Uh, so we look forward to doing even more in FY23 and we're appreciative of Mayor Bowser's historic investments in DPR with the $85 million operating budget with 17 million for recreation for all, also known as RecFall, which includes 3 million for community grants which all enable DPR, which will enable DPR to double down on our in-demand offerings while responding to the district's growing recreation needs. With these additional resources, we can keep our doors open longer, extend our reach to more communities and bring fresh programming to residents uh, at an affordable cost with most programs being free. The work of Recreation for All has already begun. We're excited to announce the expansion of our recreation center hours beginning uh, the first week of March, DPR will operate its district centers from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m., our community centers from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., and our neighborhood centers from 12 p.m. to 8 p.m. during the week. So we'll do this in phases. We'll open our largest centers first. And I just want to thank uh, our union and our staff for their flexibility uh, and for recognizing the need that we need to offer more hours, but we're committed to doing so safely. Uh, we've also added Sunday hours at our high-use aquatic centers, such as Berry Farm, Deanwood, Tacoma, and Wilson. And we've also increased the frequency of our late night activation for teens. And as we continue to expand our reach, we know we cannot do this work alone, which is why I'm excited to share that we launched the community grants just a few weeks ago. So in support of Mayor Bowser's goal of engaging underserved youth with positive engagement opportunities, these grants will empower recreators in underserved communities with barriers to high quality and affordable offerings. And council member, this is something that we've been talking about now for four, four and a half years. Uh, we recognize that while we are the largest recreator, we are not the only recreator. And there are a number of volunteer led and community based organizations uh, that are deserving of this funding. And we can't wait to see the great things that they'll do. Uh, with an investment of over 3 million in grants ranging from 5,000 to 150,000, Recreation for All advances the work of organizations to provide more programming. Uh, and we expect an immediate impact. And we think that upwards of 20,000 youth ages six to 18 will be engaged in meaningful activities this spring, summer, and fall, including our sports, cultural arts, youth development, and so much more. And the grant program is open now and grants will be issued on a rolling basis. I now want to talk specifically about engaging our youth, which I think is the theme uh, which has been elevated uh, throughout the testimony today. Uh, so even with all that we have accomplished, uh, the question remains, what are we doing for our youth and what more could we be doing for our youth? And that's just not just a 
a question for the agency. I think that's a question that we all have to ask ourselves uh, individually and collectively through our respective organizations. We know that young people in the district today face unprecedented challenges affecting their health, safety, well-being, and development. We know that youth need more safe spaces to spend their time. And from the programs that DPR are most known for, like our summer camps, aquatics, uh, and our DPR programs that are breaking ground, like our late night hypes and our mobile activation and esports, we're confident that we have the building blocks to support youth safety and well being by delivering meaningful engagement opportunities. I'm proud of what we've been able to deliver for our youth in fiscal year 22. Almost 8,000 youth ages 13 through 18 participated, or three to 18 participated, excuse me, in our summer camps. 1,700 youth ages three through 12 in our traditional out of school time programs, uh, such as afternoon access and enrichment zone, including break camps and fun days. And 7,000 kids ages six through 18 through seasonal youth sports programming. In addition, we expanded our award-winning boost camps to serve 800 tweens, which we define as youth between the ages of 11 through 13. In conjunction with our increase in summer camps, we served over 210,000 meals free of charge through our summer meals program for youth 18 and under. And this is an increase of 30,000 from the previous year. Uh, and through our expanded year-round aquatics program, 1,800 youth participated and completed learn to swim classes at DPR. And this year, we also piloted those classes at outdoor pools with the concentration east of the river. Uh, last year, we brought nearly 500 residents to Camp Riverview, the district's sleep away camp in Scotland, Maryland for year round activities, as well as overnight activations for our most at risk youth. Our roving leaders made over 101,000 connections with at risk youth through their work, including over 10,000 hours of community engagement. Uh, and nearly 5,000 school visits and over 2,000 playground visits as well as 350 mobile recreation activations. We engage over 10,000 youth in our late night hype and our late night drip events, which are focused on teens ages 13 and up, including uh, our all night programming. To increase engagement, we launch DPR's Go Go Crank Music and Radio Broadcast Program, which you heard from uh, early on through testimony of our, our youth. Uh, and through Destination DPR experiences, we continue to broaden our kids' horizons with opportunities to engage in regional uh, activities. While we celebrate the achievements of our tried and true recreation programs, services, and facilities, we are continuously looking for ways to improve. I'm delighted to share that we recently expanded our reach to families with young children east of the river by establishing two new cooperative play programs at Marvin Gaye and Bald Eagle. And working with the Department of Employment Services, we created a new high school intern pro program to engage 350 teens in meaningful career development opportunities after school. In addition, we introduced a youth water program at Deanwood called the DC Panthers, and they engage both boys and girls ages 9 through 15. And this program started with a pilot of 12 kids in June and has grown to 20 kids so far. DPR's Recreation for All initiative works to dramatically expand opportunities for girls and youth sports. We've seen explosive growth and the success of our DPR cheer program, growing from just seven teams with about 300 participants in fiscal year 22 to 19 teams with almost 700 registrations in FY23. So again, that's an increase from 300 participants to 700 participants because we recognize that an agency that we needed and wanted to do more uh, for our girls in particular. Uh, in addition, we increased the number of the elite stars cheer teams from two to three and added an offering for three to five year olds. Uh, building on the strength of our cheer program, we are excited to formally launch our new gymnastics program this March. We have transformed the gymnasium at the Langdon Recreation Center into a citywide gymnastics hub where we've already begun piloting programming serving over 200 participants, primarily girls, in our tumbling clinic in February of this year and expanding opportunities for young children that are enrolled in our cooperative play programs. Recreation for All also has enabled us to dramatically increase opportunities for youth across the city to participate in tennis, engaging over a thousand kids with more than 80 classes and events including our new Adaptive Kids Tennis Program and our Tiny Tots for our youngest children. In addition, we have expanded the footprint of our eSports program, 
adding two new game lounges at Raymond and Turkey Thicket, with two more locations coming to Columbia Heights, Hillcrest, and updates to our very first esports facility at Deanwood, uh, which I'm currently testifying from. Uh, in the last two months alone, DPR has engaged over 3,000 youth through our teen break time programs, are doing the work between Christmas and New Year's, engaging youth in various uh, field trips uh, and outings opportunities to beat kids in a safe environment. Uh, activities included uh, trips for bowling, skating, Funland, uh, but also utilizing our DPR assets like our recording studios uh, and also our pools with inflatable course activations at a number of aquatic centers. In February of 2023, we launched our Swim to Cold program, Council Member White, in Ward 8 uh, with the innovative partnership with Amazon. This intensive month-long program at the Berry Farm Aquatic Center is designed for youth ages 9 through 12 in Wards 7 and 8, and over 60% of the participants are from Wards 7 and 8 which teaches swimming and coding simultaneously to help young people become not just drown proof uh, before the summer, but also to build on their technical skills and confidence. On February 4th, we engaged over 200 youth ages 13 through 17 from across all eight wards at Kenilworth Recreation Center for our Take Care Teens Health Fest, which included activities and lectures on trauma, sexual education, personal finance, self-care and cooking. And on the 11th of February, we hosted our first ever citywide girls volleyball clinic for youth ages 10 through 18, facilitated by nationally ranked coaches. And there's more to come very soon. We're excited for DPR uh, to launch our new ward-based girls volleyball program in March. And DPR will be back with our signature late night drip program. In fact, I'm really excited that tomorrow, February 24th, We'll be at the Ferriby Hope Recreation Center with music, a mobile recording studio, a pool, and so much more. Uh, in fact, I invite you all to come to see what this is about. Councilmember White, I have no doubt you'll be there. Uh, and we're excited about this event. So we'll open this, we'll keep this open to 11. We're looking at monthly activations to keeping our sites open beyond midnight and maybe even another overnight activation before the spring is out. Um, also this spring, we're excited to pilot DPR's first ATV program with the goal of delivering this fund and excitement to youth safely at our Camp Riverview location in Scotland, Maryland. Uh, we know that we have a solid foundation to build with even more offerings for young people that will provide safe places for kids to be kids. Now, uh, the question remains, uh, what more could we be doing for our youth? Uh, we must listen to our teens themselves to understand their challenges. And through ongoing conversations with our youth, here is what we are hearing as an agency. Uh, they want more leisure recreation opportunities and they want unstructured access to recreational amenities and facilities. Uh, they want the ability to access recreational facilities with later evening hours. Uh, they want connection to employment opportunities to earn money and they're also interested in mental health support. We know that DPR's approach must include expanded hours at our facilities. However, this presents a new and multifaceted challenge. Here are five questions uh, that we are committed to answering with input from the community. Uh, and of course, we're always open to the, the wisdom and insight of our residents. Uh, but the questions we must grapple are the following. How do we balance the users of DPR's facilities, the high demand for structured programs and permits by local leagues, and the need for unstructured community access, particularly for young people? Like I, I'll highlight, I guess, the, the, uh, the, um, the discussion about Edgewood. Edgewood is a site that has over 10,000 visitors a month. Uh, they have 10 basketball teams. The teams were so popular, 6U, 8U, 10U, 12U, and 14U, that they had to double the amount of league space. So it's, it's a highly utilized site, uh, but yet we realize that if you aren't enrolled in that league, uh, and a number of the majority of those kids are from Ward 5 and from those surrounding communities, there may be a feeling of how do I access the site just for leisure play? So we, we understand that. Uh, question two. How do we reduce the stigma, the stigma associated with teens gathering at our parks and our recreation facilities uh, and acting like teens do? Uh, listening to loud music uh, and instead, you know, promote community acceptance and welcome our teens into those facilities and really to, to love on our teens. To coexist and to love on our teens uh, is something that we have to focus on. Question three, how do we balance our budget and staffing demands to understand the need to operate facilities safely for extended hours. I've been around for a while. I grew up in this site. I remember when the conversation was where well, the sites are open, but there's nothing to do. 
Now there's a lot to do, but we need more access. We have to balance how we can do both safely. Uh, and question four, how do we attract teens into our facilities and programs? Uh, we know this just because we're open doesn't mean that they'll come through those doors. Uh, and last but not least, question five, how do we work with our youth serving partners to address our young people's complex needs from mental health support, academic support, career development, and so much more? Uh, we look forward to your partnership and ongoing dialogue on these issues. And while we don't have all the answers, we are committed to working with you, the teens, our community to grapple with these questions. Uh, in the meantime, we have identified some positive first steps, such as exploring how we might carve out teen dedicated times at our facilities. In addition, we're actively looking for ways to engage youth uh, in our program design uh, through ongoing youth summits and engagements in partnership with the Marionbury Youth Leadership Institute and also our very popular and successful Supreme Teens and also our Young Ladies on the Rise and Young Men Future Leader programs. Uh, so in conclusion, I'd like to thank you Chairman White and the rest of the committee uh, for your leadership and support. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to testify this evening and I look forward to working with each of you all in service to district residents. Uh, I'm joined by my colleague, Brent Sisko, uh, DPR's Capital Projects and Planning Design Officer. And at this time, we're happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Director. Um, and thank you for your diligence and listening in to the many panelists that spoke today uh or more um uh, thank you for your staff and the work that is going on in in dgs and parks and recs all across the city um sometimes their work goes uh you know unappreciated um so we want to thank them for the tireless work that they do um i want to ask you director we've been we has engagement and programming for DPR uh, activities gotten back to pre-COVID-19 pandemic numbers? Uh, it has. In fact, we're, we're exceeding. Uh, I'll highlight cheer as Exhibit A. Uh, last year, about 300 participants. Uh, this year, we're approaching 900 participants. Uh, we're seeing explosive growth in a number of programs. And in fact, we're launching new programs. Uh, I mentioned tennis. I mentioned gymnastics. Uh, I mentioned esports. Those are programs that didn't exist a year ago. They were just ideas on paper. Uh, and kudos to my colleague for stepping up to the plate, taking on additional responsibilities uh, and launching these programs really within the last three to four months. Got it. Um... How do you address uh, equity as it relates to programming for youth and young adults throughout the recreation centers with your staff and and just as a, as a strategic plan? Sure, sure. I think when you say equity, you mean like access, of course, to those programs and then affordability? Um, well, as you heard earlier, some people say that it's more activities happen here, less activities happen here. Um, so how do you get that balance? And then I, I, I heard one young lady say that on paper, this activity is happening, but when I went to the wreck, it was not happening. So, mm -hmm. and she was in the wreck east of the Anacostia River. Sure, sure. Well, so we operate a comprehensive system. And of course, uh, you, you can't offer the same thing across 70 sites, right? Some sites have amenities that offer certain types of program. We, we definitely take a regional approach to how we de deliver programming, right? So we know uh, I'm at Deanwood. Deanwood not just serves this community, it's also serving Eastland Gardens. It's also serving Marshall Heights. So sometimes Deanwood will be a hub, but there may be complementary programming that's more appropriate for Marvin Gaye or maybe Kenilworth Recreation Center. So we like to look at it. We like to take a regional approach uh, to how we offer programs. Through Recreation for All, we are able to do more. Uh, again, the, the, we, we've engaged nearly 20,000, over 20,000 youth just to date before we even go into our busy seasons of spring and summer uh, in many of our activities. And through Recreation for All, we're increasing the number of activities. Uh, most of our offerings are free uh, or reduced. We're issuing more reduced rate waivers now than ever. Uh, we keep our fees as, as low as possible because we recognize given a level of investment, we have a responsibility to provide uh, open access. So those are just a few things from an equity standpoint. The, the one thing uh, I, I do want to acknowledge that we're thinking a lot about, and I, I've, I've had conversations, I think, with uh, Councilmember Henderson extensively on this, is how do we provide you know, broader uh, access to our programs? And one of the things that we're exploring uh, is earlier access uh, for those that have reduced rate waivers than general public to be able to sign up for classes uh, with the eye towards having access in that zip code. So if I'm at Deanwood and you're on a reduced rate waiver, 
Uh, I, I'm confident that, you know, if not by this summer, by no later than this fall, you would have maybe earlier access to be able to sign up for those in those highly demand classes like our aquatics program a little earlier. So I hear you, there's, we're doing a lot, but there's certainly a lot more we can do. And uh, it's something that's top of mind for us. What's preventing the agency for doing that uh, for summer programs? Well, uh, stay tuned. There's some things that we're discussing with the mayor now, and I'm waiting for the final approvals. I don't want to uh, tease it too soon, but um, we are uh, think we're, we're thinking about going in another direction as it relates to summer uh, and how we sign up for our camps with an idea of increasing equity. Uh, I, I get it. I, I hear the stories from constituents where, uh, you know, multiple folks are vying for summer camp slots. I think someone referenced a uh, Hunger Games, you know, sort of mentality. And I know I feel especially um, uh, I'm empathetic to, to residents primarily in, in Ward 7 and 8, where I think, uh, according to the health equity report, like something like 65 or 70 percent access the, the primary means of accessing the internet is through their phones, right? And if you aren't fortunate, let's say if you work in a, a non sedentary position, maybe a blue collar position, maybe retail, uh, we recognize that there are barriers to having to sign up at a point in time to compete for those opportunities. So uh, we, we have some things that I'm really excited about. I'm waiting for the final sign offs uh, and I'm hoping that, uh, that those will be in place in time for our summer camp registration. Last but not least, we also are redesigning a new system, right? Uh, a new system that 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 that's that's mobily optimized uh and i think it'll be a big difference working with octo it won't be ready almost for another i want to say nine months to a year uh but that's something that is funded through recreation for all that i'm excited about got it um in your uh response just now and i know you mentioned a number of new uh, uh activities one in, is tennis and we're talking about equity uh there is a group of uh tennis advocates um that is uh they have met with me and some other members of the council about equity in tennis um and i guess they're standing behind a coach uh agathe i'm not sure you're familiar with her but she uh has been known to send, start with kids playing tennis between the ages of eight and eighteen and sending kids to national tournaments. And they boast of her being effective in the city, but not having access to any of the courts east of Anacostia River. Um, right now, they say she's on 16th Street um, at the Carter Burn, And a lot of kids who want to uh, use her, I guess, her teachings or training have to travel there. Um, it says she has 150 kids, and it's pretty much at over capacity for what she has to offer, but she's becoming so popular. They've been trying to reach out to DPR to, to get her flex days at other facilities as well. I'm not sure if you're aware of that. No, I'm not. I'm happy to look into that with our permits team and our tennis lead, and, uh, Andrew Aquadro, uh, but uh, I'm not familiar with that issue, but happy to look into it. They noted that two kids, uh, just one in France, and they uh, now are traveling with her to get skills on we have quality courts here, East Anacostia River. I just want to note that one. I heard you say uh, tennis. Um, uh, in in uh, in in the testimony, we've heard about the facility in Virginia about this mega complex. Um, I know, I think you've been there. Am I correct in that? I have. Yeah, and there's a lot of conversation about uh, some type of mega facility that speaks to several needs of the community. Uh, is DPR looking at anything like that? Oh, uh, we are. In fact, uh, through the complex at RFK, it's in the mayor's uh, six-year capital improvement plan. It's in the out years. Uh, there's an initial $60 million allocation. We know uh, it's going to take more funding than that 60 million, uh, but that initial seed funding uh, is reflected in our existing capital improvement plan. Uh, so that 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 is the uh, idea to have a destination uh, sports facility uh, here in the district, and it's uh, the, the tentative working title is the complex at RFK. Yeah, and that's more so fields, though, correct? No, no, it's an indoor facility. The goal is uh, we we believe that would be a great location for uh, an Olympic size pool. Uh, addition, an indoor track, uh, space for gymnastics, boxing, uh, tennis, pickleball, uh, and so much more. 
Um, we had some tremendous testimonies from the youth. Uh, one program they highlighted was the program by Mr. Williams and, and Coach Lou uh, about the broadcasting and media program in which uh, they talk about the number of kids that got scholarships to college. Um, how is DPR supporting this and looking to expand programs like this throughout the district? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked. So one of the things that really stood out to me when I first came on board in 2018 was how robust our summer offerings were, right? So we are the top employer of youth ages 14 and 15 through the Marion Berry Summer Youth Employment Program. And I was like, wow, this is great. How do we find a way to extend this uh, beyond just those summer months? So the first thing we did was to hire Bootsy Vegas, AKA Sally Williams, to I say, hey, what you're doing summer, let's do a year round. Right. Uh, and he stepped up to the plate. And I think you see the fruits of that. But addition, we, additionally, we are growing that through that high school internship program. Now, those students are paid to get work experiences. They're doing things like learning how to do music production. Again, I'm in the DPR uh, uh, studio now. They're, they're learning podcasting, radio broadcasting. They're learning uh, uh, cultural arts. They're learning fashion. We're, we're, we're taking things that they're interested in and exposing them to career opportunities. I, I love what you said. Uh, uh, you know, when it comes to the creative arts, it's not just about rap. You know, there's so many other platforms and things to do. So that's just a taste of what we're doing. I think that 350 is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm talking with DOES uh, and about how we expand that. I, I think we can uh, increase that dramatically in future fiscal years. Thank you. Um, I do want to ask you about uh, Furby Hope and DPR's negotiations with Furby Hope um, and writing what was promised to the community. I know you've been a part of those conversations and so have I um, regarding a, a more comprehensive pool and also uh, a boxing facility. Where is DPR in this conversation with uh, KIPP? Sure. Uh, we convened the last meeting with the uh, advisory council and KIPP also participated, uh, I want to say maybe two, two and a half weeks ago uh, at Fairby Hope. Uh, it was a really good meeting and we wanted to see uh, what the consensus was. We had heard a lot from various stakeholders. Uh, so we convened that meeting. Uh, we uh, moderated that meeting and the consensus was is that the community opted for the additional square footage, not to go to partner space, uh, but to go to building a, a boxing facility uh, and to, to operating that for more recreation. So where we are now is this, we uh, are in negotiations with KIPP to amend the lease agreement, because right now the, the lease agreement uh, stipulates that they control what was to be the partner space. And then we have control, of course, of the other recreational assets. So now we'll assume full uh, responsibility of the entirety of that center. Uh, and that re that will require a, a modification of the lease agreement with DGS, KIPP, and DPR. Uh, and then also, uh, thanks to you, I think another $250,000 for a feasibility study and potential look at expansion uh, is funded. Uh, and once we amend that lease, we want to look at what we can do with that 250, either study what a fuller build out could look like, or just to, to uh, dedicate those funding towards building that space out. Yeah, I don't think we need to do no more studies right now. Um, if you talk to the community, there's a contractual agreement that was executed through DGS, then uh, we have to figure out. So did they say they're going to put up any money for that? Or are you just going to, when you say take over, what's going to happen before they take over that facility? Uh, what, what we would do, we, we would treat it, we would accept it as a blank canvas. Uh, and then we would, we would finish the build out. With what money? Uh, we would use a combination of existing funds. Again, the, the, the 250 uh, that was allocated in last year's budget cycle could be dedicated towards that. Uh, I think that, um, you know, just having seen the space, uh, it is a blank canvas. There are some upgrades we could do at a later time, but right now there's close access to, to the locker rooms. Uh, we, we think that you we could very easily, establish, especially a boxing facility. Uh, you, if you look at what we did at Columbia Heights, you know, we, we did that internally. We know right now you could get fitness equipment, a couple of flat rings, bags. You can do that uh, for a um, for a reasonable price. Thank you. Um, I'm over my time. Uh, I don't know if my staff, we still have this DPR uh, uh, slide show up and I can't see everyone on the panel so we can remove that or I don't know if I, I'm able to do it. Okay, I'm able to do something. 
I uh, would like to come back to that. I think I know there's going to be some other questions, if possible. If we could keep it up, I, I would. I, I know that there are going to be some questions from potential panelists, uh, or council members that are, I, I have some slides just, to address that. OK, you can keep it up because I just moved it over. So I'm, I'm okay. good. Um, I know council member Janice Lewis George had a few questions, but she is also in a hearing on the Department of Human Services. Um, all right, I just finished up my round. I'm ready to go. Good evening, Director Hunter and the entire DPR team. Uh, thanks for hanging on in here. Um, so, Director, I want to um, get started on a few questions uh, that have come up. Um, so let's get straight to the staffing issues, if I may. Um, we have been hearing that some of the, the cuts and shortages uh, that we have seen in our workforce centers are due to staffing issues. Um, but when I, so walk me through what these staffing issues are. Sure. Um, yeah. Can can you uh, can the committee allow uh, Daniel? You, I have a slide that that speaks to that. Just to like like to paint this vividly, um, to, to to give you a sense of like the the the, the choices we we sort of make. Um, it, you know, the, the things that people love about DPR, Fresh Start 5K, Chuck Brown Day, Late Night Hype, we're keeping centers open overnight, um, uh, uh, Chuck Brown Day, 5,000 participants, we're, we're operating on 4th of July, Memorial Day, we operate 365 days a week, a year, uh, that, that comes at a cost. You know, we're typically budgeted for adjusted gross pay and overtime to the tune of about 270,000. We spend over 4 million. You can't avoid this. Right. I don't have any option. You can't avoid this and still provide the level of service. So where that comes from is vacancy savings. Uh, and typically what we do, I have to withhold vacancies. Just that four million alone accounts to 62 FTEs. So, you know, again, it's that dynamic of, all right, well, you, you, it, sure, centers can be open, but will right. we have the dynamic programming we've come to expect? And one of the things coming out of COVID, I think Councilman Lewis, I, I shared this with you. I'm not going to filibuster here. I remember going to uh, Emory, there were three people staff. One person had an emergency was out. One person was working the, uh, the front desk. Mm -hmm. Another person was coaching. There could be any, there couldn't be any less than about 400 people on that site. There was police activity on one side, dice rolling on the other. There was sewing, there was boxing, there was a fitness room, there was activities in the gym. The playground was jumping, basketball courts were jumping, with two, three different sports on the field. And I said, we, we, we can't have this. We can't have two, three people. It's not safe for our, our employees and it's not safe for residents to be quite honest. Yeah. Um, okay, so what I'm hearing is sort of, you you have to withhold some of these vacancy savings, savings because you have a number of sort of large programming that you do throughout the city um, from you know Fresh Start to Chuck Brown Day to Late Nights to a number of other issues. And so that requires you to withhold some of the vacancy savings. In a nutshell, Withhold. correct. That's correct. Yep. In a nutshell, that 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 that's the gist of it. Okay. Um. And so let me say this. Um. I I, I heard you saying you're going to restore some of the hours at our rec centers. Um. And so, but I do have some questions about your announcement. So. First of all, I believe Fort Stevens and Petworth Recreation Centers are both classified as neighborhood rec centers. Am I correct? That's correct. So would both of these facilities be open from 12 p.m. to 8 p.m. and only on weekdays? Uh, so here's what we do. I want to go back to, to that slide about the announcement um, just to give you a sense. We're doing it in phases. Uh, our, our largest sites will open from, I uh, want to give us just a second. So our largest sites, ones that have pools, our largest fit, large fitness centers, they'll open from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Monday through Friday, and then 9 to 5 on Saturday. Uh, our community centers, uh, which is kind of like our, our medium ones, think of sites mm -hmm. like, like Raymond, they'll open from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Monday through Friday, and then 9 to 5 on Saturday for 68 total hours. And then our neighborhood centers, even Petworth, I, I heard residents loud and clear. It may be a small site, but constituents depend on it for restroom access or respite. Absolutely. Yeah, a respite from uh, the, the elements. And also, I think just having a friendly DPR voice there, we desperately want to get back to 40 hours of access, which are all pre-COVID levels. So we'll start with District 1. Um, just uh, again, our union has been terrific. Uh, dotting all our I's and crossing all our T's. We'll likely announce that, if not tomorrow, on Monday. And those hours will begin on March 6th for our largest district centers. And uh, there are a number uh, of, of, okay. of war force sites that are contemplated. 
Okay, can you give me a breakdown of, not right now, but as soon as possible, can you give me a breakdown of which of my centers are district, which of my centers are community, and which center of my centers are neighborhood? Absolutely. Because that, that will help me out here. Um, and so, uh, but in the meantime, Fort Stevens has been a major issue. Our Brightwood community is very, ups, uh, very upset. Um, not only do they have senior service, but they had uh, um, youth services. And as you know, we have encountered a number of public safety issues recently in our Brightwood community um, uh, with three of our, our youth being being shot in, in that area, particular in, in Brightwood area particularly. Um, many of the students used to go there for after school tutoring, homework, support, and it really has impacted the community in a way that has been detrimental um, to the community. And the uh, many of, in the staff were moved to other communities, uh, moved to other centers, and they had built relationships with those young people. Um, and then there's also our seniors, Port, our senior, which it is a senior center at Fort Stevens, as you know, because we've done great work together um, uh, with the senior Jubilee and others there. Um, so I, I just want to understand with Fort Stevens, you know, I don't know which which category it falls under, but because of the very real public safety issues we're having and the dependency our youth had on that center, I'm just wondering, will it be first up to be restored? No, Fort Stevens will reopen before school closes. So that's my commitment. It is considered a neighborhood center. Uh, so we'll go back to 40 uh, hours uh, forty hours per week. So my commitment is to have it reopen. Oh, man, that puts them summer. in the phase three, though. <laughs> yeah, no, that's right. So keep in mind, phase one starts uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, and then we, again, we want to do this safely. And I want to do this in a way that is sustainable. Uh, a couple of things that I've done, we, we, we've, we've, Staff has been gracious enough to, to be reassigned from various divisions to go to the sites. We're also looking at contractor, contractual support. Um, we're looking at folks that traditionally don't have ties to centers uh, that are interested. There are a number of volunteers who are interested in working with us in a more formal capacity, sometimes picking up uh, additional work for 15 to 20 hours a week. I, I wanna just make sure we can do this right. You know, We're going through background checks, getting a contract on board. Like my goal is when I start it, I, I don't wanna stop it, right? I wanna do this the right way. Uh, and, you know, it is in phase three, but Fort Stevens in particular, trying to get that open before school lets out. Okay. Now, as far as the staffing goes, are the staff that was previously there going to be reassigned back to there? Because, I mean, we we love our staff in War 4 in every center, and people develop relationships. You know how it is. We all grew up with DPR centers. We all knew our DPR people. Um, some of us are blessed to have some of them still working in DPR center, like Shirley DeSettles, who a number of witnesses testified how amazing the work she's doing is. Um, so what are, you know, are people like Miss Nikki at Fort Stevens Rec and, and St. Anthony at Petworth, are they going to be returned back to their neighborhood centers where people, where they built relationships and people love them and just, yeah. No, I, I understand that personal story. You know, Larry Kinney, uh, who was the anchor of Fort Stevens for so many years. That's right. Uh, he, he came from Fort Lincoln slash Thurgood Marshall. He was my recreation specialist. Uh, he was the de facto site manager when I was a kid growing up in recreation. So, you know, I remember Mr. Kinney from the late 80s, early 90s. So uh, I get it, the, the bonds that these staff had. Unfortunately, he passed away. Uh, he's such an asset that we have not been able to, uh, um, you, you can't, there's no replacing Mr. Kinney. Um, I will say we right. are looking at continuity and I'm sensitive to that. Like I'm sensitive like to pet work. Those people have those established relationships. That's right. It's, it's in our best interest to have that continuity. I was just talking with our, uh, our new deputy about these. They can de-escalate things. They're, I mean, they're not even identified yeah. as roving leaders, but I will say this. I know that St. Anthony can de-escalate a situation like nobody else um, better than some, you know, public safety, other people. I know, um, you know, Miss Nikki just has the ability to to. So the way she can speak with the young people, it's just like it, there there is a value there in 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 restoring them to to the neighborhoods where they've built these relationships. Um, no, as absolutely. Far as the public safety look, goes. Look, that that that's our that's a priority. That is a uh, that is a priority to to uh, get those community pillars to keep those community pillars uh, to ensure continuity. Okay, so what I'm hearing is March tentatively March six for March six for phase one and to be determined for the other two phases. That's right, but but we're, we're looking at, for all three phases, we're looking at spring, spring and early summer. So it, it won't be 
the intent here is not to have a significant lag of six months. Hey, what happened to phase two? Then phase three is a year later. The goal is to do this during this uh, uh, spring and, and early summer timeline. Okay, and then I'm also hearing budget-wise a conversation, like I know we have these big events and we wanna keep them here, but I mean, maybe we need to have funding for that. But as far as, uh, when I look on DCHR website, I think I see two positions for recreation specialists. Mm -hmm. And then I see a bunch of summer positions for summer positions coming up. And I'm just wondering if rec is recreation specialist the position that we need to fill the most in order for us to be able to get back to the 40 hours? Um, yes. yes, recreational specialist seven and rec specialist nine are our most common positions uh, throughout the uh, throughout the agency. Uh, so, so yes, th those are two that we're hiring for. But I want to note that we've we've uh, done a, a, we've made over a hundred hires this fiscal year alone since October first. I want to give a, a kudos to our HR team. Uh, so th that is a part of our increase in staff. Now, all of those folks aren't site-based. Some are launching programs that you've seen in the presentation, like volleyball and gymnastics and a number of other right, that's uh, right, yeah. uh, uh, offerings. But yes, that, that is a, a part of it. And then the seasonal employees, of course, you know, we double in size. We go from 500 FTEs to close to 11, 1200 just to maintain summer operations, pools. Well, that's what I'm thinking, because some of the seasonal employees can just be converted to the full-time employees to address the vacancy issue. Like well, we did, we did, we did. In fact, we, okay. we the, of those 100 new hires that I referenced from October to, to, to present, I wanna say at least two thirds of those were seasonal employees, you know, who had been extended, who were working, who, uh, who, who were working diligently. We took the best of the best and th those 60, 65 or so have been converted into full-time hours. That's how we were able to reopen pool hours at Wilson, Tacoma, uh, Deanwood and Berry Farm. All of those are almost exclusively high performance seasonal employees that we have converted into full time positions. Okay. I can't see the clock, Chairman. So I'm imagining my time is up for this round, but I do have another round. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I don't know if that was a question or a comment. Okay. <laughs> I, it was both. I I can't see the timer, so I was going to say I'll come back on the next round. <laughs> All right, great. While, while you, we're talking about um, staffing, as mentioned, there are a number of our facilities that could use more programming um, and but don't have enough staff. Uh, I, I guess what, what's going to change in making sure that we can, one, add additional staff, two, uh, put people in places and spaces where they flourish. Um, and I think that part of that conversation is to ensure that uh, some of these programs are happening in a way that is what the community want at a high level. Because um, sometimes we have people in spaces and places that may not do a thing, but because they're there, they have to do a job that may not fit them. Um, and you can speak to uh, this, the, the placement and, and programming adequate staffing. So it's a delicate balance, right? So when you think of recreational specialists, you, you think of like programs, right? Many are popular, whether it's line dancing, whether it's athletics, whether it's cultural arts or, or youth programming, like every recreation specialist, we, we, we try to promote like owning something, but also there are a number that are responsible for site operations. Someone has to distribute meals. Someone has to answer the phone, facilitate the permits and the leisure access that we have throughout the sites. So I, I guess to answer your question, it's always a delicate balance. When you have someone, we want them to excel in either programs or site operations. And then sometimes based upon where they, what they specialize in, we look to, to, to connect them with the, uh, a site where their skills can be best utilized. Uh, so that's always just our kind of default approach. It, it's not easy. Sometimes, you know, we're, we're kind of playing musical chairs with staff, but we, we try our best to be thoughtful about where we assign people. Um, there's an ongoing, I'll come back to that, ongoing conversation um, about uh, just DPR behind and, uh, facilities, uh, projects in conjunction with DGS. Um, as you heard earlier uh, about Fort Gravel, can you speak to what is happening there? Uh, sure, sure. So we, we work closely with, with DGS. Um, one of the things that, um, and, and I know this may ring hollow, uh, everything is so much more expensive in a post-COVID environment. Uh, and what happened with Fort Gravel was this, right? So 
a, a firm, and I think Caramonte was a part of it, was hired as a design build. So meaning that they would design it and then they would ultimately be responsible for, uh, they would work with an architect to design it. And then they would also be responsible for um, constructing the facility. So when you design it to the specifications or the scope of the, the, the community, that just wasn't, we, we would put it out for bid multiple times and there would be no takers, right? In a sense, no firm, what, what, excuse me, let me say that. Um, let me be accurate. What would happen is that we could not build it for that amount, right? So if you, again, you, you have a, a budget of all of these new amenities, these new additions. So what we had to decide, do we take the existing funding and build a diminished scope or do we wait until we can combine more funding to, uh, to, to increase the scope and, and deliver what the community uh, is expecting? So that's kind of where we are now, working closely uh, with the mayor and her budget team to right size that budget in the hopes of de delivering on the uh, intended scope. And Brent, if you could, can, can you speak a, a little bit about what we want to do versus what we have the funding to do? Sure. Thank you, um, Director. And Hello, um, Council Member. Um, yes, yeah, so at Fort Grebel, um, you know that facility was built in 1947, so it's 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 done its time. It's way past its useful life. So, as the director mentioned, we are working with an architecture firm in Caramate is the design build firm. Um, Bell has given us a a concept design for a new facility that will allow us to tear down the old facility. Um, and what we're really seeing is is over the is basically since 2020 or 2021 an incredible escalation of costs. So this new facility um, would, would be constructed, it would let us, let us build a larger facility and also meet the new energy requirements that are that are now mandated that we have to, to meet um, on behalf of the city. So it would let us build a larger facility, a newer facility, an innovative facility that the community really, really deserves. And that's really what we would like to do. And we, you know, I, I sort of mentioned this is we didn't want to put lipstick on the pig. Um, and so I think you know, this is sort of a, a, a smarter approach, I think, to to work with the budget folks to get the funding we think we need uh, to serve this this community in the right way. Yeah, and I understand the urgency. Um, it's been seventy six years in the making. You know, since Fort Greville was constructed, and uh, we want to be thoughtful. I want to have something that that we're proud of that'll last for generations to come. Versus, let's just ram this through with a diminished scope. We could have been done by now, but I don't think it's something the community would be proud of uh, once the the, the new cost mill wears wears off after a year or so. Got it. Um, Vincent Gray also sent a question: uh, Are we still on schedule for Dupont uh, Ice Rink to open this fall? Well, not this fall. Uh, we are scheduled for uh, the Fort DuPont Ice Arena is scheduled to close operations in March next month. Uh, and at that point, utilities will be cut off. We'll, we'll, we'll start with demo. Uh, and Brent, if you could, can you provide a, a bit of the timeline once we start construction in March for the expected completion date? Sure, sure, Director. Absolutely. So absolutely. The, the Friends of Fort DuPont are scheduled to move out, uh, I think, in a couple of weeks. Uh, at which time we would begin demo. I think summer, um, th this summer would be construction in earnest. Uh, and since, because it's a nice facility, there's a lot of long lead times. I believe we're looking at um, sort of spring of 2025 as the, as the tentative completion date. Um, I wonder if, if uh, council member um, uh, Gray might've been referring to um, the, the Jer jo Joy Evans Therapeutic Center, which is under construction and scheduled can be can be completed uh, by this fall. Just just if he's was asking about that one, that is on schedule to be completed. Yeah, I'm reading this council member Vincent Gray in War 7. It says DuPont Ice Ring. Um, that's uh, that's gotcha. what I said. Okay, thank you. It's uh, also you mentioned last year that there needs to be an aquatic center in Hillcrest as Dean what is the closest aquatic center from this area. Do you have any updates on this aquatic center uh, need being addressed in Hillcrest? Sure, we are develop. Well, DGS is developing the scope of work uh, to bring on board a architectural and design firm that is funded this fiscal year. Uh, so, fingers crossed, we can uh, get an architect and design firm on board and begin our community engagement this spring or early summer. Okay. Um. So last year, uh, we talked about the money in the budget for Oxen Run Park. 
I mean, we talk about this every year for at least two years. Uh, we 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 we're talking about lights. We're talking about a toilet or restaurants. We're talking about a fitness facility, uh, outdoor fitness thing. That doesn't take much, man. Where are we with oxen running? It's- I I am uh, I understand their frustration. Uh, I'll, be dip- I'll be diplomatic about it. Uh, I think uh, I am as, as eager and as anxious uh, as anyone is uh, for Oxen Run, the outdoor fitness hub, the outdoor restroom, uh, the playground upgrades to, to happen. Uh, Brent, if you could, can you share a bit about where we are with our timeline? We're, we're very close. Sure, absolutely. So, so Chairman, uh, why on the for the let me start with the, the fitness um, area. So there is a, a contractor has been awarded. Um, we understand that that uh, work is scheduled to begin this this spring into the summer. Uh, so that work will be taking place over the spring into the summer. That same contractor, uh, and I should say this this uh, outdoor fitness hub is going to be located near the intersection of uh, Livingston and Atlantic. Um, I believe in that same vicinity is where the outdoor um, restroom will be also be located. That's also part of that that project. Um, separately, you know, there's a lot of a lot of stuff going on in Knox and Run. Separately, um, a contract has also been awarded to another firm uh, to renovate the playgrounds uh, in in up within Knox and Run Park. We we don't want to take them completely all offline uh, at once because we want you know kids to have access to playgrounds throughout the park. So we're going to do that strategically from worst to best. Uh, and we're going to start that work, you know, later this spring. And I think you'll continue yeah. to see work going throughout the 2023. To replace I'm trying to do the best times. Well, I would think now is the best time because it's not used as much right now as it would be as it gets warmer if strategically. So I'm not sure what the rationale is by those times. Um, so I, what I hear you saying is that the money has been allocated for two construction companies to do two separate things. Yes, sir. All That's right. correct. Director, we have been in conversation uh, last year about the renovation of Duke Ellington Field. And I remember you telling the residents that you all have a plan um, and that you will release that plan. Uh, we haven't seen that plan. Director, what is the plan? No, there's been a number of community engagements. I would, uh, I, I dispute that. Um, there's been uh, engagement on plans for uh, the Ellington Field, and uh, we're making progress. Uh, Brent, if you could, can you speak to where we are? Absolutely, absolutely. So, th- yes, the director is right. There have been community meetings, studies, uh, things done. The design is actually complete. Um, so, at this point, uh, the update I got this morning: DGS is uh, working to hire a contractor um, and estimates that work will happen, or that work will start once permits are obtained to do this work. Uh, which is, I believe is anticipated to be uh, into late summer. Um, so that would include uh, a complete field renovation, regrading, irrigation track, or a, a new track around the field, as well as uh, pickleball court um, and uh, some other park improvements. And the two field houses that sort of sit there are also going to receive upgrades because we've heard also access to restroom, restrooms uh, is another important amenity to that community. It'd be helpful for me. Mr. Cisco, if you can send that, I know that uh, Ab Jordan expressed during his testimony that you shared you was going to follow up with them and it hasn't happened. If you can do that, that'd be helpful. Um, if you can send me what that plan is uh, so I can be able to address it with the residents. They, one was an ANC commissioner who said that they have not seen it. So if you can send it to us, we want to look over it to see what that is and who the construction project, who the construction person is for the pro- project. Will do. I just wanted to add, uh, I believe Mr. Jordan was referencing the Southeast Tennis and Learning Center um, and wanting to be engaged on that and wanted a commitment uh, that he would have, he and other members of the community would have a seat at the table. Um, We just uh, hired, or through DGS, we just hired uh, a design firm. uh, And we think our first community engagement meeting could happen as early as next month. Uh, so that, that is ongoing. I know he, he kind of chimed in on both Ox and Run and STLC. Just wanted to, to clarify that. Got it. Um, where are we with the um, Congress Heights and Anacostia Recreation Center? 
Okay, I think this is back to me. Um, so, so Congress Heights uh, is is they are going through. Uh, they're at concept design right now, speeding through con uh, design. We've had, uh, Councilman, I know you, you know we've had so many community meetings at this point. You know we have a good feel of what the community wants. What we'd like to do is expedite the community meeting process. I think people want the indoor we, pool. I mean, can I stop you real quick? We yeah. we we meeting out. I think we had enough I, meetings. We I, know what the community want. We don't want no more meetings. No more studies. We want to see a recreation center that's state of the art that our kids can go in and feel safe and get some programming and some activities. Not just our kids, but our community. Period. So I hope it, all the meetings are over. We've been at, meeting at, three years. Yes, sir. So as I said, we are going to shorten the community process. We do want the community to see what we're going to do, but we're going to shorten that process to expedite this project and get construction started this year. Yeah, we can do that tomorrow. What's taking so long? Uh, we can. We have. We are on Zoom now. If any meetings can need to happen, we can get information out and get the people on Zoom in one day. Dragging it out over three to four years of all these community meetings is, is, is insane. So we can do one last conversation about it. I'm not sure what else we're meeting about if we already got the design way to present it. We, we, we passed that stage. And that's Congress Heights. Where are we with Anacostia? Uh, right. So Anacostia Rec Center, Ketchum, uh, we have a, a contractor on board. Um, we are working or the final negotiations uh, with the contractor on, I think, a price. Um, I think they need to get one more permit. And I think we're ready to start construction this spring. Who, 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 who is the contractor? Uh, I can get that for you. I believe it's Karamontic, uh council member. Let me just I can verify that for you. The construction started in spring. That's correct. I don't want to spring to start and we come back to just some we have never met him. That's not going to work. Well, I will say there would be one last community meeting and what we call let's that do, meeting. Let's do it Monday. Let's, okay. get, let's do it soon. We well, don't want to hold up this project process, man. No, absolutely. We don't want to hold it up. The last community meeting is just to let folks know who the general contractor is and let folks know uh, what the construction hour is going to be and let people ask questions we, about yeah, construction. You're just going to email out to do that. We, we, we collected enough emails data at over the last four years about when we can email people some dates about who who is we don't need to hold up no time doing that that don't make no sense no. i'm over my time uh i digress i see we have council member matthew fuman here who's been in and out the hearing also co-chaired the hearing with me today i want to thank you for that go ahead um council member fruman thank you very much chairman white uh <clears throat> I just had a few questions for Director Hunter about the Wilson Aquatic Center. Um, I, I know everybody is aware of the challenges that we face there and that we're, the facility is closed right now. And I, I wonder if Director Hunter can tell us about where that stands, when we might be able to expect the Aquatic Center to reopen and and any long-term plans for how we're going to avoid these kinds of, of shutdowns in the future? Uh, sure. Uh, DGS is working feverishly uh, to get the uh, HVAC system uh, performing at an acceptable level that is safe, not just for patrons, but also for DPR staff. Uh, the hot water uh, has been restored to adequate levels. Uh, so that was one of the barriers uh, that has been resolved. Uh, and I believe we're awaiting another inspection by DC Health. Uh, so I don't have a timeline for reopening, but I think we're closer uh, than we were just a few days ago. I know that uh, DGS and the contractors are re replacing uh, a number of filters. They're making a number of fixes to the HVAC. In regards to long-term solution, there was funding uh, last year, approximately $1 million to replace the HVAC system. It just wasn't enough. Uh, all of the bids came back significantly higher. So we waited uh, to this fiscal year to couple FY22 funding with FY23 funding. Uh, I'm proud to report that as of last Wednesday, uh, a contract has been awarded uh, and they're in the phase of procuring uh, that uh, system. Uh, so our hope is that in the short term, we can get it reopened and stabilize and have good quality operations for the month of February, March, and then April. Uh, and we know that when it turns uh, warmer during the months of May, uh, we're hoping to be close enough to the construction start that we can start that and then also do some other things while we're at it. Uh, there are some compounded issues we're going to have to address from uh, our security systems, uh, CCTV cameras, just rust in the facility. Uh, so the goal is that the combination of HVAC replacement uh, and the other upgrades will restore uh, Wilson back, back to the luster. I think we, we all expected that facility. 
Well, thank you for that. I mean, it is, it, it's uh, one of the older uh, major aquatic centers in the city at this point and a very, very heavily used one, which goes to two things. I mean, it goes to wear and tear. We understand that, but it goes also to how valued it is in the community. So, so getting it back up and running as soon as possible and getting it fixed uh, so that we don't have these kinds of problems in the future is a very high priority. I, I, I'm sure it's a high priority for you and certainly a high priority for me. So thank you for that. Um, you know, there were some issues that the health report, uh, there were a number of things that were raised in the health report and, and uh, one wonders to what extent could that have been the result of short staffing or things that weren't getting taken care of that should have been getting taken care of getting taken care of. Um, what's the plan for staffing and procedures going forward so that we don't have that kind of episode again? Sure. I, I think specifically the report cited that a few readings uh, we're, we're not up to date and that's that's not acceptable. Uh, and I've spoken with our director of aquatics and we have a plan in place uh, for more routine aud auditing. But but to give you a sense, uh, on any given day, th there may be 10 or 12 different readings that, that's done every 90 minutes to an hour. Uh, uh, and I think one of, I've reviewed the records myself. In fact, I was there last Friday night before the closure and got a chance to see the books. And you, you may see one or so readings uh, a day that were missing, but there may have been 10 or 11 other readings. I think given the severity of the issue, it has to happen every time, all the time. So we're, we're committed to doing that. Um, we have improved staffing through Recreation for All. We've hired an additional 30 lifeguards, and that is what has allowed us to resume Sunday operations at Berry Farm, Tacoma, uh, Deanwood, and Wilson. So um, I, I think we're getting to the point where staffing is at a, at a staffing is at an adequate level. Um, new management at the, uh, Wilson as well. Uh, and so I, I, I think we're. we're we're turning a corner on it. I think the last missing piece is an HVAC, a functioning HVAC system uh, to, to, to really deliver services at the level we all expect. So let's work together to make sure that happens quickly. I will say, and my daughter might clobber me, but um, we went with our granddaughter for the first Sunday that you were opened at the Wilson Aquatic Center. And we looked around and we thought, there's nobody else here. People didn't know yet that it was, that it was open, but, but thank you for that. And let's get as soon as we can to having that facility operating as well as possible and get past these HVAC issues that have dogged us for some time. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. And, and with that, yeah, that, that's why I wanted to log back on and have the opportunity to talk with the director about that issue. Thank you so much. Uh, Councilman Janice Lewis George. Thank you. Um, Director, let's get to some of the Ward 4 DPR sites that have upcoming modernizations. Um, we've worked together, the executive, the mayor, uh, on the Upshur Rec Center, which is one of our smallest but most widely used rec centers in Ward 4. Uh, it's supposed to undergo a 16 million mo modernization this fiscal year. Um, when will the work, has it begun? When will the work at DPR begin? Will community members have access uh, to the pool this coming summer? Um, and what do we need to prepare them for as we go into the summer? Um, and when will community members have the opportunity to weigh in on the proposed design, which is most on the top of the list of what community members want to be able to do? Sure, Mr. Cisco, can you take this? Sure, hi, council members, good to hey, see you. how you doing? Um, so we do. We're, we're excited about this project. Uh, so just the overall goal is that, you know, we have two really old facilities in the field house uh, and the pool house that are, you know, past their prime. Um, so what we're looking at doing holistically is demoing those two facilities and building back one facility that can serve the community from a recreational standpoint, but also serve the pool, you know, as, as locker rooms and things like that. Um, so uh, we do have the funding now. DGS is working on the scope. Uh, traditionally, we, 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 we will have our first community meeting once the architect is hired. Um, I know um, based on the, you know, there's a long queue of projects right now. I would say spring into this, we're, we've got, we're going to have a ton of meetings uh, across the board in spring into the summer, but I believe Upshur will be one of those where we start this 
uh, design process. And we typically have multiple meetings um, where we get community feedback, we do surveys, uh, we will come back to the community multiple times and show iterations and get that feedback, which is crucial for us as we as we move forward with the design process. Okay, so what are we looking like timeline wise? So when first phase of this is design, I've been through a few of these now, first phase is design community input. When will that phase start? Sure. So I believe, again, I think spring and spring, summer timeline is for is the start. Okay. Um, looking at sort of uh, past projects, this scale, uh, we, we typically it's, it's roughly about 12 months of design uh, and getting the permit required to do the project, which would put us, you know, spring, summer 2024. Uh, and when DJs okay, will be behind. So let me tell you about, okay, so based on that, what's about to happen is this summer, they're not going to see anything, demoli any demolition happen. and But they're not going to have access to the pool, I'm guessing, um, because we're they, already, or will they? They will. Yeah. So, okay, okay. So, right. This summer, there, gotcha. would be, there would be no construction this summer. Right? Okay, so there still will be access to the pool. Yes, th this summer, okay. it, um, there would be no, this project would have no construction impacts. Okay. Uh, and, and we could even perhaps time this project and, you know, we haven't, I haven't vetted this with anybody um, to where it starts after the pool season of the next year, if that's something that's important to the community. Um, we don't want to slow the project down, but that's right. something we could certainly talk about. Okay. Okay. So um, if you can, just like, I, I know ANC commissioners are also interested in just timeline because people are very excited about this project as, a, as am I. Um, as I know DPR is as well. So we just want to get a timeline, some set timelines we can let the community know. Um, so please let us know, especially as soon as that first community meeting happens, we would love to have it in our newsletter and also communicate it, um, uh, have our staff communicate it as well through our ANC meetings. Um, Emory Heights Recreation is also supposed to have its modernization in fiscal year 2024. Um, and community members are excited about it. I'm excited about it as well. Um, and I also want to have some, do some expansion. So we might need some more funding there because I want to do some more on the Hill in addition to there. I'm just letting you know now, director. Um, <laughs> so um, what is the upcoming opportunities for community members to see the proposed design and add their ideas around the Emory Heights Recreation Center? Um, and I think it's modernization is this begins fiscal year 2024, if I'm correct. Uh, that's right. There is funding in 24. Uh, for the first step, as with all of our capital or construction projects, is to onboard our architectural uh, and design firm. And I just want to say, um, you know, we, 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 we try our best to report, be transparent, and give the, the best information possible. Uh, but DGS really has to be a part of this conversation uh, as well, uh, given their purview. So I just wanted to add that, um, you know, we, we push and agitate as, as much as we can. Uh, we we want to see these new facilities as well. Uh, so uh, I just wanted to add that. So the minute we can uh, develop that scope of work uh, and DGS can get okay. that out for bring a contract on board, we will start to engage the community. I think I hear something facility rated, related from Emory, from Coach Lou, maybe once a week. So that's uh, right. Do. You, you got to take those calls just like me and Councilmember White got to take those calls from Coach Lou. Um, <laughs> we in this together. Um, <laughs> um, one last question on this part. Um, can we get a timeline for when the Tacoma Fitness Center uh, gym will reopen for our community? So neighbors already went through a year and a half without the gym while the pool was closed. And it's been several additional months since then that they've been waiting and very frustrated. So when will we get the Tacoma Fitness Center gym reopened for our community in Tacoma? So we're exploring um, relocating that gym uh, uh, across the, the, the breezeway to the recreation center side. Um, the truth of the matter is this, uh, every time we place equipment in that room, it, it it doesn't last long, right? We were hoping, we knew when the HVAC system and the roof was shot in the old project, that it was basically rusting the equipment, you know, treadmill that, that should last for, I don't know, three, four years was, was lasting less than a year, right? Uh, it was just difficult with the humidity. So we were hoping with the new upgraded HVAC project that that would solve those issues. Unfortunately, it has not. They've come rearing back. So what, what we're exploring now is to relocate the fitness center uh, across that breezeway to the recreation center and have that be our primary fitness center. Uh, and uh, I need to get the latest, but I will follow up through the committee and through your office directly on that. Okay. Yeah. Um, Councilman Dran White, where I'm at, what time? 3.33. Okay. Um, I wanna talk swimming. 
Um, we've had a number, we had a number of testimony, uh, compelling testimony from families who are desperate for some swim lessons at Roosevelt Pool. Uh, will DPR work with community members to help make this happen? Um, I think there's been some conversation that this could be done by allowing private one-on-one -on -one lessons for families at Roosevelt Pool or adding formal DPR swim classes at Roosevelt Pool. It seems to me that if it's just one-on-one -on -one swim lessons, it's the same as a parent being there with a child, teaching them how to swim, um, which I think we, sh we should be encouraging this instead of not allowing it. So um, where are you sort of on Roosevelt Pool and private lessons versus and, or DPR formal swim lessons? Classes. Sure. I believe that there were two issues. I, I want. I don't want to conflate the two issues, and I want to uh, address them individually with Roosevelt. Gotcha. We are familiar with the resident, and I believe a number of my staff, including those who are here with me for testimony, are having gauged her directly via phone. Um, the first is unequivocally, you absolutely need a permit to do swim instruction. Um, well, over the years, we found, <laughs> yeah, it, you know, you, you have to have a, a water safety instruction certification, and you have to have personal liability to do this safely, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that, that's absolutely non-negotiable. Uh, it, it's one thing if it's a parent and a child, but anytime there's an exchange of funds and someone is receiving a service, you absolutely have to have a permit. Now, the broader question becomes, how do we increase programming at DCPS on facilities, you know, as you're aware, thank you really for your advocacy because we, we operate these pools at the behest of DCPS, right? Primarily to support their instruction. And in the mornings and evenings, there would be some accommodation for community hours. It was always decided, um, you know, that that would just be a leisure swim opportunity, right? Leisure swim opportunity. I think Roosevelt has eight lanes, an opportunity for leisure swim. It wasn't designed really for programming and permits. However, with that being said, I. In principle, we support more recreation, right, a a as a matter of principle. So I, I want to give that some, some thought about, A, can we explore and pilot more permits, not just for private swim instruction, but more permits uh, at, DC at DCPS pools that we operate, and then also eventually look at programming. So I'm committed to working with your office to give that some, some thought. Again, that, that's okay. a different that's a different model for us. We're just staffing up to be able to offer more hours. But uh, again, we're in the business of more recreation and more places. So I, I want to be thoughtful about how we can do that. OK, um, and I'd love to work with you on it because I do think permitting process could be easier families to just secure per permits for instructors, uh, especially given how in demand DPR aquatic classes are um, as well. Um, Got to talk about this Chevy Chase Ballet Program. Um, this is an issue, Chevy Chase Ballet Program has been operating for years, have trained a number of dancers who have gone on to be, you know, renowned dancers, um, not only at Duke Ellington, but across the country. And they have had some issues with um, one, sort of their current space usage rent rate for the dance ballet studio in Chevy Chase um, and sort of the, the changes in that. What is, what has the rent been over the past five years? And if that rate has changed, was that across the board or was it just for the ballet program? I need to I need to double check. I want to be precise. I need to check in on that. I know we had some issues about a year, year and a half ago, but I thought those issues were resolved um, post COVID. Uh, I know that we, we typically don't do rent. We have a, a permit fee. So okay. of course it varies when you have private instruction and the uh, exchange of funds uh, but I, I'll, I'll, I'll get the I'll get the latest on that. OK, great. And then I know because they're going to be doing the redevelopment of the Chevy Chase Recreation Center. Mm -hmm. um, so we want to be involved in that process as well as it relates to DPR side to ensure con continuity okay. of programming in, in regards to that. Um, I want to ask about. Oh, I'm over 45 seconds, so um, I will. Come back. <laughs> and, I, and, I, I, and I did get a note from from my colleagues that the. Uh, the, the prices are the same for permits, so nothing has changed. So again, I, I'm okay. unfamiliar with this one. I thought it was resolved about a year, year and a half ago. So happy okay. to, to look into that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Director. Um, there's been, you know, I've become uh, extremely frustrated about the hours, especially the Saturday hours were at one o'clock p.m. and a lot of wrecks across the city. Um, I even heard... Uh, who was that? Uh, Zachary Parker talk about uh, spending the hours. And I think that you said the hours will change in two weeks. Um, 
uh, uh, can you and you say March and d- district centers from and you can give those hours. What are those hours changes coming up for DPR in March? Uh, sure. So we're looking to announce this on Friday or Monday, uh, uh, Friday of this week or Monday of next week at the latest. And we're going to start with our district centers. The hours will be Monday through Friday, 6 a.m. to 9 p.m right, 6 a.m. to 9 p.m., Monday through Friday, and then on Saturdays from 9 to 5. Uh, So that is approximately 83 hours of access, right? That's up from the current 44. So you're looking at a doubling of hours, and those will be, I know for a fact, Brave Farm will be one. I can make that commitment, right? Uh, uh, Because it has that fitness center. It has that pool. Uh, We want to allow open gym access. Uh, So that will happen, and we're looking at early March, um, early March start date. Again, we've, uh, the union has been great on this. Um, we're looking at either, I said the 6th, but I want to go to the 6th or the 13th, or either Monday the 6th or Monday the 13th. We want to get through DPR championship basketball games uh, the week of the, uh, of, of Saturday the 11th. And then, um, you know, that's a big period for us, a couple thousand kids. So we're looking at uh, the 6th or the 13th to start that, but we will announce that either on Friday or Monday, and we'll send an advanced copy to the committee so that you know. So I heard you say maybe Berry Farms. So is this not no, it will be? I'm sorry, excuse me. <clears throat> is this not happening at all recreation centers or you picked some? No, no. So we're starting off with our largest ones, the ones that have like the most, the ones that have the most demand. So uh, I know uh, sites like um, Turkey Thicket will, will be one. Thank you. This is a slide. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, mm, stay on that slide, not the other one. Yeah. Uh, t- so for instance, Turkey Thicket will be one. Edgewood will be one. We're also looking at uh, a couple of sites in Ward 8 uh, um, to include Berry Farm, but it'll be more than one site in, in Ward 8. Also looking at Columbia Heights. So we're looking at um, diversity to make sure that we are, are equitable in, in having these across the, uh, across the city. Um, and how would these be staffed? All right, so we're doing a couple of things. So one, we are, um, we're looking to assign staff that aren't traditionally assigned to recreation centers to those sites. So it may be someone from potentially from the environmental program, or maybe someone from the teens division that, that are working one day that are working shifts in sites. We're also doing some uh, exploring some uh, new ideas. We're looking at some compressed schedules. Um, you know, our most common tour will be like 530 to, to uh, 2 a.m. And then we'll have another shift that'll be approximately 1 p.m. to 930 uh, p.m. Uh, so those are just a couple of things that we're looking at. Also, I'm looking at contractual support, uh, maybe from some of our long term volunteers uh, that are or maybe some of our seasonal workers that are that, that already have employment, but are specifically interested in working on Saturdays and evening hours. So those are just a few of the things we're looking at. So I do know that you are, are giving out some grants to the community. Um, I don't know if these will be DPR partners or not. How are you? Uh, tell us a little about the grant process. Uh, how are you marketing it and what type of responses are you getting from the community? And if those organizations will be connected with DPR program? Yeah, uh, we've had a, a very good launch to this um, program uh, thus far. So these are the uh, the grant categories that we have. Uh, and Daniel, if you're able to pull up the rec for all site, I wanted just to, to walk the council member through it. Uh, we had a ton of earned media uh, at the press conference we had a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so, so far, we have, I believe, close to 40 applications every week uh, on Wednesday. We have a standing uh, we have a standing information session. We've reached out to all of the, the, the partners and, and recreators that we know, because this really is designed for tried and true recreators. You know, I, I think of folks like. Um, uh, uh, Woodland Tigers, you know, I'm thinking of Emory Heights, we're talking about Beacon House, we're talking about organizations that have been doing the work that are primarily volunteer led, uh, that, uh, you know, folks that want to expand what they do. Uh, so the, that's just a few things that we're looking at. So, so far, the, uh, the expansion has been really good. I just wanted to walk you through um, uh, the site, if it's possible. Uh, but anyway, these are the grant categories. Uh, we have support grants, which are primarily uh, $5,000. Those are the, the smaller ones. Uh, and this is the website. Uh, so very, we, we did it. We wanted something that was uh, uh, mobily efficient. Uh, uh, and so folks can view this on their, web, uh, on their phones. So if you scroll down, um, basic information about what the grants are, are, are in, uh, intended to do. Uh, qualifications include DC-based nonprofits or businesses or community-based organizations. 
We want folks that have a demonstrated that, that can demonstrate a track record of working with youth in D.C. Uh, and we're specifically serving youth 6 to 18. I just want to emphasize this is for recreation, love workforce development, love high impact tutoring, love everything else that we do for our youth. But this is specifically for recreation. Uh, and if you scroll down a little more, again, these are our grant categories, support grants up to 5,000 to purchase supplies and equipment. So I'm talking about pom-poms, football helmets, basketball uniforms, et cetera. Uh, engagement grants are up to 10,000. So uh, th this includes really for good old fashioned field trips. You may have a football team. I think Councilman, you know this. I hear a lot from the football coaches like, yeah, we engage our youth from June or July through November or December, but we're looking for things for them to do. We want to start spring leagues. We want to take our kids camping to amusement parks. So these are engagement grants for um, uh, up to 10,000 and not just that for athletic organizations. Uh, we're looking at self-esteem and, and mentoring groups like the, the private equivalent of our Supreme teams uh, that are interested in these engagement grants as well. Uh, the next category is for events and travel. Uh, events and travel up to 10,000. Again, you and I, we, we talk about this all the time. How do you support uh, teams that are doing travel for, for like regional tournaments? Uh, so uh, that's really exciting. And also some of our basketball leagues. So let's say, you know, hypothetically, uh, uh, a basketball league that primarily uh, does tournaments in the summer for adults wanted to branch off and do something maybe for teens or preteens, uh, this would be an avenue to receive support for officials, uh, beverages, uh, you know, for basketball equipment, uniforms, trophies, the whole nine. Uh, and then last but not least, the largest category of up to 150,000 is for programming grants. Um, and these are for organizations that, that have ideas for new or reoccurring program and programming in a number of areas. So I'm um, really excited about that. And if you scroll down, I won't, I won't go too detailed. Um, we, we have an FAQ sheet that is like a run and tally. Uh, also, we have weekly webinars and information sessions. We've averaged about 30 or so participants each Monday, uh, each Wednesday night. Uh, and again, I think we're up to uh, close to 40 applications that have been completed that are being evaluated on a rolling basis, I think, beginning Tuesday, right after the holiday. Got it. Um, Director, there's been some extensive conversation about pickleball. Um, I think I counted 15 facilities that is using pickleball. Uh, is this accurate? Can you tell us the, the vision of DPRs relates to the growing demand and concern about facility uses of pickleball, please? No, absolutely. Uh, and we have a, a slide for that. I think that that illustrates uh, where, where we've been. Um, when, when I started, and, and I really want to give credit to Andrew, you heard about Andrew Aquadro. Andrew Aquadro has done this through really just grit and tenacity. Uh, he has uh, only word I can think of is hustled, hustled for grant dollars, for volunteer support. Uh, we had zero pickleball courts when I walked through the door in um, November 2018. And, and uh, you know, we've empowered Andrew, but he's taking an entrepreneurial spirit. So right now we have 10 dedicated pickleball courts and nearly 50 with blended lines. Uh, and we have a three pronged approach. The first prong is to transform underutilized hard surface courts. Right. There are a number of old basketball courts that just aren't being utilized or old tennis courts that we're looking at. Um, also, we want to fuse it, infuse it into future renovations and new projects. I think you, 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 you were on point. You know, it, it may work in some communities, it may not work in the others. I don't want to mandate every new center now must therefore have a pickleball court, uh, but we want to at least expand this as an option. Maybe like Langdon, I think we'll, we have funding to replace the three pickleball. I mean, the three tennis courts. Maybe it's two. Two, two tennis and one pickleball, right? We want to give that as an option. We definitely want to infuse it. And then at the end of the day, we realize that we need to establish new and standalone pickleball facilities because I don't want the growth of pickleball to come at the expense of other hard surface sports such as basketball and then tennis because tennis has grown during the pandemic as well. So again, I don't want pickleball to cannibalize these, these other sports. If you go to the... Um, uh, the next page, I want to just give you a sense of, of what these transformations can look like. This is an aerial view of Turkey Thicket, right? So, so before what we had was we would have eight, eight tennis courts, right? So at the bottom of the screen, those are pickleball courts that you see, right? So we've been able to convert, we've been able to convert one tennis court into uh, eight pickleball courts, right? So those are eight standalone pickleball courts that are at Turkey Thicket. Um, additionally, if you look at the, the six tennis courts uh, to the top of the screen, you'll notice like those little boxes that kind of blur that kind of poke out behind the baseline. Those are what we call blended lines, right? Those are what we call blended lines. Uh, and again, we've went from zero to 10 standalone pickleball courts and then 
49 to be precise with these blended lines across the city. Uh, and those sites include uh, Hillcrest, of course, Turkey Thicket, uh, Sherwood, uh, King Greenleaf, uh, Hillcrest and, and, and several others. So uh, again, uh, if you go back a slide, uh, that's our three pronged approach. Uh, and this will be reflected. This is a big part of ready to play. This will be reflected in all of our budget requests going forward. I'm over my time. Council Member Janice Lewis George, do you like to round three? All right. Wait, wait, wait. She come back on. Um, when she come back on, I just let her on, but I'll continue my line of questioning around this. Um, I guess, Director, um, how many how many courts do we have that are standalone courts in pickleball now? We have 10 standalone and 49 blended. Blended meaning what? Uh, so again, go, go to the next slide for me, Daniel, please. Uh, so the, the standalone are at the bottom and the blended, if you look at like, if you look at the, the, the six to the top, you see how you got that box that kind of pokes out beyond like the, uh, the baseline? Mm. Um, it's so small, man. Okay. All right. Well, well, we, we have 49 blended. So again, we've done that at a, at a, at a, uh, at a number of locations, but 10 standalone, um, 49 with blended lines. Council member Janice Lewis George. Yeah. You gotta, you will need another round. Okay. Hearing now. All right. Um, no, I'm just joking. All right. Um, in your testimony, you detailed the creation of park and field care team. Um, that's a report to the deputy director of administrative services. Um, can you speak to the realignment of the roving leaders division and uh, just the concept behind that? Okay, um, the park and field care team has launched. Really excited about that. Uh, they complement the services of DGS, but uh, we needed a team to immediately do stuff like prepare, right right now they're preparing for spring. They're uh, are removing leaves from our dog parks and our uh, rain gardens. They are, are preparing to uh, uh, clean uh, our outdoor pools, right? For operations just in a few months in, from months in May. They are removing graffiti, illegal dumping. Uh, uh, they, they're kind of like our, our sort of spot team that can go out immediately uh, and take care of pressing issues that uh, it, it may take DGS and DPW a few days to get to. So that is happening. Uh, with regard to, to roving leaders, uh, no, no major shakeup. If anything, we, we've added five new roving leaders uh, this year. And those roving leaders are primarily focused on more mobile recreation activations in communities that don't have access to recreation or sometimes there are barriers like neighborhood conflicts. Uh, and then also they're increasing uh, uh, what we call this playground visits to provide non-law enforcement uh, engagement. I'll give you an idea. We have some friction between, I'll give you an example of how that works in real life. We have friction uh, between students and um, students, really, really staff, students and staff uh, associated with Wheatley Web Campus and also those residents that access those facilities uh, just as a normal course of the, during the day. Uh, and we were adamant about not closing off access to the public to a DPR facility during the day because we know you know every kid doesn't necessarily go to school in that community or may not be of school age and they have a right to use those DPR owned recreational assets so we were able to put a combination of rangers and roving leaders there to help resolve some of that tension where everybody was basically playing nice and everyone respected those recreational assets so uh, that's just an you example of the expense of taking any of the workers outside of the schools how did you rearrange no. No, we received five new. So we received five new uh, in our FY23 budget. How many Roman leaves do we have currently? Um, not including those on leave, we're approaching 40. We only got 40? I think we had like 35 five years ago, 34. Yeah, no, that's about right. So we, we have what we had then uh, and five new additional ones. I'm uh, hearing two people doing the testimony, young people, Talk about junior roving leaders. Uh, how are we getting new, fresh blood into the roving leaders uh, staff? Sure. The five that we hired in full time positions uh, were seasonal roving leaders uh, for uh, some for, for, for some for three or four years. 
uh, served throughout the summer. So uh, that, that always has been a pipeline. You know, that has been our pipeline for aquatics, for CR and for roving leaders. Typically, young folks that have come in and, and sort of paid their dues and understand what it means to work at DPR, they have been our, our best recruiting source uh, for those full time employment. So the five that we had this this year were seasonal employees. Councilman Janice Lewis George, you ready? If not, I'm gonna keep going. Go right ahead. I can't hear you, but I can see you. And I can see that you are muted. So make sure that's not my computer. Uh Director Hunter, can you hear her? I cannot. Okay, I cannot either. Okay, well, yeah, get some new spyware. We're going to keep going so you're able to get that fixed. Okay. Um, I think I just heard you for a second. Did you? I hear you now. There we go. Let's do it. Okay, um, Director, uh, we had some um, uh, testimony um, from Kim Barzi, one of our uh, War 4 members, um, and she talked about some of the issues with communications. Um, uh, and, and we hear from other families that love DPR cram, uh, programs. One of the most is basically better communication. So in her written testimony, Kim basically talked about how her son participated in the Young Men Futures program and the DC Junior Ways program, but was not notified when practices or events were canceled. And sometimes after she drove across town to attend, she um, it would be canceled and she struggled to get answers about the status of the program uh, when one of the instructors quit three weeks in. Yeah. Um, does D DPR send out email slash text notifications every time one of its practices or events is canceled? And who do parents contact with questions sort of for clear answers about their child's program? Sure, sure. So young men, future leaders, young ladies on the rise and Supreme Teen are amongst our most successful youth uh, engagement activities. I think that's an outlier. I believe that parent or uh, kid was enrolled at Raymond and the staff that had been doing a phenomenal job leading that uh, actually became a ranger, uh, became a ranger and was promoted. And I think that kind of left us in the lurch. And unfortunately, uh, we, we may have not as been as thorough as we should in communicating that. I think that's the exception and not the norm. Uh, our, our Supreme team is just just really on fire. I mean, from, okay. from the, right, I, I don't think that's the norm. So I, again, I want to strengthen that specifically at that site, but I don't think that's indicative of the program as a whole. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think it wasn't to the program. I think she just wanted to know, like, if, if practice was canceled or something was canceled, um, if you all do, like, send out text messages. So I know I, I did the tennis program. Yeah. Um, don't ask the instructor how I did. Um, but, um, <laughs> and we got messages. I got emails yeah. or text messages when they, when it was canceled. So I thought it was rare to hear that um, from from her, but I was just yeah. checking to see that that's something that happens across the board with DPR. If you all have like sort of um, email cancellations and uh, text can cancellations for parents just to improve that communication there. We, 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 we do. We do. Uh, I don't okay. think that was followed in this case, which is why I think that parent had that less than stellar experience. So uh, I see our leadership. They're listening. So they know what the expectation okay. is. We want to find a way to awesome. rectify this. Yeah, but I want to know. I think the program is amazing. I think she was just speaking to communication because she mm -hmm. drove and, and wasn't there. Um, I know some of this is in my DGS chair hat, but I want to ask Riggs LaSalle, um, what's the status of the new roof, which was budgeted for in the fiscal year? Um, and then there are several outstanding issues that Tisha Cockrell raised in her testimony, including, you know, sort of a sarconet that's missing, a basketball hoop that's inoperable and a need for sort of uh, environmentally friendly turf and field lights that need to be placed in more um, sort of what um, what, do, what do you have in the pipeline for Riggs LaSalle Center and what do I need to sort of move the ball with uh, with DGS wearing uh, my, that hat? Sure, there is funding uh, for a new roof uh, and complete the HVAC project uh, and is that 23 or 24? 23, so this fiscal year uh, so looking forward to uh, DGS completing the procurement. Um, she did raise a number of issues, which my, my staff are way able to provide updates uh, to me on, and we'll, we'll provide something more comprehensive. I know like okay. one was a basketball motor, which hasn't been ordered. Uh, right. The fitness equipment has arrived this week in a warehouse for that and a okay, number perfect. of other sites. So they'll assemble that. And then I think she referenced a door, uh, which has been replaced. Uh, so I think she, she referenced like a punch list of about nine or 10 items. That's right. Those three I have uh, updates for. And again, a roofing issue uh, is with DGS and procurement. 
Uh, we'll love to work with you and DGS to see how we prioritize and get this to the top of the uh, line. Okay, we will do. Um, last up, Lafayette Pointer soil erosion um, issue. So I want to flag, there's been a long uh, standing issue at Lafayette Pointer with uh, soil erosion. Initially, there was a promise apparently that there was uh, previously before me that a 1. million set aside to address this with bio retention pond for ponds. And then we found out that it wasn't. Um, so I'm putting a bug in your ear that we will have to follow up with you and your staff about implementing a much more cost effective plan to address the erosion um, that sort of for DPR and for our community over there. Um, and then there's a number of DPR broken benches and deteriorated asphalt paving on the park's path, as well as um, proper lighting for the basketball court that, it, that came up um, from a number of our Lafayette Pointer families and parents, um, as well as the um, the friends of. Uh, so if you, you speak, get a chance, if no, we can. We we can, but okay. I want to allow. I want to get your information now. Can you speak on the, the soil issue at Lafayette? Sure, sure, council member. So um, I was actually the project manager back when this was going on. When we um, mm -hmm. went through the the process to, uh, you know, tear down the old Lafayette Recreation Center and build back the new Lafayette Pointer. Um, facility. Um, so, 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 how this happened is that you know the, these erosion issues sort of came up during the design process for the the rec facility. So, we asked the contractor at the time who was doing the recreation center project to give us pricing, uh, you know, for that erosion mitigation project, and that's how we came up that we got to that number you just uh, you just talked about. Um, so, when the rec center project was finished, you know, we didn't have frankly we didn't have enough funding to fully implement that erosion control mitigation plan. Um, so at this point, um, you know, we, we're, we're fully aware of it. I think we can take some, um, some um, uh, very strategic um, uh, steps to, to address erosion, but I think overall it's, it's, a, it's a very large scope, all that water from the hill, uh, it, that hill's completely compacted. Um, I think a lot of dogs use it, kids play up there. So of, of nobody's fault, it's just compacted, like almost like a bald head and all that just kind of runs down on the field of the school and the track and everything. So it, it's a huge issue. I'm happy to follow up with your office and other folks offline. Yeah, so I mean, we've been trying to solve this uh, erosion issue um, for uh, a number of years, I think community members. I've talked to the CA about this. Um, it sounds like it's going to be a multi-agency situation um, because it also impacts the uh, field, which is uh, and and sort of thing. So it, it sounds like it's a major project. I just want to make sure that you all are a part of this conversation because um, I've already flagged it. Is It is one of the top things on sort of the budget letter request list. Um, so it, it is going to take a multi-agency um, approach to, to solve. So I wanted to just flag that for you as, as upcoming there. Um, all right. Um, so, Director, I think uh, last thing, um, back to, okay, so we're having an award for jobs fair, jobs not guns fair. It sounds like what you're saying to me is you all have people who have applied to the job and you have people with it. So this is more so just I need to make sure in the upcoming budget that we fund additional positions or that you all use the funding we use for major programming and projects either has to come from somewhere else. Um, is that is that sort of am I am I stating that correctly? No, we we need we need to revisit uh, that, and more than willing to work with you and the executive on that. How do we? Because again, I want to get to Sunday hours. I think that you have introduced legislation, Councilmember right. Allen has introduced legislation to mandate extended hours. Uh, right. A part of that will involve a, a fiscal impact statement and a hearing. And uh, we'd love to dig into the specifics of, uh, of uh, uh, what expanded access could look like. Just know as a matter of uh, principle, I, I like to keep some centers open 24 hours. If I could safely do it, uh, I would absolutely do so. So um, it, it's something we want to do and willing to work with you and the executive on that. Okay. Um, let me end here and say this. I want to um, thank your team uh, for showing up at our care days um, throughout the spring and the summer. I want to thank Marion Spate for the work she's done with our seniors in the ward. Um, I want to thank Chris uh, and, and his and community outreach team. 
uh, for not only showing up to care days, but responding to a number of emails that we get from our community. Um, and I want to thank the entire DPR staff at all of our centers who do incredible work and do incredible programming. Um, I think I know DPR is one of the premier in the nation, um, and I don't want to discount the fact that we do a lot and it's amazing. Um, uh, but do know that I'm not going to not leave you alone on this pet work for Stevens Recreation Center issue uh, and the staffing issue there um, and uh, addressing that immediately because our community members rightfully so um, want to see the uh, not only the hours restored, but the staffing and programming restored there. So um, I look forward to working with you in the budget and also in my new role with DGS um, for us to move things ahead. So thank you all very much. And thank you, Chairman White, uh, for uh, allowing me an extra round. Thank you. Uh, I just want to thank you, Council Member. Thank you so much. I appreciate you and your staff, uh, just the approach you all take. Uh, we enjoy working with you, and uh, I wouldn't expect any less. I know you're going to keep our feet to the fire, and that's good. We welcome that. So looking forward to continued progress. So, Director, um, in the hearing, uh, the pilot says Jeremy Josh, I, I, I recall, about palisades, about money being allocated to refurbish the skate park. He stated that the salt eroded uh, some of the urges to, to skate in, and money was sent for a dog park, field space, and lighting. Um, can you speak to where we are with palisades? Uh, sure. Uh, Brent, can you take that one? Sure, sure, Chairman White. So there is funding for both. Um, I believe there's 15,000 allocated for the skate park. And really, that's just sort of a to take off the top layer and resurface it so it's safe for skaters. I understand that that, that whole issue was caused by uh, salt that was put down to help melt some snow, but unfortunately, it sort of disintegrated the top inch or so of the concrete. But, but DGS is working on repairs to that. Actually, I got some texts about it while we've been here today. Um, also, um, there is uh, uh, funding also for uh, a new dog park that will be located behind the Palisades Recreation Center. Uh, that's also going through the same DGS scope development pro uh, the phase. Uh, so it, it's underway. We're looking forward to getting that one started. It's fully funded uh, and it's rolling. Uh, Councilman, you're on mute. Oh man, I've been talking. I've been talking my head off. So <laughs> thank you. Uh, there's also a question um, around senior access to programs. Uh, there was a senior who testified today that said that there are there's a large population of seniors who who are not digital literate and who are missing out on senior activities. What is DPR's approach to reaching seniors who are not um, savvy online or can't register online or having issues with accessing your offerings digitally? Uh, sure, uh, th there is no silver bullet. Uh, th there are a couple of things that you you'll see more of. Uh, I recognize that online, you know, may and, and, and digital promotion is the only way. Uh, they, these flies are still proven very effective. You know, everyone that comes through the majority of our site, you know, you're getting some of the flies that I, 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 that I have listed below. It's continued to, to be a, a major source for getting the word out. Um, we are doing mailings this uh, spring. You'll see a citywide mailing campaign uh, related to summer camps and for recreation for all. Uh, in addition, uh, our word of mouth continues to be the best source. Also, uh, I look forward to having a, a closer working relationship uh, with the acting director of the Office on Aging and Community Living, Sharon Hines. Uh, director Hines uh, and I are fairly close. Uh, she supervised me for a number of years in EOM. Uh, so looking forward now to working with her to strengthen that bond between uh, uh, DPR and Office on Aging and Community Living. And I'm really proud of the work we've done with seniors. Um, we now have turned senior games into a, a year-round program. And kid, uh, not kids, excuse me, seniors, it's not kids, they're young at heart, uh, are now uh, getting together more frequently, our Platinum Senior Programming. If you look on dpr.events, you'll see line dancing, you'll see bowling tournaments, you'll see 
uh, uh, spa days. Uh, they are doing more than they've ever done, uh, at least during my four and a half years at the agency. So I'm really proud of the leadership. There's more to be done, uh, but they're doing a lot. Even Camp Riverview, we're doing now uh, a, 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 a multi-day and week-long camp activations for our seniors. We had a, a senior drip, you know, late night, uh, a senior pool party for seniors. So there's a lot going on. There's more to be done, but, you know, um, our, 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 our tenures, as we call them, are they aren't being left behind in recreation for all. You want, you want There's a again. request for more funding. I should be an expert at this, but no, this is ridiculous. Three years of it, and I'm still getting a C minus. Um, at the Cremel School, um, where is DPR as it relates to providing additional resources for the Cremel School? Working very closely with the mayor and our budget team. The biggest difference between last year, this time, and now is that we uh, have the entire two acre parcel. This time last year, we just contemplated that 20 million going towards the school. And we know with that school uh, being basically 125 years old, it was gonna take a little more. Uh, so we're looking to right size that because we recognize we're gonna have to build out the entirety of that Cremel site. So I, I hope to have uh, good news um, uh, as the mayor is finalizing her proposed budget. I don't want to get in front of her on that. All right. Um, this is a DPR DGS question, man. Um, we noticed that uh, in Deanwood and Hillcrest, Rex, you have 25 open work requests. Ball Eagle has 22 open work requests. Burry Farm has 23. Guy Mason, 21. Uh, Columbia Heights, and Fort DuPont has 16, and the list goes on and on. There are, there are a countless number of open work requests uh, in you guys' portfolio in conjunction with DGS. So like, how are you two working through that to get these issues resolved? Sure. Uh, we know that uh, some of the, the work orders involve the need for capital investment. When we prepare our budget, budget uh, if you look at over just the past three or four years, we have replaced a number of turf fields. We've replaced a number of HVAC systems, including the ones at a uh, 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 portion of Riggs, LaSalle, Le Mans, um, Deanwood, which I'm currently located, um, uh, a number of other centers. And also there's increased HVAC budgets for like Bald Eagle and a couple of other sites in this fiscal year. So I would say that's one approach. Some of the open ticket items, the, the open tickets aren't going to be fixed through ongoing maintenance, right? You have to have like full replacement. So that is happening. Uh, and then also we have improved uh, increased funding in a number uh, of, of, of funding buckets, such as our general improvements budgets to do more of this work in a, at a more rapid pace. Uh, with regard to like general maintenance, uh, we, we work closely with DGS. They would have to answer specifically, you know, about their strategy for that. But we work closely to, to get these tickets closed as, as fast as possible. Got it. And are you all meeting with them anytime soon to kind of get drill down on this? Uh, we, we There's not a day that doesn't go by where we're not meeting with DGS about something. Um, we have a liaison, a few liaisons that are almost embedded with DGS to kind of Sure. Hey, where are we at? Where are we at with this? What, what can we do? Um, who do we need to hire? What, what, what's the strategy here? What do we need to fund? Do we need to find funding? Hey, we'll MOU it. We'll find money in our capital. Hey, we'll request that. So it is an ongoing process. It's just not like submit a ticket and then forget it. Uh, it it's ongoing dialogue with DGS. Okay. I did want to note some of these requests date back to 2021. Yeah, yeah. It's like the, if you see something that, that's that old, like for instance, Bald Eagle, we know for a fact that HVAC has got to be replaced. It, it, it'll, it'll be functional for a week, a month or so, and then it'll go back down. So that ticket may just be, be indicative of the need for a capital investment there. Got it. What's your plans to also communicate to seniors around the National Senior Games? Um, how do they qualify? What do they train and, and et cetera? How do they access the information? Uh, sure. So we had qualifiers last year. Um, please correct me if I'm wrong, our colleagues. Our qualifiers uh, last year were a number of uh, seniors participated to be eligible to attend the senior games. Uh, I believe it's in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania uh, this upcoming summer. 
All right, and we're looking at ways in which we can support them with travel, uh, with their training uh, and preparation. Uh, we have already a robust number of seniors that are engaged in it, and we're looking to, to expand that. Through partnerships with DACL, now seniors are more comfortable with re-engaging in in-person programming post-pandemic. Uh, so th those are all factors that I think will increase, that I'm sure will increase participation. You're on mute again. Ridiculous. Um, it's only been nine and a half hours, so you know you can give yourself some grace. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> can you elaborate on your uh, late night facility access opportunities? I know you said you're hyper focused on wars five, seven, and eight. Where and what will you be doing with those? Well, I'm excited. You know, this was very successful last year. So you, you can come see the first, which will be tomorrow. It's about to be today uh, <laughs> if we stay any longer. But uh, tomorrow at uh, Fairview Hope, uh, we have our first late night drip. Uh, so we'll have uh, activations. We'll include a, a good old fashioned pool party. We'll have a mobile recording studio. Uh, we'll have a number of activations in the gym as well as the pool. Uh, and that'll start our monthly series. I think we're at Deanwood and Turkey Thicket over the next couple of months uh, until uh, we're, we're able to take these outdoors. And then once school lets out and we get deeper in June, then we'll have those weekly activations. And those were, I think you came to a few, those were very yeah. popular. We're talking about a thousand plus participants at each one. Um, I remember the one at Oxen Run. It was a, a parent that came up to me and said, you know, uh, we had a late night party. I think we kept it open to about midnight. And she said, you know, she thanked me because she said, you know, I don't even like, you know, feel comfortable at times coming out at night. So to have a space where my kid can be a kid and we can come and just let our head down and relax like that, that means the world to us. That lets us know that we need to do more of that. All uh, right. And we're going to continue that this spring and summer. OK. And I, I, I did attend a few. I guess some of my concerns were, was pathways to get home. Um, I think that it was layered, like certain ages could stay certain times and the older ones got to stay to what, two o'clock in the morning or something like that. Um, so it was concerned about those who did not have transportation able to get home safely. But I think it was a fantastic event. I even got to see some of the local young artists display some of their talents at uh, some of the late night events. That's uh, right. And I just want to add, no, thank you. you. Right, You saw it firsthand. We, um, we evolved as we went along. And I think we're getting to the point while still not perfect, we 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 know how to work better with MPD. It's best for our staff to engage youth inside of the facilities. And we started to deploy MPD on the outskirts on those safe passage corridors, have a very strong working relationship with the uh, uh, Metro Transit Police, you know, when we're next to these sites so they can staff up. Uh, because safe passage has been a concern. Now, we bus in kids from all over the city from our various recreation centers, but for those kids that do walk up, we we, we are definitely focused on having safe passage routes for them to navigate and, and get home for those that are walking up. Thank you. And I, I do want to say that there uh, was some conversation from some residents around uh, the... I want to say community garden. Um, how many people do you have working in your community garden division? And do you plan on, uh, I'm trying to find a note from that, but but it was one of the last panels. Oh, here it is. Um, Yes, they said it, it was one guy uh, that they know that's overseeing the community garden. And yeah, that, that's right. I don't want to hire uh, Landerer Gardens. Am I saying that right? That's right, Letterer. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And they're concerned that they only know one guy who is working at the gardens. Is the, job the, that's right. That's right. I, I try to avoid mentioning employees individually. I, I normally get myself in trouble when I do that. Uh, yeah. But, uh, you know, Josh is an exceptional uh, employee. In fact, he received a KFRITS a few years ago, uh, and he, you know, represents the very best of DPR from a skill and an output standpoint. Uh, but that's not a one person division by no means. That is a six person division. 
Uh, we have a manager. Again, I'm breaking a rule by naming someone without name with Tani. Uh, with Tani wears a shirt. You can find me in the dirt. Right. That, that's his slogan. Uh, okay. Watani is a doer. Watani is not just a, a, a desk manager. He is a doer. Uh, Randall, Randall, Kamani, uh, Manny, who's been a fixture at Letterer, I think, for about 20 or 30 years. They, they, they have a team there. Um, of course, we this is this is that dynamic I talk about programming versus staff. You know, those are very real conversations. Do we grow the environmental team or do we open up access to sites? evenings, weekends, and later, you know, evenings, weekends, and during the summer. So I, 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 I hate to pit one against the other, but that's just a very real dynamic um, that we have. I will say this, through Recreation for All, they now have an appropriation for more seasonal staffing to provide more programming at Camp Riverview and a number of our outdoor destinations. In fact, they just hired, uh, they're in the final stages of hiring uh, a, a our first aquatic recreational specialist, and they will find primarily focus on water activations at Kingman Island. We're talking about paddle boating, kayaking, and canoeing, right? So that division is growing, uh, and you know, again, it's six strong now through seasonal employment and through a couple full time employee employees. That 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 team is growing, but by no means are they a a one man band. That is a collective team that works as a unit. I always want to ask about community input, about uh, different aspects of DPR. And I think you noted that in your latest uh, customer care survey, 90% of over 2,000 respondents reported having a positive experience. Um, uh, how is this information captured? And How is this information captured and how are you addressing uh, issues of negative com uh, feedback from the community? I'm sure. So that, that is a survey that we send out uh, at the at, at quarterly uh, after programs conclude. And uh, for instance, if you register for uh, uh, BPR basketball, that championships are on March uh, 11th. Right. So you'll, you'll likely receive a survey to gauge uh, your experience in a short time after that season wraps up. Um, we're revamping that. I mean, we serve mil We have millions of visits throughout the year. So I'm not satisfied with just a few thousand survey responses. Um, we're looking at doing more push notifications to text messages. We're looking at QR codes. Um, also, I want to gauge the experience. We have 250,000 visits to our pools during the summer. Uh, I want to know, are we meeting the mark? Where can we improve all right, our outdoor pool operation. So we're, we're I, I would love a year from now to say, hey, look, we had 30,000 survey respondents across our various platforms. Uh, but that, that is something that we look closely and those standards are recreation standards. We have something called a net promoter score, which is a combination of us meeting your, your standards and also your, your willingness to promote uh, that program to someone else uh, in the community. Uh, and those have been healthy. Again, I, I want to exceed 90% in every category. We're not quite there yet, so that means we, we have some work to do. Um, thank you. Um, the city is anticipating a decrease in um, surplus, extra money. You know, we've been in the overflow for probably eight, nine years straight. Um, I think this year it was noted that we had almost a billion dollars in surplus this year. Um, coming out of a pandemic. Um, but as you can hear the conversations about DC struggling to recuperate some of those revenues uh, because of some of the income from the business community, uh, it, may, it may go down. I, I know you talked about the ready to play master plan. Well, was focused on addressing inequities and park systems through future investments and operations. Um, I guess, how do you plan and balance that knowing we are in a delicate state and, and the other projects that's getting slowed down, that may be slowed down? Uh, if, well, I think the revenue questions are, are questions that I would have to defer to the mayor and city administrator on with regard to, to implications in our local budget. Uh, I, I will say, you know, we have to balance when you acquire new pro new property tradition, uh, especially if it's federal, um, formal federal government properties, you, you got to have um, funding in order to rehabilitate or rehab those projects. But, you know, as been noted, we have a, a growing inventory of existing 
facilities that we we have to take care of. We just talked about, you know, HVACs and the need to replace fields. So I, I just say we have to balance. I don't want new properties to come at the expense of existing properties. You, you're on mute again. Thank you. Um, all right, Let's see, I'm nine minutes over. There's no other council members here. Um, I want to thank you, director, and your team for this hearing uh, and all those public witnesses that has joined us tonight that uh, added value and insight and, and just a push of accountability for both the legislative and executive branch. I want to thank uh, the other council members that joined uh, my staff that stayed up to 930 during this hearing. It was at two o'clock. So if we did it at two o'clock. It'd be 1130. So um, I'm glad that we adjusted it. Um, and for those who joined, you know, we it was said that we had more uh, witnesses here tonight than the public safety or the judiciary committee. Um, and that's telling about how many people are interested and active and engaged into recreation activity to curtail uh, some of the crime in, in our community and keep our people active doing something pr productive. Um, as a final note, if anyone cannot testify, would like to submit written testimony to include it uh, in an official record, you can email your testimony to the Committee on Recreation Library Youth Affairs at RYA at dccouncil.gov. The official record will close Monday, February 27, 2023 at 5.30 p.m. With no other business before us, it is now 9.34 p.m. and this hearing is adjourned. All right. Thank you. I'll see you at Fairview Hope tomorrow, right? <laughs> yep. All right. Thank you, Councilmember. Appreciate you and your staff. Thank you. Uh, nine hours, 35 minutes. I think this is a new record. This exceeds 2019 Jello. So uh, mm -hmm. I, was, I was hoping we could continue this thing on at midnight. It's all tomorrow. <laughs> Start it all over. All right. Hey, all right. Let's do it. <laughs> you sound like you're stuttering. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, no. Uh, no, thank you. I, I seriously appreciate that. So thank you. For uh, your... Yeah. Maybe we can continue it at the, the Fairview Hope event. <laughs> all right all right take care have a good one